What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was In Marvel As Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 8. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Right, so what do I have to do? Peter asks, resigned to go through the trials. I don't know. Genie shrugs cluelessly. What do you mean, I don't know? Aren't you supposed to be the all-powerful genie of the lamp? Peter asks in a half-teasing and half-annoyed tone. Slave. Genie points to himself. Right, so can you tell me anything about the trials? Even the slightest bit of information can help? Peter asks hopefully. Look, kid. All I know is that every trial is different. They're never the same and seem to always conform to the master, so it could literally be anything. You could be sent to hell and told to survive for an hour, or you could be sent to a maze and told to find your way out. The possibilities are endless, Genie explains dramatically as always. Okay, Peter muttered in contemplation. While Peter was thinking to himself, Genie conjured a pen and prepared to sign the contract but stopped midway. Are you sure that you don't want the third wish? Genie asks. If Peter doesn't use the third wish, then the lamp can never leave his possessions, keeping it out of the wrong hands and giving him ample time to study the magic that makes it work. Of course, Genie knew this already, as he can read Peter's mind, but he just wanted to be sure. No, thanks, Peter says as he breaks away from his thoughts. Whatever you say. Genie signed the contract and tossed it back over to Peter. Catching the contract, Peter opened a portal and stepped through for a moment, though he didn't go far. Whipping out his phone, Peter texted his friends and family and informed them that he may be gone for a bit, as he didn't know how long these trials would last. For all he knew, the trials could happen in an instant or take multiple months though he hoped that it would be finished sooner rather than later. Once he was finished, Peter returned to the mirror dimension, read the contract over one last time, and signed it as well. Though as he did so, he made sure to fill his mind with one sentence that repeated over and over again. Follow the contract dutifully. 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 Peter's entire mind was filled with this and only this. Of course, he did this to combat the possibility of the genie changing his wish based on the thoughts in his mind. Though this is just an extra bit of security, as the contract has a special clause for unintended wishes. Peter was just being extra careful. Easily hearing Peter's thoughts, Genie smirked for a moment before snatching the contract. It was time to get down to business. Snapping his fingers, the contract began to glow in a red hue, filling the mirror dimension with a light so bright that Peter was forced to shield his eyes. Good luck, kid. Peter awoke to the roaring of a crowd blaring in his ears. Bone saw. Bone saw. Bone saw. Bone saw. Bone saw. Bone saw, bone saw, bone saw, bone saw, bone saw, bone saw, bone saw. Groggily opening his eyes, Peter found himself seated among the screaming crowd with a bottle of beer in hand. He felt a bit tipsy, which was odd as it would take a lot of alcohol to get him to this point. Peter looked up and realized that he was in some sort of arena that was hosting a wrestling match. One, two, three. That's it. He saw the referee count as a muscle covered leotard wearing wrestler with long black hair pinned his overweight opponent, winning the fight. Bone saw? That sounds familiar? Peter thought as the bell rang, signifying the end of the match. As the chubby wrestler who lost was carted out of the ring, the winner stood up and enjoyed the cheering of his many fans. Bone saw. 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 Soon enough, a flashily dressed man with sunglasses and a microphone entered the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Bone Saw McGraw. For $3,000, is there no one here man enough to stay in the ring for three minutes with this titan of testosterone? Who? I know who. The Flying Dutchman. Boo. The crowd didn't seem very convinced. As the Flying Dutchman came strutting out and entered the ring, Peter tried to understand what was happening. He felt that this situation was very familiar, though he could quite put his finger on it. Maybe the slight buzz he was feeling from the beer was messing with his mind? Winner. The referee called out as Bone Saw threw his weak opponent out of the ring. Next victim. Bonesaw roared toward the announcer. Are you ready for more? The flashy announcer asked as Bonesaw pulled the mic toward himself. Bonesaw is ready. He said his trademark catchphrase. Pulling the microphone back, the announcer waited for the crowd to calm down before speaking again. Will the next victim please enter the arena at this time? The announcer seemed to wait for some information before continuing the show. 
If he can withstand just three minutes in the cage with Bone Saw McGraw the sum of $3,000 will be paid to the terrifying, the deadly, the amazing Spider-Man. What? Peter blurted out in shock. Just like all of the other contestants, this one walked down the runway to the ring, though his appearance was rather shabby. He wore the worst-looking Spider-Man costume that Peter has ever seen. The colors were right, but the clothes were all normal and rather cheap to be honest. Sweatpants, sweatshirt, Nike high tops, and a balaclava. Insert picture of the first Tobey Maguire spider costume here, he looked truly pitiful. Is that who I think it is? Peter thought as he watched the new contender timidly enter the ring. Kill. 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 Everyone called for blood. The crowd roared as a huge cage descended to cover the ring, trapping both competitors inside. Cage. 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 The crowd was loving it. Will the guards please lock the cage doors at this time? The announcer called, and the match was ready to begin. Hey listen. This is some kind of mistake. I didn't sign up for a cage match. Unlock that thing. Peter heard the voice of the badly dressed Spider-Man and immediately knew who it was. That's Spider-Man. He thought dumbly. A slash N, people die if they are killed Shiro Amiya, of course, he means Tobey Maguire Spider-Man from the original trilogy. Hey, freak show. You're going nowhere. I got you for three minutes. Three minutes of playtime. Bonesaw exclaimed and the bell rang, starting the match. Did the trial send me to another universe, or is this an illusion? Peter wondered as he tried to use his powers. What the? Instantly, he realized that his powers weren't responding at all. Both his spider slash super soldier powers and his mystic art seemed unreachable. Not even the reality stone was responding, though that would prove this to be an alternate universe. After all, the infinity stones for one universe would be nothing more than a beautiful rock in another. Suddenly, as Peter was panicking due to his lack of abilities, something shocking happened. A floating text box appeared in his vision as if he were playing some sort of video game. First trial, save Uncle Ben. Details, an alternate version of yourself is about to lose his uncle-slash-father figure to an armed carjacking. Your alternate self could have stopped this from happening, but instead chose to allow the man who would later kill his uncle to escape due to feelings of vengeance. Objective, save Ben Parker from his sad fate while still showing your alternate self the error of his ways reward, infinite potential limitations, all powers are confiscated until the end of this trial, slight inebriation, it's been a while since I've felt this weak. Peter sat there with an idiotic look on his face. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the new champion, Spider-Man. The announcer exclaimed as Bone saw Lay passed out in the middle of the ring. Spider-Man. 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 The roar of the crowd knocked Peter from his shock as he watched his alternate self hold his arms up in celebration. Before he knew it, the match came to an end. I don't have much time. Peter thought as he sprung out of his seat. I need to find that thief. Getting his bearings, Peter walked along the crowd and followed his alternative self. I need to find where the boss's office is. Peter thought as he tried to keep Toby, other Peter, in sight. The man who kills Uncle Ben will rob the boss of this WWE knockoff show, so he needs to find that office as quickly as possible. How the hell am I supposed to save Uncle Ben and teach Toby a lesson at the same time? Peter wondered as he used the skills he learned from Natasha to maneuver around the building. Although he didn't have any of his powers anymore, Peter took good care of himself and went through training under the Black Widow herself, so this shouldn't be so bad. If the task was to beat some supervillain with the same limitations, then I would have a much harder time. Peter thought as he snuck past security whilst keeping Toby in view. Luckily, this place wasn't some government facility, or else Peter would be having a much harder time dodging security. Peter remembered Natasha's words as he casually walked past some security guards. Most people won't question you as long as you walk with purpose. It's the idiots that creep around that get caught. Move as if you belong, and the likelihood of being stopped is extremely low. I'm really thankful for basic training right now, Peter thought as he followed Toby to an elevator. This has to be the elevator to the office. Peter watched as Toby entered the elevator and headed downwards, not bothering to follow. Though he did pay attention to which floor the elevator stopped. Thankfully he's new to his powers, or else I'd be caught by now. Peter thought as a man walked past him and hit the button on the same elevator, waiting for it to return. Watching the man closely, Peter could see the outline of a gun in his waistband. That's the guy who kills Uncle Ben. Peter watched as he waited for the elevator, pondering how he should handle the situation. What makes his job hard is the fact that he has to save Uncle Ben while still teaching his alternate self the same lesson. I can only think of one way, but I need to remember where Uncle Ben will be. Peter thought as he tried to remember the movie. Time seemed to slow as Peter thought carefully. Toby wanted to go to the fights in order to make some money off of his power, but Uncle Ben wanted to talk to him, so he offered to drive. After a small spat in the car, which could be completely blamed on Toby, Uncle Ben said he would pick him up at the same exact spot. The question was where did his alternative self lie about going to his uncle? Wasn't it a library? 
Peter thought as he suddenly recalled the scene in the movie. The downtown library? Uncle Ben would be waiting at the downtown library. And thankfully, both Peters are from New York City, so he knew exactly where the downtown library is. Hopefully, this universe's New York City isn't too different from mine, Peter thought as he waited for the elevator to open before following Uncle Ben's killer inside. Hey, sorry. Peter apologizes as he stops the doors from closing and walks inside. The would-be thief and killer of a very beloved character merely stared at Peter in annoyance. Hitting the button for the floor directly below, Peter leaned against the elevator wall as the doors closed, locking him inside with a crazed criminal. Hey, you got a lighter? Peter asks as he steps closer to the man. Ah, uh, yeah. He says as he reaches into his pocket. Instantly, Peter launches forward and decked him across the face. Ugh. The man grunted as his body slammed against the wall. Sorry about this. Peter mutters as he grasps the man by the hair and smashes his skull against the nearest wall. But you technically deserve it? Just as Uncle Ben's would-be killer dropped to one knee, Peter reached by the man's waist and pulled out his pistol. It's not personal, Peter says as he rested the barrel against the guy's head and pulled the trigger. Some blood spattered on Peter, but most of it, including some brain matter, sprayed onto the opposite wall. Well, maybe it is kind of personal? Peter muttered as he stashed the gun in his waistband. After all, he's Peter Parker as well, and seeing his uncle die, even in movies, was something that needed to be avenged. Peeking up at the camera in the corner of the elevator, Peter smiled and waved uncaringly. This isn't my universe, so it's not like it matters if anyone sees me. Quickly hiding the body on the next floor, Peter took the bag that the man had on him and followed Toby down to the office floor. I can't believe I'm doing this. Peter thought as he exited the elevator and strolled up to the office. Just as he was about to open the door, Peter's alternate self pulled it open with a pissed off look in his eyes and a $100 bill in hand. I would be too if I was promised $3,000 and only got a tiny fraction. Peter thought as Toby brushed past him. Hey, what the hell? The boss shouted as Peter walked in uninvited. On the desk in front of him was at least $20,000 in cash, making Peter wonder why this guy didn't just pay Toby his money. After all, he would probably return to fight again if the money was good, and having Spider-Man as one of your wrestlers would have easily filled seats. Put the money in the bag, Peter orders as he tosses the bag in the boss's face and pulls out his newfound gun. And make it quick or I'll blow your brains out. Outside of the office, Toby stood by the elevator, listening to the man who just ripped him off get robbed and doing nothing about it. Seconds later, Peter ran out of the office with a gun in one hand and a bag full of money in the other. Hey! He stole my money. The boss yells from his office, alerting some nearby security guards. Peter didn't bother with them as he ran towards Toby and the elevator, and just like in the movie, his alternate self steps out of the way and allows him to pass without a problem. Stop that guy. The security yells. Thanks for the assist. Peter makes it very clear that he helped him get away. After all, he did call the elevator just in time for the escape. Stop him. He's got my money. The boss yelled as the elevator closed and Peter disappeared. What the hell's the matter with you? The security guard admonishes Toby before turning around and rushing off. I'll cut him off in the lobby and call the cops. As the security disappears, the boss comes walking over to Toby with a frown on his face. You could have taken that guy apart. Now he's going to get away with my money. He didn't sound too pleased. I missed the part where that's my problem. Toby stared him in the eye for a moment and then walked off. As Peter rushed through the arena and made his way outside, he was able to easily ditch the security guards. Blending into the crowd of fans outside, Peter quickly figured out where he was and rushed toward the downtown library. As he ran, Peter could hear sirens behind him, rushing to the arena, but thankfully he wasn't there anymore. Where is he? Peter muttered as he arrived at the library. Looking around, he spotted an old beat-up 73 Oldsmobile Delta 88, with an elderly silhouette in the driver's seat. Insert picture of Uncle Ben here, he has good taste in cars, Peter thought as he stalked up to the car and entered the passenger seat. Peter, I'm sorry about before. I know Dash Ben spoke before he knew who it was, only to find a stranger with a gun in his car. Hello, I'm Peter. It's nice to meet you. I'm sorry that it has to be under these circumstances. Peter greets the shocked old man kindly. Well, as kindly as someone with a gun could be. W what do you want? I don't have much money, but you can take it all. Just don't shoot, alright? Ben spoke nervously. Sorry, I'm not here for money. Do you have paper and a pen? Peter asks, confusing the poor old man even more. Why yeah, in the glove box? Ben shakily points it out. Thank you. Peter nods as he pulls out a notepad and pen. Whilst keeping the gun trained on Ben, Peter quickly wrote a long note and handed it to him. What's this? Ben asks warily. Don't read it yet. That's for you and your nephew. Please put it in your pocket and read it with him once I'm gone. Peter says, as Ben looks down at the paper curiously before stashing it in his pocket. Why are you doing this? Ben asks in confusion. The gun in my hand may make my answer unbelievable, but I'm here to save your life. Peter says as he looks through the rearview mirror, waiting for Toby's arrival. You're right, I don't believe you. Ben guessed that Peter was some sort of serial killer. 
That's okay, Peter says as he looks over at Ben for a moment. You know, I never met my Uncle Ben, so this is a weird experience for me. May rarely ever talks about him. Question mark. If Ben wasn't confused before, then now he definitely was. What did you say your name was again? Peter, he replied simply. Alright, so why do you need to save my life? Ben asks out of curiosity. Well, technically I already saved your life, Peter says as he gestured to his gun. This gun belonged to the man that would have killed you tonight? Where is he? Ben asks. Dead in a bathroom stall about three miles that way, Peter points backward. You killed him? Ben asks in fearful realization. Yup, oops. I probably shouldn't have said that. Peter says as he looks over at Ben's horrified face. You're all about pacifism, aren't you? With great power, comes great responsibility, right? How do you dash oh, action is coming. Peter mutters as he caught sight of Toby in the distance. Acting quickly, he hops over to the back seat and waits. Uncle Ben, I'm sorry about earlier. I shouldn't have said dash Toby apologizes as he sat in the passenger seat, though he froze when his spider senses started tingling out of nowhere. Turning to the side, he found his scared uncle with a gun at the back of his head and a very familiar man in the back seat. Thanks for the assist, Peter's earlier words rang out in Toby's mind. Hello, it's nice to see you again, Peter smiles and waves with his free hand. Thanks for the help earlier. Ben looked at his nephew in confusion, wondering what Peter meant by that. I, Toby was lost for words. As thanks for helping me, I decided to give you a gift, Peter's smile turns a bit manic as he prods the gun forward against Ben's head. Channel the Joker. I'm the Joker. Why so serious? Do you want to know how I got these scars? Wait stop. Toby begged. But before we get to the gift, we need to listen to Uncle Ben's important lesson about power and responsibility, Peter says as he turns to Ben expectantly. Say it, uh, he froze on the spot. Just do what he says, Toby says worriedly as he eyes Peter with a deadly glare. With great power, comes great responsibility? Ben says unsurely. See, this is why we need to listen to our elders. They're so insightful, Peter nodded as he looked his alternate self in the eyes. Anyway, here's your gift, Toby watched in slow motion as Peter's finger squeezed the trigger, yet he could do nothing about it. Not only was he new to his powers, but he had no experience in situations like this. He's just a high school kid. And just as he and Ben were waiting for the ear-piercing bang, which thankfully never came. Click Peter pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. Just kidding, Peter says he pulled out the mag and showed that it was empty. It was never loaded. Toby seemed to freeze for a moment as he wound back his hand, ready to pinch Peter square in the jaw. Though before he could do so, another text box appeared in front of Peter, though only he could see it. First trial, save Uncle Ben, completed, objective, save Ben Parker from his sad fate while still showing your alternate self the error of his ways, two halves, reward, infinite potential, acquired, limitations, removed, oh, looks like my time is done here, Peter says cryptically as he ignores his counterpart in favor of Uncle Ben. Don't forget my note and once again, I'm sorry about this, though you may be thanking me later on. That is, if we ever meet again, as he finished speaking, Peter's figure began to fade, until he completely disappeared, though his alternate self still swung. This universe's Peter broke the back seat in half with a single punch, missing his target completely and shocking his uncle. What the hell was that? Toby muttered as he turned to his uncle, forgetting that he just revealed his strength. Ben stayed silent as he reached into his pocket and pulled out a letter. Blessed Mary, in a high-security laboratory, a shining blue-skinned man stood bound in the center of the room, forced into a deep sleep. Insert picture of Electro here, Maxwell Dillon, also known as Electro, is an electrical engineer turned villain. Shunned for most of his life, Dillon was extremely insecure and lonely, seeing himself as a self-proclaimed nobody despite designing New York's power grid for Oscorp Industries. However, Max was saved by Spider-Man on his way to work one day, in one of the hero's many fights against the Russian mob. That encounter could be said to be the highlight of Max's entire life. Treated with kindness by the superhero, Max became fanatically obsessed with Spider-Man, coming to reimagine his life as a fantasy in which he and the latter were best friends. Although he was deeply delusional, Max found himself becoming more confident and social in his daily life. However, his life would soon be changed forever when on the day of his birthday, he was forced to work overtime at Oscorp Tower in order to fix a loose electrical cable. Shocked by the giant cable, Max fell into a vat of electric eels, which mutated his body into a translucent form of living electricity. Confused and angry, Max's new electrical nature drove him to Times Square, where the police mistook him for a monster and swiftly attacked, provoking him into retaliating against them with his newfound powers. With the arrival of Spider-Man, Max's rage soon worsened, as the superhero couldn't recognize him in his new form. How could his best friend not recognize him? When Spider-Man tried to talk and settle the situation peacefully, Max was shot by a sniper rifle, despite the hero promising him that the police wouldn't shoot at him anymore. Max's built-up rage and anger finally bubbled to the surface as he lost it and started attacking civilians, police, and the hero who he felt had betrayed him. 
Thankfully, Spider-Man managed to capture Electro in the end, sending him to his current prison, where he's heavily sedated and bound. Suddenly, alarms began to blare across the whole building, though they weren't able to wake Electro from his sleep. Seconds after the alarms went off, a young man with messy hair and a black leather jacket rushed inside with a crazed look in his eyes. Insert picture of Harry Osborne here, Harold Theopolis Osborne, the son of the deceased Norman Osborn, also known as the Green Goblin, and ex-CEO of Oscorp Industries, as the board voted him out rather recently. After discovering that he has the same incurable illness as his father, Harry became desperate to live. At first, he decided to get Spider-Man's blood, as he thought it could be used as a cure based on a video of Oscorp spiders, but he was swiftly denied by New York's favorite hero. Of course, Spider-Man wanted to help his friend, but the possibility of a negative reaction to his blood was very likely. And sadly, all of Oscorp's spiders were long gone, and even if they weren't, Harry didn't have access to anything at Oscorp anymore. Not only was he voted out, but he was also barred from entering the building. Though upon learning that the venom of one of the spiders was still kept in Oscorp's special projects vault, Harry decided that he had to steal it. It was his only way to survive, after all. Which is why he's here. To team up with Spider-Man's latest villain, Electro, and use him to get the venom that he so desperately needs. Staring at the bound glowing figure for a moment, Harry quickly hit a button on a nearby panel. Sedation off. A robotic voice spoke as the glowing captive groggily opened his eyes. I'm going to get you out of here, but we don't have much time. Harry says as he nervously looks over his shoulder. Who are you? Electro asks in a deep and rumbly voice. I'm Harry Osborne, and I have a deal for you, he offered. I should kill you Max wasn't so fond of anybody related to Oscorp. Come on, think bigger, Max. Harry exclaimed as he looked Electro in the eyes. I'm not the one you want. You want Spider-Man and I can give him to you, but I need something first. Suddenly, Harry could hear the sound of footsteps rushing his way from the hall. Max, we don't have much time. Harry continues to frantically look over his shoulder. Give me one reason why I should trust you? Electro asks in suspicion. Because I need you. Harry was practically begging at this point. Those words seemed to spark something in Max's delusional brain. You need me. He muttered. No one has ever needed him before, not even Spider-Man, the friend who betrayed him. As they spoke, a whole team of heavily armed guards rushed into the room and grabbed Harry, who started flailing against their hold. I need you, please. Harry yelled and screamed as they pulled him away from Electro. Please, I don't want to die. I need you. With every word spoken, electricity began to dance around Electro's blue body, sparking hope in Harry as he thrashed against the guards. Aha! Electro screamed as he was covered in electricity and disappeared from his bindings. Tzzzzz. As he disappeared, a wisp of blue lightning shot across the room, zapping each of the guards, killing them in an instant. As the dead guards collapsed to the floor, Electro appeared in the air, surrounded by crackling electricity. What's the plan? In a packed road of standstill traffic, which was very normal for New York City, a beautiful blonde woman sat at the back of a taxi, on her way to the airport. Insert picture of Gwen Stacy here, Gwen Maxine Stacy was the classmate and girlfriend of Peter Parker and the daughter of the chief police officer, George Stacy. After Spider-Man's emergence, Gwen soon figured out that her boyfriend was a superhero and supported him as best as she could. A year into their relationship, Gwen was accepted into Oxford in England, which sadly caused the two to split apart. What the hell? The taxi driver mutters as he and Gwen watch everyone get out of their cars and walk over to the sidewalk. Wait here, Gwen says as she leaves the cab to check it out. From the sidewalk, Gwen could see across the water, where the Brooklyn Bridge stood with a giant message written across it in what appeared to be a spider's web. I love you, just as a smile bloomed on her face, a man in a red and blue spider-themed costume swung by, lifting her off the ground and taking her with him. Atop the web-filled bridge, Gwen removed Spider-Man's mask and found her handsome boyfriend underneath. Insert picture of Andrew Garfield Spider-Man here, did you get my message? Peter asks as he held the love of his life in his arms. Yeah, I think the whole city got your message. Gwen smiled happily. I love you, Peter confesses as he looks into her eyes. I know there are a million reasons why we shouldn't be together, but I'm tired of them. We all have to make a choice, and I choose you. Gwen was on the verge of tears. So, England. I'm following you. I'm following you everywhere, Peter states, shocking Gwen, as she knew how important New York was to Spider-Man. They have crime there, right? They got Jack the Ripper Dash before Peter could do his usual rambling. Gwen leaned forward and captured his lips, shutting her boyfriend up real quick. As the budding couple was making out at the top of the bridge with the sun setting behind them, suddenly, the entire city's lights flickered for a moment before shutting down completely. Boom boom boom. Alongside the city-wide power outage, a handful of isolated electrical explosions could be seen as well. And as the two separated from their kiss to see what was happening, Peter's eyes flashed for a moment, though Gwen didn't notice it. Instantly, this universe's Peter took a back seat, trapped in his own mind as another took his place. What the hell? Peter muttered as he assessed his new surroundings, finding a familiar beauty in his arms and a sweet taste in his mouth. Is that Emma Stone? 
He instantly knew where he was. The amazing Spider-Man too. Is that Max? Gwen asks as she eyes a glowing figure in the distance, who seemed to be sucking in all of the power from the city's power plant. As Peter followed her gaze to get a closer look, a big text box appeared, blocking his view. Second trial, save Gwen Stacy details, an alternate version of yourself is about to lose the love of his life. Gwen Stacy will be killed by Harry Osborne, otherwise known as Green Goblin, after helping her boyfriend deal with the escaped villain Electro. Objective, save Gwen Stacy from her tragic fate and defeat the two villains, Electro slash Green Goblin, reward, perfect evolution limitations, stuck in the body of your counterpart, limited to only his powers. Okay, save one damsel and beat two villains. I can do this, Peter thought as he started formulating a plan. Ah hey, what's happening? Get me out of here. Suddenly, Peter heard a voice shouting in his mind, distracting him from thinking properly. Ah hey, what's happening? Get me out of here. Andrew, other Peter, screamed in his mind. He tried everything but for some reason, he was trapped in his own body, while another man took control. I get your hands off of her. He yelled as Peter continued to hold Gwen closely. Would you rather I let go and let a strong wind blow her off of the bridge? Peter asks, as their current position wasn't exactly safe. Peter, are you okay? Gwen asks as she noticed the odd look on her boyfriend's face. Yeah, I'm fine. Just thinking about how to deal with Max, Peter says as he looks off toward the power plant, where Electro was shining brightly compared to the dark city. I am not okay. We are not okay. Get out of my body right now. Andrew continued his angry yelling. Look dumbass. I'm here to fix things so you don't lose Gwen, so shut up. I need to think properly. Furthermore, I'm stuck in your weak body and about to face a pretty overpowered guy, so some peace and quiet would really be appreciated. Peter lost it as he couldn't take the constant screaming. A week? Wait, what about Gwen? He asks, but Peter ignores him for now. Well, technically all Spider-Man are pretty strong, but Peter had the privilege of having a plethora of other powers at his disposal, including an Infinity Stone. Are you sure? Gwen asks worriedly. Yeah, let's get you out of here, Peter says as his hold tightens around her. Wait dash Gwen tried to speak as Peter leaped into the air and swung off. As they swung across the city, in the opposite direction of the the villain at the power plant, Gwen tried to protest and even struggled against Peter's hold, though she was far too weak to get away. Ah hey, don't hold her like that. And what did you mean earlier? How can I lose Gwen? Andrew continued to pester Peter. What about be quiet don't you understand? Peter asks as he continues swinging Gwen as far away from danger as possible. You're giving me a headache? Ah uh, well, it's my body you're using. So, if I want to give myself a headache, then I will. Andrew shouted just to annoy Peter at this point. Look, I'll answer your questions, but just stop yelling. Peter sighed in annoyance. A uh, fine, who are you, what's happening, and why are you in my body? Andrew asks in a much lower tone. I'm Peter Parker and I'm here to complete a mission. Think of it like a quest in a game. Peter reveals a bit of what's going on. Though he made sure not to mention anything about the genie. You're me? Seriously that's all you could come up with? Andrew didn't believe a word of it. It's true, though I went for MJ in my universe. I guess we have different tastes in women. Peter shrugs uncaringly. Oh who? Andrew asks as Peter continued to swing across the darkened city with an Emma Stone lookalike in his arms. Ah uh, where are you taking her? Far away from danger? Peter answered. His goal was simple. Take Gwen so far from the villains that she wouldn't be able to follow him to her tragic death. After all, that's how she died in the movie. Okay, at least we agree on that. What do you mean by your universe? Is this like a weird multiverse thing? Andrew asked as Peter landed at the top of a tall skyscraper and set Gwen down. Hang on, let me deal with this, Peter says as Gwen glares at him. Ah good luck with that, you are not leaving me here. You can't even beat Max without me. I can help. Gwen set herself on tagging along. E. Andrew kept quiet compared to before. No, you're going to stay here and keep safe, Peter says as he turns to leave, but Gwen grabs his arm. You said that every time you get close to him, he fries your web shooters. How are you going to combat that? Gwen asks pointedly. I'll magnetize them, Peter answers swiftly. Uh-huh. I didn't think of that, magnetic fields can change the direction of electricity, repelling all of Electro's attacks. At least, on the web shooters. Gwen frowned as she was just about to suggest that. I can still help reboot the power grid. I saw the blueprints at Oscorp. Peter instantly denied as he pulled away from her grasp. Bye. After shooting her with a few webs, which locked her legs to the rooftop, Peter gave her a quick wave before swinging off toward the power grid. Peter. Gwen yelled angrily as he left. Okay, you just earned some of my trust. Thanks for not hurting Gwen. Andrew was very grateful. Ah uh, so, what's this quest of yours about? As Peter explained his trial to the voice in his head, he broke open a nearby car and stole some jumper cables and copper wire. Ah uh, just like 8th grade science class, Andrew muttered as Peter used those materials alongside the car's battery to magnetize his web shooters. Wait, did you say Green Goblin? Who the hell is that? 
This would be easier if you had organic web shooters like me, but not all Spider-Mans can be as great and awesome as me. Peter gloats as hell tossed the wires aside and rushed off to Electro. And yes, you'll see soon enough, Peter knew that explaining Harry's situation would both waste time and sadden his counterpart. After all, his friend has probably already turned into a monster. Yeah, we're not all narcissistic either. Andrew mutters though Peter ignores him completely. Either he is. Arriving at the power plant, Peter could see Electro hovering between some destroyer electrical towers. You're too late, Spider-Man. Electro's gaze turns to Peter. I designed this power grid, and now I'm going to take back what's rightfully mine. I will control everything. I'll be like a god to them. Ah what? A god that sparkles? Meh, I've seen gods and you don't measure up, Peter says as he leaps toward the enemy. Charging up his powers, Electro shot a bolt of energy at Peter. Ah watch out. Shooting a web at one of the many powerless electrical towers, Peter pulled himself out of the way as he kicked off of the tower and punched Electro square in the jaw. What's the matter? Peter asks as Electro fell from the sky and impacted the ground. I thought you were a god. I am. Electro shouts as he picks himself up off the floor. Then how are you losing to a mortal like me? Peter asks as he sidesteps a barrage of lightning. It's a lot harder to maneuver when it's not my own body. Ah uh, sorry? I guess, you should be. Peter thought as Electro turned into a shining wisp of electricity and started rapidly bouncing between the many electrical towers. Zigzagging across the power plant, Electro moved too fast for Peter to follow as he went on the offensive once again. Ugh. Peter grunted as was struck over and over again, unable to block or dodge. Ah hey. Fight back. I need to live in this body when you leave. Shut up. Peter muttered as he started shooting webs like crazy, whilst still taking damage. As some of the electricity made contact with the webs and climbed up to the web shooters on Peter's wrists, the magnetic field was able to repel it, keeping the web shooters from breaking. Soon enough, the webs formed into a large sparking electric net, which Electro dived right into on his own accord. You should really watch where you're going, Peter quips as he pulls on multiple lines of web, tightening the net around his opponent. Okay, time to delay, Peter thought as he started adding extra web to the net, thickening it while also making sure to connect it to every single tower in the power plant. Ah. Uh. Electro screamed as he struggled to escape, shooting more and more electricity into the webs. Be right back. Peter waved at the trapped villain and rushed off to a nearby building. Uh-huh. Why are you leaving him there? What's the plan? Andrew asks as Peter entered the building. What happens when you overcharge a battery? Peter asks as he runs through the building, looking for the grid's control room. It explodes. You want to use his power against him, E. Andrew sounded impressed as he realized Peter's plan. Yup, so hopefully I can get it rebooted before he frees himself. Peter thought as he found the control room. Taking a minute to familiarize himself with everything, Peter started playing around with the system, trying to understand it as quickly as possible. Ah Gwen would know how to do this, E. Andrew muttered. Yeah, and Gwen would die if she was here, so let's figure it out on our own, Peter replies as he started to understand the controls. Outside the building, Electro slowly began ripping his way out of the electrified net. Concentrating his power on his fingers, he was able to increase the heat of his electricity to burn the web net open. This, and here, there, connect this, flip these. Peter muttered as he worked quickly on the controls. I don't forget that lever. Andrew reminded him. I know. Peter rolled his eyes as he flipped the lever and held his hand over a large button. Spider-Man. Electro's scream carried all way to the control room, as he managed to free one-third of his body from the net. What are you waiting for? Hit the button. Hopefully this works. Peter muttered as he pressed the button. Instantly, the power plant lit up as the grid was reactivated. And enough electricity to power a large city filled the many towers in the plant, which soon coursed through the webs which Peter placed earlier. Each web led to the same place, the net which still trapped Electro's lower body. Though that was more than enough to get the job done. Aya! Electro screamed as the energy coursed through the net and entered his body. At first, he welcomed the additional power, but that didn't last for long. Electro quickly reached the limit as golden cracks began to form all over his body. Aya! His scream only got louder and louder before the inevitable happened. Boom! Electro exploded, sending a shock wave across the power plant without leaving shred of him behind, as if he never existed. Peter walked out of the building, arriving just in time to watch the explosion take place. One down, Peter muttered as he heard the faint sound of something soaring through the air. Ha 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 ha. A familiar manic laughter filled the night air. One more to go. Ha 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 ha. A familiar manic laughter filled the night air. Ah. Andrew watched in confusion as Peter turned to find a green armored figure flying their way on a hoverboard. One more and I get my prize. Peter says as the figure flew around for a moment before hovering a few meters away from him. Ah wait. That's, Andrew couldn't believe his eyes. Hello, Harry. Peter greets the crazed goblin looking man. Spider-Man, do you see what you made me do? Harry asks a bit frantically. His hair was shorter and looked to be falling out, and although they could only see his face, his skin also had a green gaunt sick tone to it. 
Not only that, but his eyes glowed a haunting green and his teeth appeared to be rotting in his mouth. Insert picture of Amazing Spider-Man Green Goblin here, what happened to him? Andrew asked in shock. A Green Goblin. You knew this would happen, didn't you? After all, he just saw Harry a couple of days ago and he looked perfectly healthy. Yes, though I arrived too late to stop him. Harry was desperate to not die like his father, so he did something rash. Peter explains partially as he looks up at Harry. You shouldn't blame others for your own mistakes, Harry. I didn't force you to do anything. I tried to protect him, I tried to protect you, Peter repeats out loud. Look at me. Harry screams in anger. Hey, it's going to be okay. Tell him it's going to be okay. I'll figure out how to fix this. Andrew sounded heartbroken. His friend was almost unrecognizable at this point. You don't give people hope. The goblin looks at Peter in betrayal. You take it away. Look, I'm going to be real here. Peter takes a moment to talk to Andrew. If I didn't show up for my mission, he would have killed Gwen. Now, I can capture him alive, but I'm telling you right now. He's a lost cause already. Based on movie and comic book logic, Peter knew that capturing Green Goblin would most likely result in him escaping, later on, to wreak havoc once again. Especially since Peter wouldn't be able to stay and help out. As soon as the trial is completed, he'll get ejected from the universe, just like last time. I don't say that. Harry is my best friend, he exclaimed sadly. Look, I know that you probably don't want to hear this, but I'll say it anyway. If you want to guarantee Gwen and Aunt May's safety, then leaving Harry alive would be a very big mistake. He was silent for a moment before responding. I know, I'll fix him. Andrew wouldn't take Peter's advice. Uh, he hasn't done anything yet. Gwen is still alive. Capture him and I'll deal with everything afterward. Besides, this isn't your world, and nor is it your body. It's not up to you. Are you sure? Peter asks one final time. Since he's your friend, I'll do what you want? Yeah, I'm sure. Hearing his counterpart's answer, Peter shrugged as he turned his attention back to the giggling green maniac on a hoverboard. Look, I'm going to make this quick since you're a bit of a small fry, Peter says uncaringly. Because compared to Electro, who was fairly overpowered and took some thinking to beat, Green Goblin wasn't much of an opponent. At least for Peter. If this was Andrew in the driver's seat, then maybe the fight would be a challenge, but sadly for Harry, that wasn't the case. All he had was a minor increase in his physique from the venom he took, and a bit more added power from the exoskeleton armor that covered his entire body. Other than that, he's nothing but a spoilt rich boy with power that he hasn't mastered yet. Ha 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 ha. Harry began to laugh like a madman. We'll see about that. As he finished speaking, the goblin flew off into the distance, though Peter acted quickly and shot a web at his back. Where do you think you're you going? Peter asked as he yanked the web back and pulled it over his head. In an instant, the green goblin was pulled alongside his hoverboard and arched over Peter before slamming onto the concrete floor, creating a small crater from the impact. Ah hey! I said to capture him alive. Andrew complained. Oh, shut up. He's fine. Peter replied as Harry picked himself up. Looking down at his broken hoverboard, the green goblin clicked his tongue in annoyance before setting his sights back on Peter. That board wasn't cheap, you know. Harry smirked as he reached over to his waist and pulled out multiple advanced-looking grenades. Here, catch. Ha ha ha. Without a care for the surroundings, he started throwing grenades everywhere and laughing madly as he did so. Boom 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 boom. Peter merely backed up and watched as the power plant was being destroyed, shutting down the city's electricity for a second time that night. Shouldn't you be stopping him? Andrew asks worriedly. Why bother? It's not like there are any bystanders here. All of this can be rebuilt. Peter didn't really care. Since this isn't his universe, Peter won't be stuck with cleanup duty, so why should he care as long as nobody is hurt? After a minute or two of explosions, Harry ran out of firepower and stood in the center of the destroyed power plant with a grin on his face. Did I get him? He muttered to himself. I think so. A voice answered from over his shoulder, almost whispering in his ear. Exclamation point. The green goblin jumped in shock and turned around. Bam. As soon as he caught sight of Peter standing behind him, a fist met his swiveling head, sending the green villain crashing down to one knee. I'll give you chance to give up before I'm forced to beat you into unconsciousness, Peter offers kindly. Hee hee, no thanks. The goblin chuckled as he sprung to his feet and swung at Peter. Sigh. Peter let out an annoyed breath as he sidestepped Harry's pitiful excuse for a punch. You have bad technique. You want to use your hips and lean in a bit when striking. Like this dash pow. Without holding back, Peter sent a heavy punch to Harry's jaw, as the rest of his body was currently protected by armor. See? Now you try. Peter stood by and waited for his opponent to pick himself up off the floor. This instructional sparring match continued, though only one side was really enjoying it. Ha ha ha. Green Goblin continued to laugh as he took yet another blow to the face. Is that all you got? Luckily, he has a small healing factor, which slowly started healing him up to fighting condition once again. Alright, I'm bored now. Peter muttered as he stomped on Harry's knee, sending him falling to the floor. Good night. Bang. Using all of the power in his current body, 
Peter grabbed his opponent's head and sent a fierce knee to his face which thankfully seemed to knock him unconscious. There, captured alive and well. Don't say I never did anything for you, Peter says to his grateful counterpart. Though before Andrew could speak his thanks, the sound of a speeding car could be heard in the distance. Seconds later, a black sports car pulls up, and Gwen hops out with an angry glare. I can't believe you left me webbed up on a skyscraper. She exclaimed furiously. Well, it was either that or find the nearest prison cell. Peter replies jokingly. A please don't start anything because I'm the one who has to finish it when you're gone, Eandrew begged in dread. After all, he's the one that has to deal with Gwen's bad mood when Peter leaves. I is that Harry? Gwen asked in shock. Just as she was freaking out about their friend's odd appearance, Harry's body twitched as he leaped off of the ground and rushed in Gwen's direction. No. Though just as he caught sight of Gwen, the goblin seemed to freeze for a moment, giving Peter just enough time to act. Shooting a web at his arm, Peter pulled Harry away from Gwen and kicked him upside head, knocking him out old for a second time. As I said, she won't be safe with him around? Peter reiterates his point as a familiar text box appeared in his line of sight. But I'll leave it up to you. Second trial, save Gwen Stacy, completed. Objective, save Gwen Stacy from her tragic fate and defeat the two villains, two halves, reward, perfect evolution, acquired. Limitations, removed he seeing that his second and last trial was completed, Peter knew that his time in this universe was coming to an end. Well, it was nice meeting you, Peter Parker. Peter says goodbye as his consciousness fades from his counterpart's body just in time for Gwen to rush into Andrew's arms. You too, Peter Parker, mirror dimension, huh? Peter grunted as he returned to his body, which felt different than before. Congratulations. Jeannie exclaimed as fireworks filled the sky. You are one of the few to ever pass multiple trials at once. I knew you could do it. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. You are now meeting the Grandmaster. After going through a quick LSD nightmare in the tunnel, suddenly Tony, Rhodes, Gamora, and Pepper appeared somewhere else, surrounded by weirdly dressed rich folks and a bunch of palace guards, like the ones that were outside. Sat on an ornate throne by the window, a tall mysterious man in golden robes eyed them with interest. His silver hair defied gravity, similar to his brother, the Collector. A slash N, yes, they are related. Insert picture of the Grandmaster here, he looks right at the group in question, though he doesn't know what to make of them. He's curious, thrilled, revolted, and titillated all at the same time. Meanwhile, the many odd-looking guests enjoy what seemed to be a penthouse party while eyeing Tony's group curiously. Sitting back on his throne, the Grandmaster turns to his trusty guard at his side. A round woman in black and brown armor with a spear in hand. Although she doesn't look it, Topaz is one of the strongest guards in the Grandmaster's employment. They don't look very strong. He lounges on his throne and looks over the group with an appraising eye. Especially that one. Of course, he pointed right at Pepper, who was still shaking a bit from the grand finale of the ride they were on. Topaz merely shrugs, uncaringly. Peps, are you going to take that? Tony asked, though she didn't seem to care one bit. Do you think any of them could be a contender? The Grandmaster asked his quiet guard. No, they won't even last a day. She answers honestly. Last a day in what? Tony asks curiously. The Grand Arena, of course. The Grandmaster elegantly stands from his throne. Sakaar's number one form of entertainment, the Contest of Champions. A cosmic competition between the strongest fighters at my disposal. Did you not pay attention during the welcome ride? Well, it wasn't exactly clear, was it? Tony says as he steps out of the train cart and grabs a glass of what looked like orange champagne from a nearby waitress. Ha! The Grandmaster finally noticed that at least one of his guests wasn't bound, as they were supposed to be. Topaz, what the hell? Don't look at me. She had no idea what was happening. I'm not in charge of the welcome ride. So, you're the king around here or whatever? Tony asks as he sips his drink. Instantly, his eyes go wide as he looked down at his glass in shock. Wow, what is this? I've never tasted anything like it. Tony asks as he takes another sip. Pepper, come try this. Hearing him, the rest of the group leaves the cart, showing that they weren't bound either. Sigh, remind me to figure out what's wrong with the ride later. The Grandmaster told Topaz as he looks back to his guests. So, who are you? Tony Stark, genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist. Ow. Tony introduces himself and gets an elbow to the rib from Pepper. Seeing the glare she was sending him, Tony quickly revised his statement. Sorry, genius, billionaire, philanthropist. He says as he looks to Pepper for approval. And this is my dominatrix, Pepper Potts. Pepper just rolled her eyes as she sipped on the champagne. Rhodes. Gamora. The other two were short in their introductions, as they knew a fight would most likely break out soon enough. Wow, great. The Grandmaster seemed bored by them. After all, he was most likely hoping for stronger fighters, yet he received some normal-looking humans instead. Whilst they were talking, a guard whispered something to Topaz, who instantly brought the information to her boss. We located your cousin. She reports. Oh good. His bored mood flipped on its head as he turned to his guests. Yeah, come on. I think you're gonna like this. The Grandmaster struts forward with his robe fluttering behind him. 
As he walked, Topaz and the other guards formed up around him, making sure the new guests don't try anything. Strapped to a chair across the room, sat a terrified bald alien man with pale skin and golden eyes. There he is. The Grandmaster welcomes the man's arrival with open arms and a smile on his face. Hey, cuz. We almost couldn't find you. Where have you been hiding? The Grandmaster's cousin looked at Tony's group, weeping as he cowered in fear. So. The Grandmaster utters as he watched his cousin's display in distaste. Please, I'm sorry. He pleads for forgiveness. I won't try to leave again. Just please don't kill me. Sakar is my home, I swear. Carlo. The Grandmaster walks up and rests a comforting hand on his cousin's shoulder. I pardon you. Thank you. Thank you. The man sighed in relief as he smiled up at his cousin. You're officially pardoned, from life. The Grandmaster adds as he casually takes Topaz's staff and jabs it toward his cousin's chest. Tony. Pepper didn't want to play the party guests anymore. I got it. Tony nodded as his body was instantly covered in red and gold armor. Pow, clank. Firing his palm thruster, Tony watched as it impacted the spear, knocking it out of the Grandmaster's hands and saving the bound man's life. The sound of heavy breathing and whimpering filled the room as Carlo seemed to be having a panic attack from the near-death experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He repeated over and over again. As soon as the spear clanked onto the floor, every Sakaran guard in the room turned to Tony with their weapons drawn. Wait. The Grandmaster stopped them from firing as he turned to see the armor covering Tony's body. Excellent. He didn't care about the attack on his person at all. In fact, it helped reveal the possibilities of a new champion to him. Is that some sort of exoskeleton? He asked as he started circling Tony and his group. Of course, his guards kept their weapons trained on them, as the Grandmaster's safety is their top priority. No, I built it myself. Tony says as he turns to Pepper and Rhodes, who quickly activate their armor as well. As for Gamora, she simply pulled a knife out of her belt and waited for the fight to start. Amazing. Could you make one for me too? The Grandmaster asked hopefully. I would be willing to set you free in exchange for a set of armor like that. Not happening. Pepper spoke for Tony, as she felt more confident in her blue armor. You heard the lady? Tony nods. What a shame. The Grandmaster mutters sadly as he walks back to his throne. Capture them though prioritize the armor. Feel free to kill them if you have to. Just make sure my armor isn't too damaged. Yes, sir. Topaz nods as she gestures to her men. Finally, the fun can begin. Mirror dimension, congratulations. Genie exclaimed as fireworks filled the sky. You are one of the few to ever pass multiple trials at once. I knew you could do it, master. Thanks, though it wasn't that hard. Peter shrugs as he still felt an odd sensation in his body. Seeing the look on his master's face, Genie quickly spoke up. What you're feeling is your wishes. They've already been granted. He explains. Right, why does everything feel, tingly? Peter asked curiously. If I had to guess, I'd say you're evolving, Genie says as a chart of the human evolution appeared behind him. From monkeys to cavemen to modern day humans. Normal humans evolve slowly over time, but you're on the fast track, my friend, Genie says with a smile. That tingling is you moving up the evolutionary ladder, right? Peter muttered as he wondered if the feeling would go away. So, how long have I been away? 1000. Genie spoke dramatically as always, worrying Peter, as he had family and responsibilities to attend to. Seconds. It hasn't even been an hour, kid. Relax, sigh. Please don't do that again. Peter let out a relieved breath. Hee hee, so how were the trials? Genie quickly changes the subject. Fine, but I should probably go. Peter says as he pulls out the genie's lamp. I have to pick up a crewmate and check on a friend of mine. Seeing the lamp in his hand, Genie instantly knew what Peter was thinking. He was going to send him back into the lamp. Oh? Can I come? Genie asked as his face morphed into the perfect set of puppy dog eyes. Ah, uh, can you disguise yourself? Peter asked, as he didn't need anyone knowing about Genie. Can I disguise myself? Is that even a question? Genie asks incredulously as he snapped his fingers and morphed into a blue-skinned human figure. See? How do I look? That could work. You look like a Cree, Peter muttered in approval. What should I call myself? Glenn? No. Javier, Coot, Sandra, Freddy. Genie starts listing off names as his outfits change to match them. Just stick with Genie, Peter says with a tired sigh. Nobody would believe that you're actually a genie, so it's fine. Just keep your magic use to a minimum. Sir, yes sir. Genie saluted. Good, also keep my secrets between us, Peter ordered seriously. He didn't know what genie knew about him, but there were many secrets in his mind that he didn't want aired out to anyone. Hey, do I look like that kind of genie to you? He asked almost offended that Peter would have to ask that. Just making sure. Peter sighed as stashed the lamp away and opened a portal. Come on. Let's go. Sakar when Peter stepped through the portal alongside Genie, he was expecting a pristine Kree ship, but that certainly wasn't what he found. You, are you sure you took us to the right place? Genie asked as he eyed the rolling hills of space waste in the distance. Yeah, look over there. Peter points to a destroyed Kree warship. That's our ship? Is this Sakar? 
Peter wondered as he looked up to see a sky full of wormholes. Oh, my condolences, Jeannie offered some kind words for the dearly departed. Yeah, it was a good ship? Peter frowned at the loss of a very expensive warship. I meant for your friends, Jeannie clarifies. Meh, they wouldn't die so easily. Peter shrugged as the sound of a ship's engine fills the air. Suddenly, a ship flew overhead before landing a few meters away. It was rather sleek and dangerous looking too, matching the name written on its hull. Warsong, as the ship's cockpit opened, an alien form of rock and roll filled the area as a beautiful yet dangerous woman stepped out with a liquor bottle in hand. Insert picture of Valkyrie slash Brunhilde here, a ramp extends in front of the ship, leading all the way to the ground below. As she stumbled drunkenly down the ramp, Brunhilde stops for a moment to lift a half-empty bottle to her lips and chugs it down. Swiftly finishing the bottle and smashing it on the side of the ramp, she continues her way down to Peter and Jeannie. Though, she veered off course and fell straight into a pile of trash. Is she alright? Jeannie asked as Valkyrie fell from her ship and landed in a pile of garbage. I think so. Peter nodded as she stood up and looked their way. Her eyes were hazy, and she stood with a sort of sway to her stance, but otherwise, Brunhilde looked to be fine. Unluckily, she held on to some dead alien beast's carcass for support, which collapsed due to decay, sending her tumbling back to the ground. Are you sure? Jeannie asks as she lay sprawled on the ground for a moment before picking herself up again. Eh, maybe not. Peter shrugged. She might even be drunker than when she met Thor in the movie. Surrender. She exclaimed as she stood and stumbled over to the bottom of her ship's ramp. Uh, ma'am. Are you alright? Jeannie asks, not seeing her as a threat at all. Do you need some help? I'm fine. Now surrender before I get violent. Brunhilde repeated, ready to fight at any moment. Look, lady. I don't know how much you've had to drink, but we can help. Peter decided to join in on the conversation. You probably shouldn't be flying your ship in that condition anyway. You want my ship, huh? She asks as she glanced her metal gauntlets together which activate with a blue light. Peter quickly projected an eldritch shield as he knew what was coming. I love it when they choose the hard way. She holds out her fists as if she's operating machinery. You look strong so hopefully you both survive. Instantly, her ship, Warsong whirls to life as the two main turrets shine in a blue light, matching the color of the energy on her gauntlets. Clenching her fists tightly as if she were operating a two-handed turret machine gun, a horrible screeching noise filled the air as Warsong's turrets began to spin and open fire. Aiming in their direction, a blue-hued spray of gunfire shot out, only lasting about three seconds before dying down. That should be enough. Brunhilde banged her fists together for a second time, deactivating the guns and sending her trusty ship back into idle mode. As the smoke cleared, the confident look on Valkyrie's drunken face disappeared and was replaced with a frown. Peter and Jeannie stood in the same spot without a single scratch on either one of them, surprising the former Valkyrie. That wasn't very nice, Peter mutters as Jeannie nodded beside him. Definitely not how you should greet someone, Jeannie said in disapproval. Brunhilde sighed as she pulled a sword from her hip and marched forward. Are you sure that you want to do this? Peter asks before she got too close. The first attack can be forgiven due to drunken stupidity, but another one, and I'll have to retaliate. Shut up and fight? She started as she lunged forward and swiped her blade in Peter's direction. Peter, being the gentleman that he is, simply stepped back and avoided the attack. One last chance! Exclamation point. Brunhilde picked up the pace as she continued the attack. Continuing to skillfully dodge every single sword swipe of hers, Peter watched as Valkyrie grew more frustrated with every failed blow. Meanwhile, Genie walked off to the side and enjoyed the show. After all, he was asked to keep his magic use to a minimum and his master didn't exactly need his help. Why are you attacking us again? Peter asked as he ducked under a sword thrust aimed at his chest. You'll find out soon enough. She exclaims as she kicks her leg at Peter's ankles, trying to ruin his footing. Sadly for her, he has his Peter tingle, so her plan was easily seen through. Meeting her kick with one of his own, a loud thud was heard as the two crossed chins. Although Peter didn't use all of his strength, as he didn't want to snap her leg in half, he did use more than enough power to send someone like Captain America to the hospital. Though luckily, Brunhilde is an Asgardian and not just any Asgardian but a former Valkyrie, an elite group of female Asgardian warriors that served as Odin's special force. Her strength was on a whole other level, allowing her to match Peter's kick without harm. You're pretty strong, Peter muttered as he put a bit more power into his leg. But not strong enough. Suddenly, Brunhilde was swept off of her feet and sent flying a few dozen meters, crashing into a big pile of junk in the distance. Bang! She seemed to hit a large piece of metal upon impact, while sending other small bits of trash flying into the air as well. Is she dead? Jeannie asked as he munched on a bucket of popcorn with a pair of 3D glasses on his face. Nope. Peter replied as the hill of garbage that she landed in began to shake. Seconds later, the trash dispersed, revealing Brunhilde who was lifting a giant cube of metal over her head. Without wasting any time, she wounded back for a moment before using all of her strength to hurl the heavy metal object in Peter's direction. Okay, I think that this has gone on long enough, Peter mutters as he remains still and reaches out with both hands. 
Brunhild watched as the cube smashed into her opponent. Though, oddly enough, it seemed to lose all of its momentum and freeze in place. This thing is heavy, Peter commented as he caught the cube and easily lifted it above his head, as if it were made of styrofoam. The expression on Peter's face betrayed the words that came out of his mouth, looking calm and relaxed as he lifted the metal and tossed it to the side. With a simple throw, the cube was sent flying into the distance before crashing into a mountain of garbage, which exploded upon impact. It was at this moment, Brunhild knew that she messed up. Quickly reaching into her pocket, she tried to pull out a small disc, which could be used to subdue stronger opponents. Though sadly, she was too late. Peter disappeared from his former position far faster than her eyes could follow. Why don't you take a nap? A familiar voice whispered into her ear as something impacted her neck and everything went dark. Clapping. Woo, that's my master. Genie cheered as a foam finger in his red and blue colors appeared on his hand, alongside other Spider-Man related merchandise. Thank you. Peter bows dramatically as he looks at Brunhild's ship. Since there's nothing but trash as far as the eye can see, let's take her ship and find some sort of town or city. What about her? Genie asked as he pointed to their knocked out attacker. We'll take her with us. She could have some useful information. Peter answers as he reaches down and drags her to the ship. In a barren black void of death, the sky opens up as a wave of women mounted on winged horses poured inside, each of them dressed in Asgardian armor and armed with spears, swords, and, shields. Brunhilde witnesses the event as if the moment was frozen in time, seeing herself among the sea of mounted Valkyrie. No. Go back. She screamed to her sisters, but no one seemed to hear her voice. You'll die. Don't come any closer. Directly below the force of flying warrior women stood Hela Odin's daughter in all her glory, black lightning flashing all around her. Suddenly, an infinite number of black weapons appeared around Hela and fired off toward the wave of Valkyrie, slaughtering them all, as Brunhilde warned. Please no. Not again. Tears filled Brunhilde's eyes as she watched countless Valkyrie falling through the dark space alongside their winged horses. Soon enough, the ground below was littered with the dead, and Hela didn't even break a sweat. Brunhilde cried as she watched her sisters die all over again. Her friends, mentors, teachers, rivals, and family members. All of them were dead, again. Through an open portal, only a few meters away sat the throne of Asgard. Ignoring the bloody scene around her, Hela advanced to the portal, but one Valkyrie stood in her way. Brunhilde, frozen in fear and shell-shocked. Hela smirked as she stalked forward and conjured a pitch-black sword into her hand. And just as Brunhilde was about to be decapitated, one of her sisters dived over at the last second, shoving her back through the portal and taking the fatal hit. Brunhilde watched it all replay, feeling just as useless and afraid as she did all those years ago. I should have done better. Lady Astrid would still be alive if I wasn't such a coward. Next, she watched her former self land in Asgard's throne room, scrambling to her feet as she rushed to re-enter the rift and save the sister that offered herself up for her. Or at the very least die alongside her. But sadly, it was too late. The rift closed and the last image she saw was Hela dealing the killing blow to the woman that saved her life before moving on to those who were too weak to defend themselves anymore. Aha! Brunhilde screamed in overwhelming rage and sadness. Brunhilde awoke with a start, her face uncomfortably smushed up against a curved wall of glass. As her eyes groggily opened, she saw the hills of trash through the glass below and instantly knew that she was in her ship's prison cell. I hate that dream. She recalled the same nightmare that always haunted her dreams. What a rusty city. A voice spoke from above. The tower is a bit gaudy for my taste as well. Looking upward, Brunhilde found a familiar red and blue clad man seated in the cockpit of her ship, gazing at the capital city of Sakaar from afar. It wasn't anything she hasn't seen a million times before. Just a city composed of salvaged items from all over the universe. Lying in the small glass holding cell of her own making, Brunhilde realized that all of her weaponry and gadgets were missing. Staying quiet, she tries to stand and work on her escape but. Tzzzzzz. Peter easily heard her movement and pressed a small controller in his hand, which activated the tiny metal disc attached to Brunhilde's neck. Instantly, she collapsed back onto the floor and began uncontrollably shaking in agony. Good morning. Peter greeted her cheerfully as she stopped shaking. Did you sleep well? Brunhilde ignored him and tried to stand for a second time, but of course, she was sent tumbling to the floor once again. I really like this device, Peter muttered as he watched her flail on the floor for a second time. I think I'll keep it. Brunhilde chose to remain silent and bide her time. So, what's your name and why did you attack us? Peter asks curiously, though he already knew. Was it just some drunken rage or what? Once again, she refused to speak. Whatever. Peter shrugged, as he already knew who she was and what happened to the Valkyrie. Brunhilde was one of the many Valkyries sent by Odin to drive Hela back into her prison. Although they succeeded in their mission, the Valkyrie were slaughtered, leaving only Brunhilde as the lone survivor. Being all that remained of the Asgardian warrior maidens, Brunhilde exiled herself to the planet Sakaar where she served the Grandmaster as one of his best acquisition specialists to this very day delivering him fighters and would be champions ever since. How can Odin waste such a cool group of soldiers like that? Peter thought with a shake of his head. 
If I were him, I would have just got off my throne and spanked Hela myself. Tony's group stood surrounded by Sakaran guards donned in their Iron Man armor, besides Gamora, of course, who had a pair of knives in hand, ready to fight without the protection of Tony's tech unlike Pepper and Rhodes. Not happening. Pepper refused the Grandmaster's request for a set of his own Iron Man armor. You heard the lady? Tony nods in agreement. What a shame. The Grandmaster mutters sadly as he walks back across the room to his throne. Capture them though prioritize the armor. Feel free to kill if you have to. Just make sure my armor isn't too damaged. Yes, sir. Topaz nods as she gestures to her men. Finally, the fun can begin. Tony mutters as the guards hop into action. Some shoot as they're armed with projectile weaponry, while others rush forward with spears and swords, ready to cut down the Grandmaster's enemies. Acting first, as she has the most battle experience, Gamora dashes to the oncoming guards with her knives at the ready. As two black and brown clad soldiers swung their swords in her direction, Gamora dropped to her knees, sliding under the blades as she stabbed her long knives into their stomachs. Ugh! Both guards grunted in pain as she ripped the knives from them and rolled backward, barely slipping away from a spear thrust by a third guard. And as she took some distance, Gamora climbed back up to her feet just in time to watch the two guards she stabbed fall to the ground and bleed out. Pepper watched in awe, wishing that she had the skills and fearlessness to pull off something like that. Her only saving grace was the armor that Tony gave her. It gives her power that she would never have otherwise and bolsters her courage in situations like this. Without it, she would be a shivering mess, weak and afraid. Seeing that Gamora beat them to the first kills, Tony and Rhodes jump into action as well. Activating their armor's thrusters, the two shoot off into the air and maneuver around the room, dodging Hale's blaster bolts in the process. Soon enough, the two refused to hold back anymore and started their offensive. Rhodes, being the soldier he is, preferred guns over most other weapons, so he immediately activated the turret in his suit. Instantly, Rhodes' armor morphed and a large turret appeared over his right shoulder. Opening fire. He called out in warning to Tony and the rest. Du -du 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 -du. Suddenly, a rain of sharp metal projectiles assaulted a group of Sakaran shooters, tearing through them one by one. And as Rhodes was demolishing the guards' backline, Tony rushes into the fray to assist Gamora, who was being swarmed by dozens of armed Sakarans. Watch your back! Tony exclaims as he fires a thruster from his palm. Boom! Just as Gamora was about to be stabbed in the back by a sneaky swordsman, Tony stepped in and launched the attacker back with a burst of bright blue energy. Gamora didn't have the time to thank him, as she slipped under a long spear before grasping its pole and yanking it toward her. The guard at the other end of the spear instantly came tumbling forward, which gave her the opportunity to slice his neck open. Keeping her hold on the spear, Gamora kicked the dying Sakaran away and used her free hand to throw it like a javelin. Exclamation point. Pepper's eyes go wide as the pointed end of the spear came hurtling her way. At first, she thought that Gamora was trying to kill her, but then she saw its trajectory from the HUD in her helmet. Soon enough, the spear flew over her shoulder and pierced the chest of an armed party-goer, who decided to join the fight in order to curry favor with the Grandmaster. After all, being on the good side of a dictator is in everyone's best interest. Especially when no one can leave due to the wormholes blocking the way. Seeing that she was the only one who hasn't joined the fight, Pepper hesitantly steps forward as a large crystal-like flower appears in front of her. Instantly, the flower lit up in a blue light before firing a single beam of energy across the room, ripping through four different guards who were unlucky enough to be lined up in a row. A slash N, collateral X4. Overkill insert Halo kill streak voice, seeing that his guards were being easily slaughtered, the Grandmaster grew antsy and turned to his trusted guard, Topaz. Summon my champion and a few contenders. This armor is stronger than I imagined. He whispered as he watched three of his men get decapitated by a beam of blue energy. Call the rest of the guards as well. We may need to buy some time. Yes, sir. Topaz nods as she relays the order to one of her subordinates, who rushes off to do as he's told. Landing the warsong near the Grandmaster's tower, Peter looks down at Brunhilda, who continued to silently glare at him from her glass prison below. Come on. Let's go. Peter says as he releases her from the cell, sending her falling to the ground outside. Exclamation point. Acting quickly, Brunhilde spun around Madeir and landed on her feet like a cat. Following her out, Peter and Jeannie watched as she tried to run away while clutching at the disc in her neck. You'd think she would be smarter about this. Peter muttered with a sigh as he hit the button in his hand for a third time that day. Tzzzzzzz. Just like the last two times, Brunhilde's entire body seized up as she collapsed to the ground, shaking like a leaf. I'm starting to feel bad at this point. Jeannie commented as he watched her flail around on the floor like a fish out of water. Really? I'm not. Peter shrugged uncaringly. After all, she would have done the same thing to them if she could. If Peter wasn't stronger than her, she would have captured him just like Thor and treated him in the same manner. He had no doubt about it. Karma can be a real bitch sometimes, Peter commented as he waited for Brunhilde to stand back up. As she climbed back to her feet and glared in Peter's direction, suddenly, a bright blue light filled the sky. 
Looking up, all three of them watched as a black and brown dressed Sakaran guard was shot out of the upper floor of the Grandmaster's palace by a familiar looking blue repulsor beam. Aya! The guard screamed as he fell hundreds of stories and smacked into the hard ground with a loud thud. Peter could hear every bone in his body break as he hit the floor, dying instantly. It looks like they're upstairs, Peter nods with a smirk. You were right, your friends are still alive. Jeannie seemed happy for Peter. I told you they would be. They wouldn't die in a lousy crash landing. Peter replies with a shrug. They're main characters after all. As they were talking, a platoon of similarly dressed guards rushed past them and disappeared into the Grandmaster's tower. They must be losing badly. Peter comments as he follows them inside. Let's go and watch the show. After taking a few steps, Peter stops to turn and look at Brunhilde, who didn't move a single inch to follow him. Are you going to come willingly? Peter says as he holds up the device in his hand. Or should I hit this button a few more times? Fine. She mutters in annoyance as she reluctantly follows after Peter and Jeannie. As they step inside the tower, Peter found that the whole bottom floor was empty. Is it usually this deserted? He turns to ask Brunhilde, who shook her head side to side. The Grandmaster must have called all of the guards up to help combat your friends, she reasoned. Makes sense, Peter muttered as Valkyrie's swords appeared in his outstretched hand. Here, take this in case you have to defend yourself, does defending myself count against you as well? She doesn't hesitate to take her sword back. After all, it's the sword she was given when she became a Valkyrie, Dragonfang. Although she may not consider herself a Valkyrie anymore, Dragonfang means more to her than any other possession. After all, her fallen sisters gifted it to her so she would treasure it forever. Hmm, no. Peter denies and ignores her bloodthirsty glare as he starts walking to the nearest elevator. Come on. As they all packed into the elevator, Brunhilde had a surmounting urge to stab Peter with the pointy end of her sword but knew it wouldn't be worth it. From how easily he handled her in their fight on top of the obedience disc in her neck, Brunhilde understood that she didn't have a chance. At least not yet. As Tony and his group finished off the last wave of guards, they turned to the Grandmaster, who was seated on his throne with Topaz at his side as usual. Congratulations, you passed the test. The Grandmaster smiles as he tries to buy time for his champion to arrive. You win an all-expense-paid trip to the Grand Arena. Aren't you lucky? Enough bullshit. We Dash Rhodes wasn't buying it, though he didn't get to finish speaking as the floor began to shake slightly. Dun 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 dun. Loud, heavy footsteps pounded on the floor, shaking the penthouse as they grew closer and closer. Why do we have to do this? I was just getting to the good part of the movie. A dumb-sounding voice carried into the room from the nearby hallway. Because helping the Grandmasters gets us one step closer to finding a way off of this garbage dump. Do you want to stay in this hellhole forever, you moron? A much more intellectual voice responds in irritation. No. The first voice answers in a sulking manner as the footsteps continue drawing closer. Soon enough, a large figure appears in the doorway, barely fitting inside the room. A large hulking brownish-orange skin monster with two faces could be seen. One face sat on top of the other. The top one was smaller than the bottom but held a much higher level of intelligence than the other. Meanwhile, the bottom face looked curious and almost idiotic, though he seemed to be much more at ease than his scowling counterpart. Insert picture of Bi Beast here, my champion. The Grandmaster exclaimed in relief as Bi Beast arrived. It's so good to see you again. You're just as handsome as I remember. Question mark. The upper face of Bi Beast looks past everyone in the room and locks eyes with the Grandmaster. Grandmaster, you called? Yes, I have some intruders that need dealing with. He waves toward the armored group of heroes. Be a deer and handle them for me, will you? Just try to keep that armor of theirs in good condition. It has piqued my interest? Eyeing the group of armor-clad individuals between them and the Grandmaster, Bi Beast's lower face grunted, ready for a fight. We can take them. Yeah, maybe, though his more calculative side was more cautious. But what's in it for us? The Grandmaster frowned upon hearing Bi Beast's question, though he quickly put on a smile to cover up his displeasure. I'll gift you a ship with a route off of the planet. Sound good? The Grandmaster instantly knew that his words were enticing for the giant beast, as both of its faces showed sparks of interest at the same exact time. But, he adds with a huge amount of emphasis. I'll only do so if you deliver me those suits of armor in operational condition. Fine, just sit back and enjoy the show. The smarter half of the towering beast agreed as he stomped toward Tony and his group. Hey, hang on a second. Rhodes exclaims as Bi Beast ran up and sent him flying across the room with a powerful punt. War Machine screamed as he flew across the penthouse and hit a wall, which instantly crumbled under the impact. Tony, what do we do? Pepper panicked as she's never dealt with monsters like this before. Relax, Peps. Just keep your distance and attack when there's an opening. Rhodey and I will keep him busy. Tony says as his thrusters fire him toward the hulking beast. Be but Rhodes. She stuttered, thinking that War Machine would be out of the fight or possibly even dead. Though, those thoughts were immediately halted as a black metallic figure shot out of the rubble and rushed to Tony's side. See? He's fine. Now, do as I said. Tony practically orders as Pepper gets some distance from the two-faced monster and prepares to fire her lasers at any moment. 
Meanwhile, Gamora has already disappeared from the battlefield. With one look at the Grandmaster's champion, she knew that she didn't stand a chance. If he were to catch her for even a single second, it would be game over. All that he would have to do is squeeze her like a tube of toothpaste, and her life would come to a horrific end. So, being smart about it, Gamora ran off and allowed her armored companions to handle the giant beast in the room. After all, they're the ones who were equipped to do so. You know he's lying, right? Tony spoke up as he shot forward and pounded a metal fist into By Beast's face, sending the giant stumbling backward a single step. Before their opponent could regain their footing, Rhodes soared forward like a missile and matched his friend's punch with one of his own. Instantly, By Beast fell onto the floor and looked up to see two armored figures above him. Hoping to sway the Hulk-like giant away from their enemy's corner, Tony and Rhodes paused the assault and waited for a moment. If there really was a way off this planet, then don't you think that the Grandmaster would have taken it by now? At best, he'll give you a ship and send you into a wormhole, where you'll be ripped to shreds and deposited halfway across the universe. Tony's words seemed to sway the giant, who stood to his feet and turned to his employer questioningly. Who says that I've never left the planet? The Grandmaster smirked comfortably from his throne. I just see no reason to stay gone for very long. After all, why leave when I'm the king of my own world here? Nobody could tell whether he was lying or not, though the calm smile on his face portrayed an air of confidence, which certainly helped convince By Beast at the very least. Ding. Just as the fighting was about to start again, the elevator chimed as its door swung open, revealing Peter, Jeannie, and Brunhilde inside. Yo! Peter called out with a wave as his eyes landed on By Beast. Huh? Who's this two-faced, ugly-looking guy? Both of the By Beast's faces frowned as Peter strolled out of the elevator, with Jeannie and Brunhilde following closely behind him. Scrapper 142. It's so good that you're here. The Grandmasters grew even more relieved at Brunhilde's arrival. I love it when you come to visit, 142. You always bring me the best stuff. Completely forgetting about the ongoing conflict in the room, the Grandmaster turns to his trusted guard, Topaz. Whenever we get to talking about Scrapper 142, what do I always say? She is the... And it starts with a B? He asks with a smile. Bitch. Topaz answers in distaste, as she hates Brunhilde. No, not bitch. Were you waiting just to call her that? The Grandmaster asks, enjoying the odd rivalry between Topaz and Brunhilde. Try again. Boozy whore. Topaz answers insultingly yet again. No, I'm so sorry, 142. He quickly said though he seemed more amused than apologetic. Best, I was thinking of the word best. Because I always say you're the best. She brought me many contenders for my beloved champion, you know? Yes, you say that every time she's here. Topaz sighed in annoyance as she glared in Brunhilde's direction. Right, well why don't you assist my champion against these intruders and I'll pay you afterward as always. The Grandmaster offered as his eyes roamed toward Peter and Jeannie. You can show me your latest merchandise then as well? Your name is Scrapper142? Peter asks teasingly, though he knew her real name all along. That had to be rough growing up. Brunhilde refused to correct the record as she gestured to the disc on her neck, surprising the Grandmaster. Huh? Wait. Are you the merchandise? The Grandmaster realized as Topaz smirked beside him. How much for her? I'll give you a million credits? She offered as the thought of enslaving her longtime rival and enemy brightened Topaz's day. Glaring in Topaz's direction, Brunhilde hoped Peter wouldn't accept, as she would soon rather die than live a life at the whims of that jealous rotund hag. Not for sale? Peter turns her down in an instant. Then why are you here? The Grandmasters asks. He's with us. Tony shouts as he points to the giant two-faced monster across from him. Are you going to help us with this or what? Nah, you got it. Peter shakes his head as he looks around the room for a moment. Hey, where's Gamora? You kidnapped her so she better be in one piece, or else I'll never hear the end of it. Quill would not be happy to learn that the love of his life was hurt or killed because one of Peter's friends decided to kidnap her for a space adventure. Ah, uh, Tony hummed as he looked around and didn't find her. I'm right here. Gamora revealed herself from behind a large pillar. You sure took your time finding me. Well, I was busy. Peter shrugs uncaringly. I poisoned your father by the way. He ran away like a little bitch too. Hearing his words, Gamora froze in place and just stared at Peter in shock. Why you what? Gamora asks incredulously. Of course, she would be happy if it was true, though it sounded so far-fetched that she couldn't bring herself to believe it was even possible. Oh, and Quill found out about his dad. Apparently, he's half-ancient alien or something. Peter explained vaguely. Right? Gamora found it all impossible to believe. Anyway, why don't you go and comfort him? He seemed down in the dumps the last time I saw him, so maybe a lover's reunion will cheer him up. Peter says as he waves his hand. We are not dash Gamora tried to deny it as a golden portal opened below her feet. Lovers. She yelled the last part in surprise as she fell through the portal and disappeared. Those who have never seen Peter's portals watched in shock as Gamora was sent away in an instant. What was that? The Grandmaster asks in interest. Nothing. Peter refused to answer as he turned to Brunhilde. Make yourself useful and kill the guy on the throne. And while you're doing that, Jeannie and I will check out the appetizers. 
Since this was originally a party with Sakar's upper echelon, the drinks and food were still out, so Peter walked over and started looking through them in interest. Oh, hors d'oeuvres. Jeannie exclaimed excitedly as he rushed to follow after Peter. Hey, what about us? Pepper yelled incredulously. We could use some help here. Meh, you guys can handle it. As Peter made himself a small plate of finger foods, he turned to see Brunhilde still standing in the same position as before. You should really attack already. Peter commented as he conjured a comfortable couch, which he and Jeannie sat on as they ate. If you impress me, I'll grant you a single favor. Of course, I won't go against my morals, but most things are possible as long as it's in my capabilities. As Peter was talking, By Beast and the rest started fighting once again, filling the whole room with noise. Brunhilde remained silent as she remembered how easily he handled her earlier. In her many years of life, Brunhilde has fought against all sorts of people, including the strongest of Valkyrie, soldiers, generals, and even Asgard's royal family. Never before has anyone, besides the Allfather and his psycho bitch of a daughter, been able to take her down so easily. Yes, she was drunk, but even then his display of strength was impressive. Especially after seeing the portal he opened. He can leave here whenever he wants and might be able to match Hela in strength. She thought as the small embers of vengeance in her soul began to burn brighter. Would you kill a god? She turns to Peter and asks. Although she was useless in the final battle of the Valkyrie, Brunhilde was easily one of, if not, the strongest out of all her sisters, and that was over a thousand years ago. She may spend her days drinking herself stupid, but that didn't mean her skills had lessened either, in fact, they've only grown throughout the years. Asgardians are all drunkards, so the disadvantage wasn't very prevalent. The fact that she could lose to someone so easily means only one thing. Peter's far more powerful than her and could very well be on the same level as beings like Odin and Hela, though she wasn't quite sure. After all, he was practically playing with her the whole time. Depends on the god, though something like that reaches a bit higher than your average favor, don't you think, da? Peter answered as he put the puzzle pieces together. I was thinking more along the lines of taking you off of this planet. Brunhilde wanted him to kill Hela for her, which wasn't impossible. What would you want in exchange? She asks as Topaz steps up in front of the Grandmaster. Neither of them knew what Scrapper 142 was getting at, but they knew that she would most likely be attacking them soon enough. What a pity. I always liked 142. The Grandmaster thought in disappointment. Hmm, work for me, and I'll do it. Peter answered after a moment of thought. She would make a good Avenger, and I have to get some Asgardian blood for my evolution anyway. In this way, Peter would be killing two birds with one stone. He planned to kill Hela either way, as she was a maniac who would cause trouble sooner or later, so using the opportunity to take some DNA for his new evolutionary power while simultaneously gaining a strong subordinate was just too enticing. After all, in the movies, Brunhilde became king of what remained of Asgard after Ragnarok, so she would be an invaluable member of the Avengers. Peter thought as he stuffed a tiny sandwich with purple meat into his mouth, using the reality stone to bypass his mask. Hmm, not bad. Brunhilde remained silent and indecisive. On one hand, she would gladly swear her eternal servitude to anyone who could kill Hela Odin's daughter for her. Of course, Peter didn't mean for her to swear herself to him in that manner, but as a former Valkyrie Brunhilde has always had this sort of mindset. Though he only meant to offer her a simple job. And on the other hand, just because Peter could beat her in a fight, whilst she was hammered to oblivion, didn't necessarily mean that he was capable enough to kill the woman she hated most in this universe. I need to make sure he can do it. Brunhilde thought as she looked over at Peter. I'll capture the Grandmaster for you, but that's it. You can decide what to do with him afterward. As for the favor, I'll save it for the time being. Without another word, Brunhilde remained still, waiting for Peter's confirmation before acting. This isn't exactly what I was hoping for but it's a good start, I guess. Peter thought as he sent her a nod. Deal? Bring it, bitch. Topaz expertly twirls her spear around her fingers before slamming the butt end of it against the floor, motioning for Brunhilde to come to her. With pleasure, you fat wh re. Brunhilde replied in kind as she drew her sword from its scabbard and rushed forward. As the two collided, Brunhilde's sword strike was blocked by the pole of Topaz's spear, leaving the two at a momentary standstill. Who are you calling fat, you drunk floozy? Topaz spat as she swiped the sword away before stabbing her spear forward. Who are you calling a floozy, you ugly whale? Brunhilde sidestepped the spear and kicked Topaz in the stomach, sending her sliding backward. Though Topaz didn't lose her balance and managed to stay on her feet the whole time. She didn't disagree with the drunk comment. Peter thought in amusement as he turned his attention to the other fight going on. He watched as Pepper kept her distance and fired the beam from a crystal flower-shaped object, which appeared from her suit, hovering in front of her. Her target, the giant two-faced orange-colored monster, was just barely held in place by both Tony and Rhodes, leaving him no room for escape. Arg! Bybeast roared in agony as a beam of blue-hued light shot into his leg, tearing and open a large hole and nearly severing his leg. Though that wasn't the shocking part. 
Through the hole in his leg, Peter and everyone else could see metal, wires, and a blue-colored coolant leaking out, rather than the flesh, meat, and blood of a living being. Exclamation point. Tony's eyes lit up upon seeing this. Are you a robot? Wait, no. You're an android, aren't you? This trip just kept getting better and better for him. First Tony found himself stranded in an engineer's paradise, where materials and an unknown alien technology literally rained down from the sky, and now this godly planet gave him yet another gift. A conscious and living robot, an android. You aren't controlled by anyone, right? Tony asked as he completely forgot that they were fighting only seconds ago. Are you an artificial intelligence? Tony, I don't think that now is the time for this. Rhodes muttered in exasperation. Though, Tony seemed to completely ignore him. Or maybe you were just a mindless robot that gained sentience over time. Who made you? Do you have your blueprints? Can you feel anything? He continued firing off questions with a look of wonder and curiosity. Tony couldn't hold himself back as Bybeast only became angrier and angrier with each word out of his opponent's mouth. Does he not like being questioned? Or is he sensitive about his origin? Peter wondered as he watched it all unfold. Standing back up while ignoring the hole in his leg, Bybeast snarled in Tony's direction before kicking off the ground and launching forward. Whoa! Tony shouted as he was tackled to the ground with Bybeast hovering over his body. I get it. You don't like questions? Shut up! The dumber face of Bybeast yells in anger as he punches down at Tony's glowing chest. Oh no, you don't. Rhodes exclaims as he Spartan kicks Bybeast in the head, which sends him rolling off of Tony. And just as Bybeast was about to pick himself up, a bright blue light shot toward his chest from across the room. Pepper no. We have to capture him alive. Tony yells, surprising his girlfriend enough to divert her attack, though it didn't go as Tony would have hoped. Ugh. Bybeast screamed one last time as the beam of energy pierced his chest before jerking sideways and slicing his neck. Plop. A slash N, does that sound work for a head falling to the floor? Although Pepper didn't mean to, her attack diverted and severed Bybeast's head from his shoulders. No. My beautiful research material. Tony cried out in horror as Bybeast collapsed to the floor alongside his severed head. How could you do this to him? He was innocent. He tried to kill us, Tony. Pepper replied in annoyance. That's not exactly what I would call innocent. He was innocent in my heart? Tony muttered in regret. Relax, you can still study its corpse. Peter joins the conversation while sipping on a blue-colored fizzy drink through his mask. Just be careful. Since it's an android, he's probably still alive and just needs a few repairs. Upon hearing Peter's words, Hope returned to Tony's entire being as he rushed over the downed android. Don't worry, I'll fix you up good as new. Tony muttered as he started collecting all of Bybeast's scattered pieces. My champion. The Grandmaster whispered mournfully. Looking between Topaz and 142, who were still fighting one another, the Grandmaster couldn't help but eye the nearest exit. I may need to get out of here. I may need to get out of here. The Grandmaster thought as he quickly and quietly left his throne, rushing to the nearest exit. Where are you going? Peter asked as the Grandmaster ran face first into a hard wall. Ugh. He grunted as he fell to the floor and craned his neck upward. The door that he was running to was now gone and replaced with a flat wall as if the exit was never there to begin with. The Grandmaster seemed confused for a moment before scrambling back to his feet and looking around the room. Each door leading into and out of the room had completely disappeared. Even the exit of the welcome ride was gone. What the dash the Grandmaster muttered as he turned and locked his eyes on Peter, who was lounging on the couch beside Jeannie. As the host of this party, it's very rude to leave before your guests? Peter comments as he waves his hand. Instantly, the Grandmaster fell through a portal and landed butt first back on his throne. How? He muttered in shock. The portal was one thing, as Peter already showed him that power when he sent Gamora away, but sealing up the entire room was another. The Grandmaster has been alive almost just as long as his brother, the Collector, yet he's never met anyone that could do such a thing. It's almost like he's bending reality? The Grandmaster thought to himself. Though that's just about as far as his thoughts on the situation went. Unlike his brother, the Grandmaster has lived the majority of his life trapped in Sakaar, leaving him clueless about the existence of the Infinity Stones. Which was good for Peter, as he didn't need anyone spilling that information just yet. Tony would whine about me not sharing my all-powerful toys with him if he found out. Peter thought as he rolled his eyes. Magic. Now sit tight and wait until the fight is over. We'll decide what to do with you then. Peter dragged his gaze away from the shocked dictator as Pepper and Rhodes walked over. Peter watched as their armor retracted back into the glowing arc reactors on their chests. Wow, looking good. He gave them an impressed whistle. I didn't know Tony was working on nanotechnology. You wouldn't, would you? Tony said accusingly as he strolled over, dragging Bybeast's headless body along with him. Because you're too busy having space adventures without me, Peter instantly let out a tired sigh. Yeah, he could have brought Tony along to meet the Guardians, but with Thanos and the Infinity Stones involved, he thought it best not to. I'm sorry. Peter apologized questioningly. On one hand, he felt bad for leaving out his friend, but on the other hand, it wasn't Peter's job to involve Tony in every facet of his chaotic life. You should be. 
Tony nods as his armor disappeared. So, what's with the girl? Are you thinking of cheating on Silk? You can tell me. I won't spill your dirty adulterous secrets. Brothers before hose dash whack. Pepper slapped Tony upside the head as he took a seat beside Peter, rubbing his sore spot and kicking his feet up on top of Bybeast's beasts headless body. No, I think she'll make a good Avenger. That's all? Peter shook his head as he turned his attention back to Topaz and Brunhilda. See? Not everyone's a sick pervert like you. Pepper glared at Tony as Topaz was thrown into a pillar, destroying it upon impact. Shouldn't we step in and stop them? Nah, they seem to have some sort of bad blood between them, so let them settle it on their own. Peter shrugged as Brunhilda knocked the spear out of her opponent's hands. Who's this? Tony asks as he turns to Genie, who was screaming at the fighters as if he was a coach in a UFC. Genie. He's a friend of mine. Peter gave Tony a made-up backstory as they watched the fight. At this point in the match, both sides have lost their weapons. Brunhilda managed to knock the spear from Topaz's hands, and immediately tossed her dragonfang aside, evening the odds once again. Based on the injuries to both sides, Brunhilda was winning by a landslide. Topaz was covered in bruises and a few cuts as she huffed and puffed for air, exhausted from the fight thus far. Meanwhile, Brunhild only had a few minor injuries and appeared raring to go. I guess that's the difference between an Asgardian physiology and the rest of the universe, Peter thought. He didn't know what species of alien Topaz was, but it certainly didn't stack up against an Asgardian. Especially now that Brunhilda has completely sobered up. She hasn't had a sip of alcohol since Peter captured her, and Asgardians have a much higher metabolism than most alien races, so she sobered up fairly quickly. Oh, that's gotta hurt? Genie winced as Brunhilda grabbed Topaz by the hair and slammed her head into the floor. I think that ends it. Peter muttered as Topaz remained unmoving on the cracked floor. Standing from his seat, Peter walked over to Brunhilda, who retrieved her sword after her victory. Will you finish her off? He asked. Of course, Peter doesn't enjoy killing, but he has zero empathy for the Grandmaster and anyone related to him. Some sort of evil villain gene must run in the family. He thought as both he and his brother turned out to be psychos in their own weird ways. One would do anything to grow his collection, which included slaves, while the other seemed to revel in forcing slaves to fight to the death while collecting champions to battle in his name. No, she's not worth the rust on my blade. Brunhilda replied as she sheathed Dragonfang and looked toward the Grandmaster. 142, come on. It's me. The man in question started to plead as he had no other way out. We go way back, don't we? You can't just serve me up to die, right? Brunhilda remained silent for a moment before turning back to Peter. He's all yours. I'll keep that favor for the time being. Her voice held no remorse for her former employer. Brunhilda spent many years on Sakaar and although she and the Grandmaster met many times for business, she never grew to like him very much. After all, it's hard to sympathize with a dictator who runs his nation through slavery. He didn't even know her real name. Sure. Peter shrugged as he turned to the Grandmaster, who sat speechless while tightly gripping the armrests of his throne. Wait. We can talk about this, can't we? I'm a lot more valuable alive, I assure you. How would you like to be the Grand Duke of Sakaar, huh? I can make that happen. He started rambling about everything he could give away in exchange for his life, nobility included. What's with this guy and the word Grand? Tony asks as he walks over. Grandmaster, Grand Arena, Grand Duke. I don't think he has a very good naming sense. Peter nodded in agreement. True, he's been calling me Scrapper 142 for almost a thousand years. Brunhilda added from the side. You're a thousand years old. Pepper exclaimed in shock. What's your skincare routine? Ignoring Tony's girlfriend, who rushed over to pester Brunhilda, Peter turned back to deal with the Grandmaster. Wait, he tried to enslave us so I'll do it. Tony says as a liquid metal pours over his arm and forms into a red and gold glove with a repulsive at the palm. Wait. We can talk about this. There's a lot you don't know about Dash the Grandmaster shouted as Tony's palm brightened. VSSS? Bang the thruster on Tony's palm charged up before firing off a thick pillar of blue light, which enveloped the entire throne. The attack was so powerful that it tore through the throne and melted a hole in the Florida ceiling windows behind it as well. Outside of the Grandmaster's palace, the whole city lit up, attracting everyone's attention as they wondered what the hell was going on. Damn. Peter uttered as the blue pillar of light disappeared, leaving behind nothing but a gaping hole, some ashes, and a few burnt pieces of the Grandmaster's yellow robe. That attack wasn't always that crazy. You really upgraded, huh? Well, I added some runes to reinforce the suit, so it could handle a higher output without melting. Tony explained as his armored glove morphs, revealing countless lines of tiny runes. Wow. Looks like I wasn't wrong when I said runes would be your greatest asset. Peter admired his friend's craftsmanship. So what now? Rhodes walked up and asked. Should we just leave? No. Tony refused instantly. Question mark. Everyone, including Peter, looked at Tony in confusion. We can't leave. Tony states with a determined look in his eyes. This place is a gold mine. There's enough tech and materials on this rock to take over the universe. Not that I want to do that, but I refuse to leave any of it behind. And how do you plan to do that? Peter asked incredulously. 
Although he saw the appeal, the work to accomplish what Tony wants is astronomical. Well, first we need a new king. First, we need a new king, Tony said matter-of-factly. And as soon as those words left his mouth everyone turned to look toward Peter for some odd reason. No, not happening. He instantly denied. What? You like this kind of stuff, don't you? Tony whined as he didn't want to take on the responsibility, only rake in all of the rewards. I mean, you practically run the Avengers. Why not become a king while you're at it? Peter looked at his friend as if he were mentally deficient. A slash N, you can't say the R word anymore. God I miss that word. Because I already have a million other responsibilities. As you said, I run the Avengers, and that's a full-time job. Not to mention my hero work, my girlfriend, my kid, and now I have a new group of space heroes to look after. I seriously don't have the time for this, even if I do like the idea of becoming king of an entire planet. Peter ended his rant with an exasperated sigh. Spider-Man has a child? Rhodes muttered in disbelief. Yes, and I would like to keep what little time I have to spend with her, Peter adds as Tony starts to lose hope in his plan. But, this planet is heaven. Tony said as he looked out of the window toward the never-ending hills of resources in the distance. It's a never-ending tech mine. We can't just let it go. The room went silent as everyone could feel how important this was to Tony. There are only a few things in this world that could truly move Iron Man's heart, and this planet seemed to be one of them. Well, as I see it, we have three options, Peter says after a moment of thought. Question mark. Everyone turned to him, especially Tony who looked very eager to hear what his friend had to say. First, we could allow the people to vote on their next ruler and cultivate a good relationship with that person. Once there's some trust between us, we can trade for the junk you want. Peter says, though, Tony didn't seem that enthusiastic about it. I feel like that would take forever. Tony complained as he wanted to start carting off his tech today. Second, we could pick someone from the Avengers to run the place under the organization's banner, though we would be losing the exclusive rights to your precious hills of space trash. Peter offers another option. Hey, it's not trash. Tony counters as he thinks it over. Would I still get first picks for the tech brought in? I don't know. We would have to call a council meeting to decide that, though I can tell you now that Fury and Eric are greedy bastards. They won't let you hoard all of the good stuff to yourself. Peter shrugs. What's the last one? Tony asks, hoping it's better than the first two options. Third, we could portal every Sakaran off of the planet. I'd have to find a vacant world that's habitable for them to settle on, but that shouldn't be too hard. The universe is ever expanding, after all, Peter says, though once again Tony had something to say. Then who would collect all of the technology for us? We still need a civilian workforce to collect everything. Tony sighs in exasperation. Of course, he didn't plan to treat the Sakarans like slaves. They would get a very nice payment for their work, courtesy of the dearly departed Grandmaster. After all, he has to have a hefty sum of credits lying around from the many millennia of running this place. We could always portal a huge chunk of space junk to Earth and sort it there, or you could make some worker robots to do it here, and I could pick up each batch once a month. Peter said, soothing Tony's worries in an instant. Fine, let's find a planet and kick everyone out. Tony was finally on board. I think that you guys are forgetting something important. Brunhilde spoke for the first time in a while. What? Tony asked with a frown. One, what if people don't want to leave, and two, random people appear through the wormholes all the time. You would always have new arrivals to deal with. She explained. I'm of the understanding that this place is a shithole for most people. The only city is built with rusted scrap, while the rest of the planet is literally just trash. There's not even any flora or fauna, let alone a way to grow any plants on a large enough scale to feed everyone, which means hurting animals is probably impossible as well. And that's if you're lucky enough for two opposite gendered animals of the same species to fall out of a wormhole and live. I mean, am I wrong? Peter asks with a raised brow under his mask. True, but many of the citizens here are, for lack of a better phrase, dumb freaking morons. They may decide that they like it here and just stay. In fact, I'm sure a small amount of them definitely will. Brunhilde nods to herself. You have to remember that there are no schools here. Most Sakarans aren't the brightest of minds, then we'll just have to force them out, I guess. If they're too stupid to see the opportunity we're giving them, then they don't deserve the option to choose for themselves, Peter says uncaringly. As for the new arrivals, we can always check once a month and portal them to the new Sakar, and they can try to return to their home worlds from there. I like it. Tony smirked as he started thinking of designs for the labor robots, who would parse through all of the trash for them. We should find a planet as quickly as possible. And by we, I mean you, Tony gestured to Peter. Sure, but I expect a fair split of the tech from this since I'm helping. Peter says as he receives a nod from Tony. We can share everything like we always do. Tony shrugs as Peter opens a portal and steps through. I'll be back in a bit, he says with a wave as the portal snaps shut. Tony, are you actually about to evict an entire civilization just so you can take their resources? Pepper asked incredulously. This is giving heavy colonizer vibes. Of course, it wasn't that bad, as the Sakarans would be getting a habitable planet out of the deal. A world for a world sounded pretty fair after all.
Tony completely ignored his girlfriend as he stood by the window, eyeing the world below with a greedy spark in his eyes. Using the star chart in one of his many alien warships, Peter was able to compile a list of planets that could work for the Sakaran migration. Checking them personally one by one, Peter found one planet that fit the description of a habitable and not yet colonized world. L-221, a green planet, similar to the Earth, with a blue ocean covering a little over 80% of its globe, which is about 10% more than the Earth, though that wasn't exactly a problem per SE. It was a bit smaller than the Earth as well, but Salker is only made up of one capital city, so they shouldn't have any problems with space for a long time. This should do. Peter muttered as he watched a few alien-looking animals run away, as they weren't used to seeing things like him. They better get used to it quickly because you're about to see a lot more soon enough. After testing the planet's air, soil, and water quality, among a slew of other crucial tests, Peter portaled back to the Grandmaster's palace and found Tony standing at the edge of the broken window with a microphone in hand. People of Sakar, We have slain the man who turned you all into slaves. The Grandmaster is dead. Tony shouted onto the microphone, like a boxing match announcer. Looking out of the window, Peter could see a sea of people packed below the palace, as if the Pope was giving a speech at the Vatican. Not only have we killed your oppressor, but we've also found a way for everyone to escape this wasteland of a planet. Tony says, immediately piquing the interest of the crowd. Although they found this whole situation hard to believe, many Sakarans have always wished to escape. The lack of food, water, safety, and almost every other basic necessity has made living in Sakara living hell for the large majority of them. We give you all one week to peacefully pack your belongings and prepare to set off. A friend of mine has already found a much more habitable planet for everyone to migrate to. Tony explained as the crowd stood in disbelief. Now things were starting to sound a bit too good to be true. Seeing the looks of those in the crowd with his enhanced eyesight, Peter waved his hand and opened a giant portal in the sky. Looking upward, everyone caught sight of a green and blue planet, filled with flora and fauna as well as all sorts of animals. Looking back, Tony was surprised to find Peter standing there but gave him a thankful smirk for his assistance. See for yourselves. This is your new planet as well as our exit. Hurry home and pack your things. The new Sakaar is waiting for you. One week later. After sending everyone from Sakaar off the planet, including the stragglers who weren't cooperating and decided that they wanted to stay. Peter stood in front of Brunhilde outside the Grandmaster's palace. Tony returned to Earth with Pepper and Rhodes already, as he needed to start making the robots that would sort the trash on their new planet. So, any ideas for your favor, or should I just send you to the new Sakaar with the rest of them? Peter asked, as she was the only one left on the planet besides him. Brunhilde remained silent for a moment, eyeing Peter up and down before drawing her sword. Although Peter removed the disc from her neck a week ago and set her free, she hadn't drunk a single drop of alcohol ever since then, leaving her completely sober for the longest time in many many years. Fight me, she declared, hoping to truly ascertain whether he is strong enough to face Hela Odin's daughter. Of course, he already beat her rather easily the last time they fought, but she happened to be very drunk at that time. And what do I get if I win? Peter asks as his posture remained casual compared to Brunhilde, who gripped her sword firmly in front of her body. Because we've already been through this before, Brunhilde stares Peter in the eyes for a few seconds before opening her mouth. As long as you beat me and agree to kill a special someone, I'll work for you as you asked. Her words certainly piqued Peter's interest. Deal, though just to clarify who do you want dead so badly? He asked. Although Peter wanted nothing more than to return to Earth and experiment with the wishes that he received, he is rather adamant about recruiting the only living Valkyrie to his organization, so he could spare some time for this. Hela Odin's daughter. Brunhilde spat as if the name itself brought her pain to utter. Of course, he knew the answer to his question already, but he needed her to say it for both clarification and so he wouldn't look suspicious. After all, nobody would agree to kill someone without knowing who they are first. Huh? I didn't know Thor had a sister. Peter mutters like the A-list actor that he could have been. Thor? Is that one of Odin's latest spawns? She asks in similar distaste. After all, the former Valkyrie has grown a very well-earned hatred of the Asgardian royal family over the years. Although Odin didn't technically do anything to slight her, he took a small amount of the blame for what happened to the Valkyrie, as he was the one who ordered the attack in the first place. As for Hela, the hatred was more than well deserved. Everyone else was just unlucky enough to be related to the two. Yes, Thor is the new king of Asgard. He took over after Dash Peter tried to explain though his opponent didn't give him the chance. Enough talk. Brunhilde kicked off of the ground and appeared before Peter in an instant. With a swipe of her sword, she aimed at Peter's neck, hoping to sever his head as Pepper did to buy Beast only days ago. How rude. Peter muttered as he leaned backward, narrowly avoiding the attack by a few centimeters. Ha! Huh. Brunhilde shouted as she pushed forward and enacted another flurry of sword swipes. Shoulders, hands, stomach, legs, feet, and even his groin were targeted, though Peter simply moved out of the way of each attack, as if he could see them before they arrived. Hey! Watch where you're aiming! Peter yelled as he sidestepped yet another hack at his family jewels. 
If you slice off my golden finger, my girlfriend will be pissed, then fight back, coward. She exclaims as she instantly went for his groin for the third time. This girl is ruthless. Peter thought as he reached down and caught Dragonfang with two fingers. No more swords for you. You can't be trusted. While Brunhilde was shocked by Peter's ability to so easily catch her sword by the blade, he sent an unsuspecting kick to her stomach. Pow instantly, Brunhilde folded like a lawn chair as she was launched backward, leaving her sword behind in the process. Bang! She flew back and crashed into one of the many vacant buildings in the deserted city, breaking the rusted metal wall and disappearing inside. You know, this isn't a bad sword. Peter muttered as he flipped the sword and caught it by the handle. I've been meaning to find a sword like this for my collection. I have a cool hammer from Ronan and a spear from Corvus Glaive, but I haven't found anything else worth taking yet. I don't know or care who those people are, but my sword will never belong to anyone else but me. Brunhilde launches out of the building with an angry look on her face. Like a missile, she shot over and threw a combination of punches and kicks, which all missed the mark, before swiftly reaching to snatch her sword back. Nope. Peter muttered as Dragonfang disappeared out of thin air just as she was about to lay her hands on it. You have to ask nicely if you want it. Slap. Peter decided to start the attack for real this time as he used his now empty sword hand to backhand Brunhilde across the face. Of course, it wasn't just a normal slap. He put in enough power to kill most beings in the universe, though thankfully, Asgardians are a rather sturdy race compared to most. As the slap landed, Brunhilde was sent skidding across the empty street like a rag doll. Though luckily or unluckily, she didn't hit anything this time and continued until her body ran out of momentum and slowed to stop on its own. Hmm, did I hit her a little too hard? Peter asked himself as he watched her lay in the middle of the road, unmoving. Before Peter could get too worried, Brunhilde twitched a bit before slowly climbing back up to her feet. As she looked toward him, Peter could see a big red handprint across her left cheek, as well as a slow stream of blood cascading down her nose. Limping over, Peter expected her to start the attack once again, though that didn't happen. As soon as she was about a meter or two away, Brunhilde dropped to a single knee and looked up at Peter with eyes glimmering in determination. I, Brunhilde Alf daughter, sister of the Valkyrie, swear to you that from this moment onward I will be faithful to you with regard to your life, your possessions, and those you care for, in good faith and without deception. I will serve you loyally and without question, fulfilling every order as they're given. I will bring you glory in battle and honor in victory. And lastly, I will be devoted in my duties. I promise you this on my life. May the old gods strike me down otherwise. Rumble. As she spoke those last words, dark clouds filled the sky and a stream of branching lightning cracked menacingly. Peter looked on in shock, as he never expected this to happen. Ah, uh, is that a coincidence or? Throughout his entire time in this universe, Peter has never run into proof of any sort that pointed to the existence of gods. Except for Stan Lee, of course. Though, he gave off the feeling that he was something far more powerful than a god. Even the Asgardians, who egotistically thought themselves to be gods, were only very powerful and long-lived aliens. Yet Brunhilde just swore an oath to him on the old gods and there was even a confirming response. No, the old gods accepted my oath. Brunhilde said as if the storm clouds and lightning, which have already disappeared, were just a normal occurrence. Okay, Peter muttered as he looked down at her. You do know that when I said work for me, I meant like a normal sort of employment, right? Kind of like how you worked for the Grandmaster, but with a monthly paycheck and a bit more respect. Brunhilde peered up at Peter in disbelief. You couldn't have specified that before I swore an oath to the gods? How the hell was I supposed to know you would do that? Peter replied with just as much disbelief. There were many things that Brunhilde wished to say right now, though they may invoke her oath, so she decided to simply keep them to herself as she glared at her new sovereign. May I rise, my lord? Uh, yeah. Peter nodded unsurely as Brunhilde stood back up and held out her hand. What? My sword? She said plainly. Fine. Peter muttered reluctantly as Dragonfang appeared in his hand. But you have to stop with the stink eye. It's not my fault that you misinterpreted my words. Brunhilde sighed as she took her sword back and sheathed it on her hip. She knew he was right but refused to admit it to herself. Can't you just take back the oath? Peter asked, as he never wanted this in the first place. I'd much rather keep far away from any sort of gods. No, the old gods aren't so forgiving. She answers with a shake of her head, resigned to her new duties. Right, so who are these old gods? Right, so who are these old gods? Peter asked, as he now had to worry about whoever these gods were. Not much is known about the old gods, other than that they visited Asgard once when we were nothing but warring tribes on a planet similar to yours. Before the Asgard you know today was even a thought, they appeared. Brunhilde explained what she knew. What did they want? Peter asked curiously. You'd have to ask Odin or Thor? Brunhilde shrugged unknowingly. Only the royal family was allowed to know. Great. Peter muttered as he waved his hand and opened a portal. Come on. Let's go. Arriving in his office at the Avengers Tower followed by his new dutiful servant, Peter immediately collapsed into his office chair and let out a sigh. Jarvis, Peter called out as Brunhilde beelined straight toward the minibar, where she immediately poured herself a drink. 
I guess she's back to drinking now. Yes, sir. Jarvis replied, dutiful as always. I need you to make my new friend here a United States citizen. Hack into whatever you need to. Just make sure you aren't caught. I do it myself, but I have some stuff to do after this. Peter orders. Yes, sir. I'll have it done by the end of the day. Jarvis replied as he got to work. So, what are we doing after this? Brunhilde asks as she took a seat on the couch along the wall with her drink in hand. I'm going to work on a personal project, but you, on the other hand, will be familiarizing yourself with the city and updating your wardrobe, Peter says as he opens his desk drawer and pulls out a credit card. Here, tossing the card over, Brunhilde caught it with a single hand and looked it over curiously. What is this? She asked. That is my Avengers company card. You can use it to buy clothes and other necessities. Just don't go over the $100,000 limit, Peter says as he whips out his phone and makes a call. What's up, boss? After waiting a few seconds, a familiar female voice answered the phone. Jessica, are you working right now? Peter asks. Yeah, why? She answers as the sound of pages flipping could be heard in the background. Is it Spider-Man? Loki asked loud enough to be picked up by her phone. I need you to come to my office. I have a special job for you. Peter says cryptically. Really? Jessica sounded excited at the prospect of leaving her office for once. I'll be there in a minute. Good. Peter says as he looks over to Brunhilde, remembering her obvious dislike for the Asgardian royal family. Leave Loki behind this time. After all, Loki would no doubt do something to piss Brunhilde off even if he doesn't reveal his identity. Ah? Okay. She says as Peter hung up the phone and looked toward Brunhilde. An employee of mine is on the way, Peter explains as he writes a quick note and leaves it on the desk. Show them that note, and they'll assist you. Without another word, Peter opened a portal, leaving his new sworn protector behind. Wait a minute dash she tried to stop him. See ya. Peter waved as the portal snapped shut. Boss? I'm here. A knock could be heard at the door. What are you waiting for? Another voice asked in annoyance. Just open it already. As the door swung open, Jessica walked in with an annoyed look on her face, as a smirking Loki followed behind her. Sorry, boss. Loki wouldn't listen. Jessica spoke as she found Brunhilde sitting alone on the couch without her boss in sight. Ah? Uh, hello? Without saying a word, Brunhilde pointed to the note on the desk. Quickly reading it over, Jessica's former excitement was snuffed out, like a candle on the wind. After all, she thought that Peter was calling her for a mission, not this. So, I guess we'll be your tour guides? Jessica said in reluctance. Tour guides? Loki didn't sound happy at all. I am Loki Odinson, a prince of Asgard. I am nobody's guiding servant. Instantly, Brunhilde rose to her feet and reached for her sword as she glared in Loki's direction. Leave Loki behind this time. Peter's words played out in Brunhilde's head. Well, you're my servant now. She says matter-of-factly as she pulls Dragonfang from its sheath. Do you have a problem with that? Peter tried to keep them separated, though that didn't seem to work, so she'll just have to make the best out of this situation. And what would be better than beating the shit out of an Odinson? Maybe a certain Odin's daughter, but her time will come soon enough. Whoa, let's all just calm down. Jessica jumps to step between the two. Though, she couldn't block Loki from seeing the sword in Brunhilde's grasp. Dragonfang isn't a one-of-a-kind sword by any means. No, it was the standard issue blade of the Valkyrie, but what really solidified Loki's assumption was the markings on her wrist. A slash N, Google Marvel Valkyrie logo. I don't know how to explain it. Each Valkyrie is given that marking on the day of their induction to the Sisterhood. You're a Valkyrie. I thought the Valkyrie all died gruesome deaths. Loki couldn't keep his venomous mouth shut if his life depended on it. Brunhilde pounced forward, though Jessica ended up being stronger than she thought and easily held her back. Choose your next words wisely, the Valkyrie looked ready to kill him. I'm terribly sorry. It must be a very painful memory. Loki's expression didn't match his words as he spoke with a provoking smirk on his smug face. Loki stop. Jessica shouted as it became harder and harder to hold their boss's guest back. You must be a traitor or a coward because the Valkyrie are sworn to protect the throne, yet here you are with your blade drawn on a prince of Asgard. Loki continued, hoping to use this opportunity to acquire an elite Valkyrie guard. Though things don't exactly go his way. Ugh. Jessica was instantly thrown across the room. As Jessica crashed into the door, breaking it in half as she flew out into the hallway, Brunhilde matched toward Loki and jammed the blunt end of her sword handle into his stomach. Arg! Loki coughed up a mouthful of bile as he collapsed onto the floor, finding a sharp blade resting at his neck as he looked up. Has Asgard grown weaker in my absence? Brunhilde was surprised by how powerless he was. Though she didn't care enough to comment on it. Listen closely, your highness, Brunhilde says with a heavy dose of distasteful sarcasm. This is not Asgard and I am not a Valkyrie anymore. I've already sworn myself to your boss, so keep your mouth shut or I'll cut out your tongue and beat you to death with it. While Brunhilde and Loki were settling their differences, Peter stepped into his penthouse, which was still filled with Lily's old equipment. So, are you finally going to test out your evolution? Genie appeared next to him and asked excitedly. Yeah, though I'm not sure if I should start small or not. 
Peter muttered as he paced back and forth in front of the floor-to-ceiling windows, which showed a perfect view of the New York City skyline. In his possession, Peter has a very large amount of celestial blood from nowhere. I say go big or go home, kid, Jeannie says dramatically as always. He didn't want to be swayed, but Peter couldn't help but want to agree. After all, with his unlimited potential and perfect evolution combined, the likelihood of any complications happening was extremely low. After a moment of silent contemplation, in which Jeannie started playing game show timer music out of boredom, Peter finally came to a decision. Let's start small, Peter uttered cautiously. He can't allow Jeannie to goad him into doing something dangerous. Celestials are literal gods, after all. Peter needed to test out his power at least once before going straight into a godly evolution. What are you going to do then? Jeannie asks in disappointment. Waving his hand, Peter opened a portal and reached his hand through. Before Jeannie's curious eyes, Peter pulled out a case full of blood-filled vials. Each of them was labeled with different names, though they were all familiar. Magneto, Professor X, Storm, Black Panther, there were ten vials in total, and this wasn't all that he collected either. Peter has made sure to collect blood from every enhanced individual that he has ever met. Though it was harder when it came to people like the Black Panther, as he had to sneak into Wakanda to take his blood. Meanwhile, it's the protocol for each member of the Avengers to hand over a blood sample for medical reasons, of course. Though Peter made sure to switch his blood sample with a fake, as he didn't need a clone of himself running around, which was likely to happen in a comic book setting. Which one are you going to choose? Jeannie asks excitedly. I vote for Nightcrawler. He has a good teleportation ability, are you sure that you aren't being biased because he matches your skin color? Peter asked jokingly. Jeannie looked away and started whistling innocently. Ignoring his blue companion's theatrics, Peter reached into the case and pulled out a vial. Wolverine, huh? Why him? Jeannie asks. Because his healing factor will come in handy, Peter says as he loads the blood up into a syringe. Do you know if it's going to hurt? No idea. Jeannie shrugs. Great, you're about as useful as ever. Peter muttered as he stabbed the needle into his arm like a heroin junkie and pressed down in the plunger. Instantly, the blood shot into his body. Pulling out the empty syringe and setting it aside, Peter waited patiently for something to happen. The feeling of his body tingling was still the same even after a minute had passed. Hey, are you sure that you granted my wish? Because Dash Peter was about to complain before he felt the tingling feeling increase drastically. You okay, kid? Jeannie asked worriedly as Peter looked down to see the small needle hole in his arm heal itself shut. I think it's working. Peter muttered as the tingling he felt changed into excruciating pain as if he were being stabbed by a million knives in every part of his body at once. Aag. Before Peter's screams could fill the penthouse for too long, he collapsed to the floor and passed out cold. His brain couldn't register the amount of pain that was coursing through his body, so it temporarily shut itself down so that Peter could retain his sanity. Though that didn't mean his body was finished with its evolution. No, Peter continued to twitch and writhe on the floor whilst in his sleep. Meanwhile, Jeannie watched with a worried look on his face. Even after Peter fell to the floor unconscious, he seemed to worry about his master's well-being. When Jeannie was summoned by Peter, he thought this would be yet another greedy, self-centered master. They would use him for their own personal gains before he was sealed back into the lamp and forced to await yet another undetermined amount of time before the next greedy summoner came along. Maybe he would be able to twist their wishes out of spite, though that was the only real sliver of freedom he had in his life. His only real enjoyment during every summoning was the quick update on the outside world that he would receive while reading his master's mind. A close second to that was the nice long stretch he would always get after exiting his cramped lamp. Luckily, his latest master wasn't so bad. In fact, Genie grew to enjoy his company more as time went by. His mind was filled with all sorts of useful and entertaining information, and he wasn't a complete asshole like most masters. Yeah, Peter was greedy, but his greed didn't extend too far past the regular amount that any living being should have. He won't even use his last wish. Genie thought incredulously. After all, from Peter's perspective, the universe was filled with villains who could accomplish a lot with the help of a few free wishes, leaving him no choice but to hang on to the lamp. The second Genie was summoned, he was able to learn everything about Peter, and truthfully, he found his master to be one of the very few summoners who actually deserved his assistance. Peter was a real hero that fought to keep his city, planet, and universe safe from those with twisted minds and self-centered agendas. And although he knew everything, thankfully for his master's sake, Genie wasn't able to access the information pertaining to Peter's past life. A slash N, he doesn't know that Peter transmigrated and he will never know. No one will. With a snap of his fingers, Genie summoned a comfortable bed underneath his newest master and friend. You'll be alright, kid, he muttered hopefully, as even he wasn't sure how this would unfold. Nearly twelve hours later, Peter remained unconscious in his penthouse, though with every passing hour the pain that racked his body seemed to slowly fade away. By this point, Peter was sleeping comfortably on the bed without a single sign of pain or discomfort, which certainly eased his blue companion's nerves. When will he wake up? Genie wondered. Just as that question crossed his mind, Peter began to stir in his sleep once again. 
At first, Jeannie thought that he was in pain again, though he threw that thought away as Peter's eyes peered open and looked around the room in confusion. Sigh, you're finally awake. Jeannie muttered as he morphed into an apron-wearing mother with curlers in her hair and a rolling pin held menacingly in hand. Do you know how worried I was? Lower the volume a little, will you? Peter said groggily as he covered his sensitive ears. Although he was both dazed from his impromptu nap and sore from the evolution, Peter couldn't help but feel the slight enhancement to his body. Wolverine's superhumanly acute senses are due to his very animalistic metahuman mutation. His most improved senses are hearing, sight, and smell, which are currently Peter's main three problems at the moment. Superhuman hearing, Wolverine is capable of hearing sounds from a far greater distance than any human, though he isn't quite on the level of people like Daredevil. Superhuman sight, Wolverine's sight is improved, allowing him to see further than a normal human. Superhuman smell, Wolverine's sense of smell is magnified, similar to an animal, which allows him to recognize and track objects and people just by smell alone. These three senses were currently out of control, leaving Peter with blurry eyes, throbbing ears, and an overloaded nose. I can smell every dumpster and toilet within a mile of here, he thought in disgust. Peter was already enhanced far past Wolverine's capabilities, so the added enhancement from the successful evolution seemed to throw his powers out of control for the time being. Are you okay? Jeannie asked in a much lower tone this time around. Yes, I just need some time to get my senses under control, Peter explained as he took a deep calming breath. Climbing out of bed, Peter quickly started testing his powers, as he wanted nothing more than to get himself back under control. Other than the already mentioned power-ups, Peter also seemed to receive every other enhancement that Wolverine had. Superhuman touch, Wolverine's sense of touch gives him greater sensitivity to air direction and temperature differentials in his environment. Superhuman strength, Wolverine's strength is increased slightly by his animalistic nature. Superhuman speed, Wolverine can move at low-level superhuman speeds. He can just barely attack faster than the normal human I can follow. Superhuman stamina, Wolverine's healing factor grants him superhuman stamina and is partially immune to fatigue toxins generated by physical exertion, giving him greater endurance than normal humans. Damn, I don't feel tired at all. Peter muttered in shock. Although it was hard for him to get to the point of fatigue before, it was still a fairly regular occurrence during Peter's training sessions. Now, on the other hand, Peter hasn't felt anything and he has been testing his power under extreme conditions for almost 5 hours, non-stop. Would this enhance my bedroom game as well? Peter wondered as a perverted smirk appeared on his lips. MJ would be in for a rude awaking. You! Stop thinking that. Jeannie looked like he was about to puke at any moment. Then stay out of my head, you nosy bastard. Peter rolled his eyes. Continuing on. Superhuman durability. Wolverine has superhuman durability due to a combination of his healing factor and adamantium skeleton, though Peter doesn't have a metal bone infusion, yet. Enhanced reflexes and agility. Wolverine's reflexes and agility are enhanced beyond the capabilities of the normal human body. That's it for the boring stuff? Peter sighed. Once Peter got all of those minor enhancements under control and out of the way, it was finally time to get to the good part. Conjuring a small razor-sharp scalpel, Peter rested the tip against his open palm and swiped it across. He watched as his skin tore open, but before more than a drop or two of blood could leak out, the cut on his palm zipped itself shut in a matter of seconds. Cool. Peter muttered as he eyed his scarless hand in awe. Regenerative healing factor. Wolverine's body naturally regenerates most, if not all, damaged or destroyed tissues and organs at a rate that exceeds that of any normal human. The rate of regeneration is proportional to the damage caused. This process is automatic, and Peter seems to have no control over it. His healing factor, however, does not seem to stop Peter from feeling the pain of his wounds nor the pain of his body regenerating itself. Though it's more of an itchy feeling than anything else. After a few more cuts along his body, where he did his best to ignore the pain, Peter brought out some powerful Asgardian alcohol and started chugging it down. A slash N, insert Badlands Chugs gifts here, for scientific reasons of course. Contaminant immunity, Wolverine's natural healing also affords him virtual immunity to poisons, viruses, diseases, and most drugs. For example, it is extremely difficult for him to become intoxicated by alcohol. I guess I'm forever sober now. Peter concluded as he drank three times the amount that used to get him wasted without feeling a single buzz. Next, Peter took a small sample of flesh from his body and stuck it under a nearby microscope. Decelerated aging. In addition, Wolverine's healing factor provides him with an extended lifespan by slowing the effects of the aging process. Wolverine was born sometime during the late 18th century. Although he is almost 200 years old, Wolverine retains the health, appearance, and physical vitality of a man in the physical prime of his life. This will come in handy since I haven't used the dragon bone elixir on myself yet. Peter muttered in appreciation. As he said this, Peter made a mental note to task the hand with locating and excavating New York's buried dragon bones. I technically don't need the elixir right now, but it may come in handy later on, he thought to himself. After testing his cells and witnessing just how slowly they were aging, Peter sat back in his chair and looked down at his knuckles. 
Do I have it? He wondered, hopefully. Retractable bone claws. Wolverine's skeleton includes six retractable foot-long bone claws, three in each arm, that are housed beneath the skin and muscle of his forearms. Wolverine could, at will, release these slightly curved claws through his skin between the knuckles on each hand. Come on. Peter goaded himself on as he tried to will his claws to appear. Suddenly, three long claws shot out of each fist, though he wasn't fully prepared. Shit. Peter shouted in pain as his left hand's claws embedded into his leg, while his other set pierced the table in front of him. The bone claws are naturally sharp and tougher than normal human bone. Even without being infused with adamantium, they are dangerous weapons that can penetrate most flesh and many natural materials. I should figure out how to infuse my bones with metal, like Wolverine. Peter thought to himself, though, he would have to be careful. Didn't he get poisoned from the adamantium later in his life? Pushing these thoughts back into his mind for future study, Peter could only think of one more power to test. Animal empathy. Wolverine has been seen to be able to understand the emotions of animals around him and communicate with them on a very basic level, showing them his intention so he would not be perceived as a threat to them. Should I visit the zoo? Although animal empathy isn't very helpful, Peter found the possibility of communicating with beasts to be fairly appealing. Even if it's only at the basic level of understanding each other's intentions and emotions, it's still a pretty interesting ability. Are you going to get a pet? Genie asked as he followed Peter into the closed Central Park Zoo, dressed as Crocodile Dundee. Due to how late it was, the zoo was closed hours ago, leaving only a few security guards around in order to keep away any would-be troublemakers. Maybe, Peter answered with a shrug as he and his blue companion walked right past the oblivious police academy dropouts. Invisibility is such a useful spell. Touring the zoo, Peter was surprised to feel the many ranges of emotions from each animal habitat they passed. Dude, I never knew monkeys were this horny. Peter muttered in shock. You think monkeys are bad? Wait until you meet a few rabbits. Genie commented with a disgusted look on his face. They may be cute, but all those things think about is sex. This animal empathy might have been a curse. Peter concluded as they arrived at the lion enclosure. Starring in, Peter watched as a large male lion slept amidst his pride of female lionesses. Instantly, the lion looked up and matched Peter's stare. Both sides remained still for a moment, neither aggressive toward the other. Well, I might as well test it further. Peter muttered as he leaped into the enclosure. Landing a few meters away from the pride of lions, Peter non-verbally made his intentions known. Feeling the emotions of the lion and his women, Peter had to hold himself back from laughing. They're really aggressive, huh? Peter muttered and received an annoyed nod from the only other male entity in the enclosure. As soon as Peter arrived, the lionesses seemed to start complaining and goading the lion into attacking. Though, the guy seemed to be smarter than he looked and kept calm during the whole situation, ignoring the complaints of his women. Roar! Just as the females in the group started becoming too much of a bother, the male lion turned and barred its teeth, shutting them up in an instant. Can I pet you? Peter asks as he walks up without a care. After all, he is strong enough to handle these animals with a flick of his finger, so even without his empathic powers, he still had nothing to worry about. Feeling acceptance from the large beast, Peter walked over and without hesitation started brushing his fingers through the lion's mane. I've always wanted to have a pet lion. Peter commented as he enjoyed the moment. Grr. The lion growled as he heard the word pet. Ah, sorry about that. I meant nothing by it. Peter apologized and watched as the lion huffed in distaste. Hey, I said that I was sorry. Don't be like that. After bickering with a lion and his pride until sunrise, Peter said his goodbyes and returned home. Of course, he thought about taking the lion, as it would be a cool P.E., companion to have, but Peter knew that the novelty would wear off soon enough. Not only that, but if he took the lion then the women would have to follow as well, and he didn't even have enough room for one big cat let alone five of them. Maybe I can find an interesting alien pet? Peter thought as he stepped into his bedroom and found MJ asleep on the bed. A slash N, give me your ideas for a good pet. I already thought of a good one but maybe you guys would have a better idea. Instantly, he remembers his almost infinite stamina enhancement. Sovereign, a collective of planets bundled together to form the technologically advanced home world of the Sovereign, golden humanoid beings who've been genetically engineered to perfection. At least their idea of what perfection is or could be. Currently, on a high-rise platform far above the planet's surface, a group of armed individuals stood guard around the glowing sun-like spheres that occupied the area. These spheres powered the entire planet and the guardians of the galaxy were hired to protect them. Showtime, bastards. It'll be here any minute now. Quill calls out as he rests his rifle against his shoulder which will be its last minute to draw breath. Gamora pulls two pistols from her belt. I thought your lady had a thing for blades. Yondu looked to Quill questioningly. Me too. Quill frowned as he looked toward Gamora. I'm not his lady and we've been hired to stop an interdimensional beast from feeding on those batteries. Gamora gestures to the small batteries on the contraptions holding the sun-like spheres in place. How the hell am I supposed to stop something like that with a sword? It's just, swords were your thing and guns were mine, but I guess we're both doing guns now. I just didn't know that. Quill spoke as if his friend chose the same class as him in a video game. 
You gonna let your woman talk to you like that? Yandu asked without a care for the glare he received for it. Back in my day, if a woman gave me that kinda lip, I dashed before Yandu could continue making his misogynistic views known, two blaster bolts impacted the floor next to his feet. Say another word. Gamora held two smoking blasters in Yandu's direction. I dare you. Yandu simply held his hands up and smirked. Ignoring the most insufferable addition to their crew, Gamora turned to Drax, who was shirtless as always. Drax, why aren't you wearing one of Rocket's arrow rigs? She asked as she gestured to the jetpack vests that she and everyone else wore. It hurts. Drax answers in distaste as he cups his hands over his chest. I have sensitive nipples. Rocket laughed at Drax as he continued setting up some speakers, which sat next to Quill's Walkman. What about him, what's he doing? Drax says defensively as he continues covering his sensitive nips. I'm finishing this so we can listen to some tunes while we work. Rocket said matter-of-factly. How is that important? Drax asked and everyone, even Quill, seemed to agree with him. While the group began to argue about the musical addition to their work, Groot, who was surprisingly small now, walked over and watched them in amusement. Insert picture of baby Groot here, after his roots were burned by the fire in the collector's ship, Groot was weakened to a large extent and reverted back to his childhood form, a foot-tall baby tree who seemed to smile much more than his old self. A slash n, just to clarify, this is the original Groot, not his child like in the movies. As everyone continued to argue, lightning filled the sky as clouds began to form, opening a rainbow-colored dimensional rift in the process. I am Groot, baby Groot warned as he pointed to the sky. Hearing his wise words, each member of the Guardians peered upward just in time for a giant gray tentacle monster with a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth to come hurtling in their direction. Insert picture of the abelisk here, oh, well, that's intense. Rocket muttered as the giant beast landed in the center of the platform. Roar. The monster bellowed as it started swatting at the Guardians with its tentacles. Instantly, each Guardian jumped into action. Gamora, Quill, and Rocket launched out of the way of its tentacles with their jetpacks as they opened fire on the squid-like monster. Though, their weapons didn't seem to do much if any damage whatsoever. Drax on the other hand, rushed forward like a crazed bull with his swords drawn, trying to slice through the interdimensional beast. Though, just like the long-range weapons, Drax's blades appeared to be useless against the monster's tough skin. Meanwhile, Yandu kept himself out of sight, behind the beast at all times as he whistled like a madman, sending his new arrow soaring across the platform. And although he made sure to replace his old broken arrow with the best and latest model available, none of his attacks could make it through the alien squid skin. Seeing the Guardians fighting off the interdimensional monster, Baby Groot ignored them and plugged the AUX cord into Quill's stereo. Instantly, the platform filled with the sound of music as Mr. Blue Sky by ELO started to play. A slash N, feel free to listen to it while you read. Feeling the music, Groot started dancing his way through the battlefield without a care in the world for his well-being. Groot. Quill yelled as he was sent flying by a swipe of one of the beast's tentacles. Groot, get out of the way, you're going to get hurt. Gamora exclaimed as she passed the dancing tree, firing her gun off whenever she had the chance. The beast's hide is too thick to be pierced from the outside. Drax yelled as he eyed the beast with a glimmer in his eye. I must cut through it from the inside. What? No, Drax. Drax. Gamora screamed to stop him, though her words fell on deaf ears. She watched as Drax rushed forward and leapt into the beast's open maw, disappearing down its throat. What's he doing? Quill asked in alarming confusion. He said that the skin is too thick to be pierced on the outside so. Gamora explains with an annoyed sigh. That doesn't make any sense, Quill exclaims in disbelief. I tried telling him that. She shouts in return. As the battle continued, Quill soon noticed a weakness in the beast that they could use to finish the job they were given. There's a cut on its neck. Rocket, get it to look up, da. Quill shouted, and a rocket shot off into the sky above the monster's head. All right, you giant sea monkey, up here. Rocket yelled as he fired down on its head. The distraction seemed to work, as the tentacle monster craned its head upwards and extended its body, revealing the small cut on its neck. Seeing the opening, Gamora tried and failed to hit it with her pistols before throwing them to the floor and pulling a long retractable sword from her belt. Just as she was about to rush forward to stab her sword through the beast's neck and end its life, a blue and red-dressed figure ran right past her. Leaping into the air, the figure summoned a long black spear into his outstretched hand before swiping across the beast's body. Swish! Landing behind the interdimensional beast, the figure turned around just in time to see it freeze in place for a moment. That should do it, Peter muttered as Corvus Glaive's spear disappeared from his hand. And just as the spear vanished, a long cut appeared across the beast's body as it fell to the floor in two separate halves, gushing out a green gooey blood onto the platform. And out of that goo rose a familiar grey and red figure. Yes. I have single-handedly vanquished the beast. Drax exclaimed, somehow thinking that he was the one who delivered the finishing blow. Yo. Peter waved as he walked over. I see you guys have been busy while I was away. Are we getting paid for this or? It's a job. Quill nods as he lands beside Peter. The Sovereign paid us to protect this place from that thing. 
Quill gestured between the contraptions that held the sun-like fireballs in place, and the dead dimensional alien squid thing. I see. Cool jetpack. Peter comments as Rocket walks over. I didn't think they would go to Sovereign already. Peter only planned to stop by to check in on his crew for a moment, as he wanted to evolve one more time using another vial he had, though that would have to wait now. I made him. He says proudly as he tosses a towel in Drax's face. Clean yourself up. You smell like shit. Good to have you back, Captain. Yandu said as he strolled over. It's good to be back. Peter replied as he looked at the palace in the distance. Should we go and collect our payment? We? Our? I don't remember you joining in on this job. Rocket asked incredulously. His greed wouldn't allow the cut he was promised to grow any smaller. Peter remained silent as he simply gestured to the giant tentacle beast carcass, which he just sliced in half. Fine. Rocket grumbled reluctantly. All right, let's go. Careful what you say around these folks. They're easily offended. The cost of a single transgression is usually death. Quill warned, as he was the one to accept this job. Sure, let's go. Peter nodded as he caught sight of Rocket sneaking some glowing batteries from the platform into his bag. Rocket? Is that part of the job? Exclamation point. Rocket jumped as all eyes turned to him. I'll take that as a no. Peter shook his head and let out a sigh. Return what you stole. We're already getting paid. Don't push it. Screw these bastards. Sovereigns are just a bunch of grade A obnoxious pricks. Rocket exclaimed as he held his bag tightly. These batteries are worth hundreds of thousands of units apiece. Sigh. After wrestling the batteries from Rocket and placing them back on the platform, Peter and the rest of the Guardians made their way to the Golden Circular Palace in the distance. When they arrived, beautiful female palace guards with golden shimmering skin silently escorted them through the halls and into a black, blue, and gold-themed throne room. At the back of the room, on a golden throne, sat a similarly colored woman who appeared to be the spitting image of a queen in her court. Insert picture of Aisha here, Aisha, the golden high priestess of the sovereign race. At both sides of the room, high-level members of Sovereign watched as the Guardians strolled in. The looks of disgust at the new arrivals and the air of superiority that they emanated solidified how prejudiced the Sovereign race truly was. Even Peter, who was seen as an invincible existence in their eyes, was still somehow looked down upon as he wasn't a member of the great and perfect Sovereign race. Though the High Priestess was able to hide those feelings well, as she didn't want to anger a man who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Mad Titan. We thank you, Guardians, for putting your lives on the line. We could not risk the lives of our own sovereign citizens. Every citizen is born exactly as designed by the community. Impeccable, both physically and mentally. We control the DNA of our progeny, germinating them in birthing pods to perfection. Aisha greets them and explains the reason behind their inaction. After all, the sovereigns are a very advanced race. Though, it all just sounded like bragging. Truthfully, they could have sent out an armed squad or two and handled the dimensional squid with ease. They just didn't want to dirty their hands, Peter thought as he wondered whether he should have allowed Rocket to rob them as he wanted. I guess I prefer to make people the old-fashioned way. Quill says as Aisha gives him a heated glance. Then perhaps someday, you could give me a history lesson in the archaic ways of our ancestors. For academic purposes? She pretty much just invited Quill to her bed. Oh, Gamora looks pissed. Peter watched as Gamora frowned and her eyebrow twitched. Though she's probably only making that offer to steal a sample of Quill's celestial DNA. I would be honored. In the name of research, of course. I think that could be pretty, a dash Quill froze as he noticed Gamora staring at him and quickly changes his answer. Repulsive. I'm not into that kind of sick. Seeing that Gamora was already starting to grind her teeth in anger at Quill's behavior, Peter stepped forward and cut in before he could further ruin his chances with her. Your people promised something in exchange for our services. Please bring it so we can be on our way. Peter tried to hurry things along in a respectful manner. The High Priestess looks toward Peter worriedly before quickly motioning for her guards to do as he said. I apologize. Allow me to double the original payment for wasting your time, Aisha offers, hoping to foster a good relationship with him. That won't be necessary Dash as Peter was about to decline, Quill reached over and covered his mouth. What he means is that we'll gladly accept your kind offer, Quill says as Rocket nods his furry little head in agreement. Soon enough, a golden palace guard walked in and handed over a single card, which was basically a debit card full of credits. We thank you, High Priestess Aisha, Quill says as he snatches the card and stashed it away. Just as they were about to leave, Aisha called out to them. What is your heritage, Mr. Quill? The High Priestess asked curiously. As the priestess of a race based on genealogy, Aisha had a keen sense toward the genetic makeup of other beings. And Quill had to be the oddest man she's ever met. Even Peter wasn't nearly as complicated, though that would change once he evolves with some celestial DNA. My mother is from Earth, he answers simply. And your father? She asks. He ain't from Missouri. That's all I know. Quill shrugged unknowingly. I see it within you an unorthodox genealogy. A hybrid that seems particularly reckless and volatile. The High Priestess said as if she could see straight through him and into his origins. You know, they told me you people were conceited douchebags, but that isn't true at all. 
Rocket came to Quill's defense as he turned and winked, though every sovereign in the room saw it. Looking around, he soon realized this as well. Oh, sorry. That was meant to be behind your back? Rocket clarifies, but it does little to fix the awkward atmosphere. As they said their farewell, Drax carried out Rocket by the scruff of his neck. Even now he was still receiving some major glares from every sovereign in the palace. Count yourself blessed that they didn't kill you, Drax said. I just wish I still had those batteries. That stuff about my father? Quill muttered in anger as he paced back and forth on the ship. Who does she think she is? As soon as they set off from the sovereign homeworld, Quill's bad mood only seemed to intensify. I know you're sensitive about that. Gamora watched him work himself up. I'm not sensitive about it. I just don't know who he is. Quill said though, he wasn't very convincing. Sorry if it seemed like I was flirting with the high priestess. I wasn't. I don't care if you were. Gamora lies as she walks off in a huff. Well, I feel like you do care. That's why I'm apologizing. So, I'm sorry. Quill calls after her, though she didn't reply. I say we celebrate our payday. Yandu said, as they split the money. Sounds good to me. Peter says as he hops into the cockpit. Know any good spots? We have to wait until Ego shows himself anyway. Landing on a snowy planet, Yandu escorts the crew to a town that was lit up in neon lights. Everyone they passed seemed to be wasted to some degree as they went from bar to bar, enjoying their evening to the fullest. What is this? Some sort of pirate town? Peter asked as he saw nothing but shady individuals roaming around. Oh yeah, now let's drink. Yandu exclaimed as his forty or so ravagers bellowed in excitement and rushed toward the nearest bar. Ha ha. Wait for me. Drax rushed after them, followed by Quill and Rocket. Gamora sighed in annoyance as she slowly followed from behind, leaving Peter behind with Groot standing on his shoulder. Should we join them? Peter asked as he could already see some of the Ravagers getting into fights. I am Groot. Groot nodded his little head. After following the group from bar to bar for about an hour, where he watched his crew drink themselves stupid, Peter saw someone that caused him to double take in shock. After going in circles for years with this woman, I end up marrying. I said, Aletta, I love you, girl, but you're losing your mind. Then again, she's always been that way. I could never trust her. You know? A man that looked just like Sylvester Stallone spoke animatedly. He wore a jacket with the same flaming patch as Yandu, marking him as a Ravager clan leader. Insert picture of Stakar Ogord here, Stakar Ogord is a legendary Ravager captain and the leader of the Stakar Ravager clan. He holds so much influence over the 100 Ravager clans that he might as well be the leader and king of all Ravagers throughout the galaxy. Holy shit. It's Rambo? Peter thought in awe. Meanwhile, Yandu stood and stared at the man like a deer in headlights, both afraid and eager to speak with him at the same time. Stakar. It's been some time. Yandu worked up the courage to step up and greet the man with a respectful bow. Sadly for him, with one look at Yandu's blue face, Stakar's whole night was irrevocably ruined. It seems like this establishment is the wrong kind of disreputable. Stakar states as he storms out of the bar with his men at his back. Stakar. Yandu yelled as he ran after them. There's a hundred Ravager factions. Stakar stopped for a moment to speak to the bar's owner, who was trying to convince him to stay. You just lost the business of 99 of them by serving one. Please, sir. Please. The owner begged as they rushed off out the door. You can go to hell then. I don't give a damn what you think of me. Yandu screamed, though he wasn't exactly telling the truth. In fact, Stakar rescued Yandu from the life of a battle slave for the Kree Empire and inducted him into the Ravagers. Yandu has always looked up to Stakar, so being treated like this by him was actually quite heartbreaking. So, what are you following us for? Stakar asks as he turns to see Yandu follow him out into the snow. Are you gonna listen to what I gotta say? Yandu asked angrily. I've never seen him this emotional before. Quill mutters as he and everyone else watch the drama unfold. I don't gotta listen to anything. You betrayed the code. Ravagers don't deal in kids. Stakar yelled, piquing Quill's interest immediately. I told you before, I didn't know what was going on. Yandu tried to defend himself. You didn't know because you didn't wanna know. All you cared about was trafficking kids for a quick buck, Stakar countered in distaste. I demand a seat on the table. I wear these flames, same as you. Yandu wanted to be accepted once again. Though that time has long passed. You may dress like us, but you'll never hear the hordes of freedom when you die, and the colors of Ogord will never flash over your grave. If you think I take pleasure in exiling you, then you're wrong. You broke all of our hearts? Stakar says in disappointment as he turns and walks off. Yandu stood rooted to the ground in a whirlwind of emotions as he watched the man he looked up to as a hero grow further and further away. Off to the side, a few of Yandu's Ravager clansmen spoke amongst themselves. Ah, pathetic. First, the captain joins Quill's friend's crew, and now he lets another Ravager captain walk all over him. We followed him because he was the one who wasn't afraid to do what needed to be done. Seems he's going soft now. A particularly ugly Ravager with the face of a wrinkly ball sack spoke in a hushed tone. If he's so soft, why are you whispering? Another asks with a smirk. You know I'm right? He replies. You best be very careful what you say about Yandu, especially with the new captain around. 
one of the older Ravagers warned. Instantly, all eyes turned to Peter as a chill ran through their spines. You're right, I'll keep my mouth shut. Damn right, you will? Peter thought as he overheard their entire conversation. I guess that there won't be any rebellions with me around. Just as Peter was about to walk over and say some comforting words to his newest crew mate, a white egg-shaped spaceship flew overhead before landing in the center of town, nearly hitting a few drunk alien girls in the process. He's finally here. After all these years, I finally found you. A man spoke as the egg-shaped ship opened from the middle, revealing an old, well-built bearded man alongside a large-eyed Asian-looking alien woman with two long fleshy antennae on her forehead. Insert picture of Ego here, insert picture of Mantis here, Quill could feel Ego's stare directed straight at him as he spoke, but that wasn't all. He also felt this odd connection to the man, as if they were related in some way. And who the hell are you? Quill asks as he and everyone else in the town reach for their guns. I figured my rugged good looks would make that obvious. My name is Ego, and I'm your dad, Peter, Quill. Ego revealed, shocking Quill into silence. Peter watched the father and son meeting with a contemplative mind. Because Ego's real body is literally a giant brain encased in a planet, killing him now would be absolutely pointless. His consciousness would most likely return to his planet, where he would swiftly build a new body. Peter hypothesized. Though that wasn't the only reason that he would have to play things slowly. And it wouldn't look very good if I just killed Quill's dad for no reason either? Peter thought as he caught a glimpse of hope in his vice captain's eyes as he stared at his father in a daze. Peter would have to wait until they're taken to Ego's planet, and then wait again until Quill's father reveals his true self. After all, no villain can ever resist the urge to monologue before their plans come to fruition. Why don't we find somewhere more private to continue this conversation? Peter steps between Quill and his father. And as he did this, for barely a second, Peter caught a glimpse of a frown flash on Ego's face. Is Quill's godlike daddy wary of little old me? Peter smirked under his mask. Though that wasn't the only person the old celestial seemed wary of. Yondu, who was standing next to Peter, also received a similar look as well. As for the man himself, Yondu was feeling a lot of emotions right now, and none of them had to do with Stalker's earlier words. No, as soon as Ego arrived, Yondu completely forgot about those mundane troubles and felt nothing but dread, fear, and protectiveness. After all, he knew what Ego had in store for Quill. He witnessed what happened to all of Ego's other children that he delivered. Ego really needed to find a way to keep him quiet. Yes, that would probably be for the best. Ego smiles charmingly as he turns to look at the large group of armed spectators. Why don't you go park your ship somewhere less conspicuous, and we'll arrange for a private room in that inn. Peter says as he points to a nearby building. Ego nods as he turns to Quill. I'll be right back, son. Quill's hands tightened into fists as he watched his dad fly off, unsure about how to feel in this situation. On one hand, he wanted to spend some time with his father. Get to know him and learn everything about the man that enamored his mother to such a degree. After all, she would always talk about how amazing his angel-slash-spaceman father was. And on the other hand, he wanted to pull his pistols and open fire. This is the man that abandoned him and his mother, leaving him without a father and her to die while being judged by their family. Because who would believe someone that said they were impregnated by an angelic alien? Of course, there was also the possibility that Ego was lying, though Quill could feel the connection between them. Come on, Peter said as he swatted Quill across the head. Ow. What the hell? He shouted in pain as he snapped out of his shock daze. Let's go, you idiot. Peter scoffs as he pushes Quill toward their destination. We need to talk before he returns. After paying for a large room, which had a spacious living room that could easily fit the whole crew, Peter quickly placed a few privacy spells around the room before turning to Yondu. You know something? Peter asked, causing all heads to turn Yondu's way. Yondu remained silent as he turned toward Quill with a complicated look on his face. Speak up already, you dash knock knock. Quill was about to snap at his adoptive daddy, though it was already too late. The real one had arrived. Sigh, we'll talk again when we have time. For now, we play along and see what happens. We need more information before anything else. Peter hints at his mistrust of Quill's father. And they all seemed to understand, as not a single crew member spoke up. Even Quill didn't disagree either. At least not yet. Opening the door and welcoming the Celestial and his servant inside, Peter took a seat on the room's large sofa with his crew at his back. Have a seat? Peter offers as he gestures to the seats across from them. Thank you. Ego replied as he sat down, with Mantis standing dutifully at his side. I believe my vice captain has some questions for you. Peter says as he turns to Quill, who was seated beside him. If you're my dad, then where the hell have you been? Quill starts off strong. I hired Yandu to pick you up when your mother passed away. But instead of returning you, Yandu kept you. Ego says as he turns to glare in the blue ravager's direction. Of course, Peter said to play along, so Yandu didn't argue and remained silent. Maybe having Yandu here isn't the best idea. Peter says as he turns to his newest crew member. Go make sure the ravagers aren't causing any trouble. Yandu frowned as he felt the urge to whistle and shoot an arrow straight through Ego's head. Yes, sir. But in the end, he decided to go with the captain's plan. 
Of course, this action seemed to soothe Ego, which is exactly what Peter wanted. Yeah, relax and soon enough you'll get too comfortable and slip up, Peter thought as Yandu stomped out of the room. Is he a part of your crew now? Because if I were you, I'd stay far away from people like him, Ego put on a confused face as he spoke. I have no clue as to why he wouldn't just complete the job. I paid him handsomely, too. One of my biggest regrets in this life is hiring him to retrieve you. You and me both. He only kept me around because I was a skinny little kid who could squeeze into places adults couldn't. I made jobs a lot easier for him. Quill complains, though Peter couldn't tell if he was being serious or not. Well, I've been trying to track you down ever since, Ego says as he smiles warmly at his son. I thought Yondu was your father, Drax spoke up with a clueless look on his face. No, Yondu is his daddy, Peter says matter-of-factly as he gestures to Ego. This is his father. There's a difference. You shut up. Quill pointed angrily at Peter as he turned to Drax. We've been together this whole time, and you thought Yandu was my actual blood relative? You look exactly alike. Drax seemed very sure of himself. One's blue. Rocket exclaimed in disbelief. No, he's not my father. Yandu was the guy who abducted me, kicked the crap out of me, so I could learn to fight, and kept me in terror by threatening to eat me. Quill explains thoroughly. Eat you? Ego looked genuinely appalled. That son of a bitch? After all, if he actually ate Quill, then Ego's plan would be ruined. How'd you locate us? Peter asks, changing the subject. Well, even where I reside, out past the edge of what's known, we've heard a lot about the man they call Star-Lord. Ego gives his son a proud fatherly look. Of course, he's heard about Spider-Man as well, which is why he frowned earlier. What say we head out there right now? Your captain and crew mates are also welcome. Even that triangle-faced monkey there? Ego points to their raccoon mascot. What did he just call me? Rocket muttered in confusion. He wasn't sure whether that was an insult or not. I promise you it's unlike any other place you've ever seen. There I can explain your very special heritage and perhaps be the father I've always wanted to be. Ego was really laying it on thick. We would be honored to visit your home, Peter says respectfully as he rose out of his seat. Just give us the coordinates and we'll meet you there. If it's not too much trouble, I'd like my son to ride with me, Ego says as he gives Quill a hopeful look. We have so much time to make up for. Of course, you would, you sly old fart. Peter knew that Ego didn't want Quill out of his sight, as his disappearance would stall his plans yet again. Sure, some of us can ride with you, while the rest follow along separately. We just have to return to our ship for a second and grab some personal belongings first. After assuring Ego that they would meet him at his ship in half an hour, the Guardians alongside Mantis returned to their ship. Sadly, Mantis was forced upon them by Ego under the guise of escorting them to his ship, though Peter knew the real reason. To make sure the key to his plan didn't run off. Though just as they returned to the ship, Peter tapped Mantis on the shoulder and thought of all the sleepless days that he's been through. Instantly, the poor girl collapsed into Peter's arms. What the hell was that? Rocket shouted as the rest of the crew seemed alarmed as well. She comes from a race of empaths. Through touch she experiences other people's emotions as if they were her own, Peter says as he lays her down on a nearby couch. I just projected some exhaustion on her. That's all? Okay, we have half an hour before we have to meet up with Quill's dad again. Any thoughts? Peter asks the guardians. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it, Quill frowned suspiciously. I mean, give me a break. After all this time, he's just gonna show up, and all of a sudden he wants to be my dad. I agree, it's suspicious, Peter nodded as Quill complained. He gives me bad guy vibes. Trust me, I've got a sense for these types of things, and by the way, this could be a trap. The Cree purists, the Ravagers. They all want us dead, Quill added in a huff. I know, but. Gamora frowned in contemplation as she looked Quill in the eyes. But what? Quill asked. What was that story you once told me about Zardu Hasselfrau, she asked. Who, he asked in confusion. Do you mean David Hasselhoff? Peter guessed with a raised brow. What the hell does this have to do with some old actor from Earth? Right, Gamora nodded. And as a child, you would carry his picture in your pocket and tell all the other children that he was your father. Peter frowned sadly under his mask as he recalled this from the movie. That's really pathetic. Drax commented without understanding the vibe of the room. Shut up. Quill shouted at Drax before turning back to Gamora. I told you that when I was drunk. Why are you bringing it up now? I love that story, Gamora admitted. Yeah? Well, I hate it. As a kid, I used to see all the other kids off playing catch with their dad, and I wanted that more than anything in the world. Quill felt embarrassed as the whole crew heard this. That's my point. What if this man is your Hasselhoff? And if he ends up being evil, we will just kill him, Gamora shrugged uncaringly. Then let me be the bearer of bad news, Yandu stepped up and ruined the moment. That bastard is evil, Peter smirked under his mask as Yandu finally spoke up. Care to explain how you know that? Peter asked as all eyes turned to Yandu. Well, it all started back before I picked up Quill. Ego got in touch with me and hired me to traffic some kids for him. Yandu's words caused a few pointed looks to be thrown his way. At first, I refused. What changed your mind? Peter asked. The money, Yandu admitted in shame. 
Though he also promised that the children wouldn't be hurt. But that was a damn lie. So, you were kidnapping kids and bringing them to my father? And he was hurting them? Quill was beyond confused. Guess I should be glad that I was a skinny kid. Otherwise, you'd have delivered me to him too. You still believe that's the reason I kept you around, you idiot? Yandu didn't look very happy. That's what you told me, you old smurf. Quill responded in kind. Once I figured out what happened to them other kids, I wasn't just gonna hand you over, Yandu said in his defense. You said you were gonna eat me, Quill glared. That was me being funny? Yandu shouted in exasperation. Not to me. Quill yelled back. Damn, you got some serious daddy issues? Rocket commented. I am Groot. Groot nodded from his seat on Peter's shoulder. Keep quiet, you trash bandit. Quill just kept yelling. Alright, let's all just calm down. Peter interjected as he turned to Yandu. What happened to the kids? They. Yandu choked up on his words for a moment. They. He killed them all. What? Quill exclaimed. He wanted so badly for Yandu to be lying that a small part of him couldn't help but doubt this story. After bringing him hundreds of kids, I started getting suspicious. I thought, where are they? So I put a tracker on one of the little gremlins, hoping to find a school or a town where they lived, but, but what? Rocket asked in curiosity. I found a pit, filled with hundreds of skeletons. All of them kid-sized. I brought them to be slaughtered by that monster, Yandu explained in shame and self-hatred. And that's why Stakar and every other Ravager in the galaxy will never forgive me, then I will forgive you in their stead, Peter said as he walked up and rested a comforting hand on the blue man's shoulder. Everyone deserves a second chance, and this is yours. Yandu remained silent as he looked at Quill. How do we know you aren't lying? Quill asked suspiciously. We don't, Peter said with a shake of his head. Which is why I say we go along with Ego and see what he's planning. We also need to figure out the other half of Quill's heritage, and his father is our only link to that. So we're just going to walk into what's most likely a trap so that Stardouche can learn about what kind of alien his daddy is. Rocket asked with a frown. Yeah, pretty much, Peter nodded. Alright, Rocket nodded as he walked off. Where are you going? Quill asked. To clean my guns. Rocket yelled as he disappeared into the back of the ship. Smiling to himself, Peter turned to Yondu. Is there anything that we should know before heading out? He asked. Yeah. After having a quick strategy meeting, Peter, Quill, Gamora, Rocket, Groot, and Drax were led to Ego's ship, which immediately took off upon their arrival. Yondu and his Ravagers were left with the ship and would meet them at Ego's planet soon enough. Of course, Mantis was confused when they woke her up, but Peter just shrugged and blamed her fainting on lack of sleep and overwork. As they took off, Peter couldn't help but admire Ego's ship? Once this is over, I'll add this ship to my collection. Peter thought as he took a seat in a milky white room alongside his crew and Mantis. I am Mantis. Mantis introduces herself with a smile and a small bow. Master is sleeping, so I will keep you company in his absence. Since Ego is just a giant brain encased inside a planet of his own creation, the human form that he projects his consciousness into grows weaker when he's away. Which is why he needs to sleep. What are you doing? Drax asks as he eyes her warily. Although she was trying to be nice, the smile on Mantis' face looked creepy, to say the least. Smiling, she answers as her smile intensifies. I hear it is the thing to do to make people like you. Not if you do it like that. Rocket said, wiping the freaky smile from her face. Oh, Mantis mutters sadly. I was raised alone on Ego's planet, so I don't understand the intricacies of social interaction. A slash N, me neither, sister. Although she seemed sad for a moment, that seemed to fade as she eyed Rocket in infatuation. Can I pet your puppy? It's adorable. She asks, eliciting a glare from said puppy. Yes. Drax nods with a mischievous smirk. Grr. Raka. Rocket growled as her hand grew closer before snapping his fangs at her. Ah. Mantis screamed in fright as she pulled her hand away. Ha ha. That is called a practical joke. Drax laughed boisterously and was soon joined by Mantis, who had no idea what was happening. Hey, can I ask you a personal question? Quill asks after everything calmed down. No one has ever asked me a personal question. Mantis nods for him to ask. Your antennas. What are they for? He asks curiously. Their purpose? Mantis mutters as she goes on to explain her empathic abilities. If I touch someone, I can feel their feelings. You read minds? Rocket mutters as he looks at Peter, realizing that their captain wasn't lying earlier. No. Telepaths know thoughts. Empaths feel feelings and emotions. May I? Mantis holds her hand out to Quill. All right. He shrugged and grabbed her hand. Instantly, Mantis' antennas lit up as she felt his feelings. You feel love. She exclaimed with blushing cheeks. Yeah, I guess I feel a general, unselfish love for just about everybody around me. Quill started pulling out excuses as he looked toward Gamora, hoping that she wouldn't catch on. No. Romantic, sexual love. Mantis clarifies explicitly. No. No, I don't. Quill denied it in embarrassment. For her. Mantis exclaims as she points at Gamora. No. Quill shouts as Gamora looks surprised by this revelation. That is not? 
After all, she thought of Quill as more of a playboy, who simply wanted to get into her pants. Drax suddenly starts laughing uproariously and points at Quill in unending amusement. She just told everyone your deepest, darkest secret? He continued to laugh in Quill's face. Dude, come on. I think you're overreacting a little bit. Quill said in annoyance. I am Groot. Groot seemed to agree with Quill. Eh, it's a little funny. Rocket admits with a shrug. You must be so embarrassed. Drax continues cackling as Gamora smirks in amusement. Do me. Do me, do me. Mantis reaches over and touches Drax's chest and immediately starts laughing uncontrollably as well. I have never felt such humor. After everyone was done having a laugh at Quill's expense, Mantis continued her explanation. I can also alter other people's emotions to a certain extent, she admits. Yeah, like what? Peter asks. If I touch someone who's sad, I can ease them into contentment for a short while. I can make a stubborn person compliant, but I mostly use it to help my master sleep. He lies awake at night, thinking about his progeny. She explains further. Oh, really? How many other children does Ego have? I thought Quill was the only one. Peter asks in interest. M. Mantis froze as she instantly realized that she spoke too much. I don't know. Master doesn't talk about them very much. She isn't a very good liar, is she? Peter thought with a smile. Though, she'll make a good guardian when this is all over. Everyone else couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. They decided to keep an eye on Mantis and made a mental note to look into Ego's other children. As the ship grew closer to Ego's planet, the guardians of the galaxy prepared for what was to come. They had no idea what kind of dangers awaited them, but they were ready to face them head on. Upon arriving at Ego's planet, Peter and the Guardians were amazed by the psychedelic landscape. Ego's planet resembled a fantasy world with majestic waterfalls, towering cliffs, rushing crystal-clear rivers, lush flora and fauna of all colors, and species of animals and bugs which the Guardians have never seen before. Insert picture of Ego's planet here, it's so beautiful. Drax muttered in awe. Everyone else nodded with a similar awestruck look on their faces. Ego may be an egotistic maniac hellbent on universal domination, but at least the guy has good taste. Peter thought, as every aspect of this planet was sculpted by Ego himself. As they grew closer and closer to Ego's palace, which appeared to be made of some sort of bronze metal and green crystal, Peter was starting to wonder whether he should somehow preserve this planet. Ego obviously has to go, but the planet itself would make a good vacation spot to bring the family. Peter thought. He couldn't help but imagine waking up with MJ and watching the sun rise over the extraordinary scenery. Welcome, everyone, to my world, Ego says with open arms as the ship landed at the front of his palace. Wow, you have your own planet? Quill asked, as he expected some sort of home world with a bunch of other aliens present. As they stepped out of the ship, Ego smirked as he seemed to enjoy his sun's shock. Come on. It's not larger than your Earth's moon. Ego gives a minor brag. Humility. Drax mutters with an approving nod. I like it. I am extraordinarily humble as well. What race are you, again? Peter starts asking some questions in order to get the ball rolling. I'm what's called a celestial. Ego answers proudly, though he sounded narcissistic from Peter's perspective. A celestial, like a god? Rocket scoffs in disbelief. I am Groot. Groot didn't seem to believe him either. Believe what you will, though it's a small g. At least on the days that I feel as humble as Drax. Ego joked as he escorted them into the palace, where a large screen awaited them. I don't know where I came from exactly. The first thing I remember is flickering. Instantly, the screen lit up and showed the image of a giant brain floating in the darkness of space. The only light was the distant stars and the blue energy that the brain illuminated into the surroundings. Adrift in the cosmos, utterly and entirely alone. Over millions of years, I learned to control the surrounding molecules. As he spoke, the image changed, showing an entire planet growing around the brain into what it is today. I grew smarter and stronger. And I continued building from there. Layer by layer, into the very planet you walk on now. But I wanted more. I desired, meaning, once again, the images on the television changed, showing a man matching Ego's current appearance standing in a field. I thought, there must be some life out there in the universe besides just me. And so, I set myself the task of finding it. I created what I imagined biological life to be like, down to the most minute detail. Did you make a penis? Drax blurted out his question without a second thought. Dude. Quill snapped his head to the side with a look of disgust. After all, no man or woman wants to think of their father's penis. A slash and nauseated face face vomiting, what is wrong with you? Gamora asked as she unintentionally thought of her own father's private parts. A slash n, Thanos has to be packing some serious heat, though. I mean, come on, somehow, her face turned a darker shade of green than usual as she felt an intense urge to puke. If he is a planet, how could he make a baby with your mother? He would demolish her. Drax argues, as he didn't understand why they were upset. I don't need to hear how my parents, you know. Quill reluctantly argues back. Why? My father would tell the story of how he impregnated my mother every winter solstice. Drax reveals without shame. That's disgusting. Peter mutters. It was beautiful. 
You Earthers have odd boundaries, Drax looks between Peter and Quill in both confusion and pity. Yeah, it's us who are the weird ones, Peter scoffs. I am Groot. Groot shook his head from his place on Peter's shoulder. Ever since he shrunk down to his current size, Groot has stuck close to Peter. Whether for safety reasons or whatever, he seemed to grow accustomed to riding on his captain's shoulder. Though Peter didn't mind. Yes, Drax, I made a penis, Ego admitted in amusement. Ha! Huh. Drax laughed as he pointed at both Peter and Quill. I told you so. We never said you were wrong. Quill slaps his palm against his forehead in exasperation. We just didn't want to hear about it. It's not half bad. Ego continued with a confident smirk. Did your dad just brag about his dong? Peter whispered to Quill. Quill seemed to deflate in defeat. He only hoped that remaining silent would stop the current conversation from continuing. I've also got pain receptors, a digestive system, and all of the other accompanying junk. I wanted to experience what it truly meant to be human as I set out amongst the stars. The images changed again, showing planet after planet, filled with all sorts of alien creatures and peoples. Until I found what I sought. Life. I was not alone in the universe after all. When did you meet my mother? Quill asks curiously. Instantly, the image on the screen shifted into Ego standing alongside a beautiful blonde-haired woman. Quill was instantly enamored with the image, as it has been a long time since he saw his mother. Before this, he could barely remember what she looked like. Only the songs on his Walkman could remind him of his loving mother, and even then it was still impossible to picture her fully. Not long after. It was with Meredith that I first experienced love. I called her my river lily. And from that love, I have you. Ego turned to Quill and smiled warmly. I have searched for you for so long. And when I heard the news of the great Star-Lord, Peter Quill, I knew you must be the son of the woman I loved. If you loved her, why did you leave her? Quill asked, eliciting a frown from his father. But before Ego could speak, Peter cut into the conversation. I'll give you one better? Peter spoke and all eyes turned his way. If you loved his mother so much, then how could you not know that she had cancer? Exclamation point. Quill's eyes went wide as he turned to his father, questioningly. I, Ego didn't know what to say. After all, you made this entire planet and all of its inhabitants, not to mention the body your consciousness currently inhabits, yet you didn't check to see if the love of your life had any ailments that needed curing. Peter asked incredulously. Though he spoke from experience. As soon as he had the money and resources, Peter was sure to test his family and friends for all types of ailments, diseases, and disabilities. He wanted to spend a long life with them, so it was crucial to make sure they could accompany him the whole way. Immediately, all eyes turned back to Ego, awaiting his answer. I didn't think of that. Ego stuttered out his makeshift excuse. It was the best he could do, as he couldn't admit to what really happened. Maybe you didn't love my mother as much as you claim. Quill watched his father in suspicion. Peter, Quill. Ego sounded heartbroken, though nobody was buying it. Listen, I'd love to believe all of this, I really would. But you left the most wonderful woman ever to die alone, while everyone around her thought you were just a delusion. Quill started to get heated. I didn't want to leave your mother, Peter, Quill. If I don't return regularly to my planet and the light within it, then this form will wither and perish. Ego explained. How long does it take to get to Earth from here? Peter cut in once again and asked. Ego remained silent this time around, though he was sure to glare hatefully in Peter's direction. How long? Quill repeated his captain's question. It can't be more than a few days with how fast that ship of his is, Peter adds, as their ship still hasn't arrived yet. So why didn't you come back? Why send Yandu, a criminal, of all people, to come and fetch me? Quill asks, though that wasn't all. Actually, how haven't I met you? I grew up without a father around, so you purposely stayed away, didn't you? I loved your mother, Peter. I couldn't stand to set foot on an earth where she wasn't living. You can't imagine what that's like. Ego starts shouting back. I know exactly what that feels like. I had to watch her die. Quill screamed at the top of his lungs. As the argument seemed to pause for a moment, Peter found the perfect opportunity to poke yet another hole in Ego's story. How did you know she was dead? Peter asked pointedly. What? Ego asked, hoping to buy time to come up with an answer. I said, how did you know that your sweet little river lily was dead? Peter repeats his question with a bit more emphasis this time. After all, you abandoned the family that you claimed to love. You weren't there, so how did you know? After all, you abandoned the family that you claimed to love. You weren't there, so how did you know? Peter's words seemed to strike a major nerve in Quill's father. Though instead of shouting, attacking, or even refuting Peter's claims, Ego reined himself in and turned to his son. Over the millions and millions of years of my existence, I've made many mistakes. He says as he steps forward and grabs Quill by the hands. As soon as their hands met, Quill's eyes went wide as they glazed over with the image of a starry night sky. Please give me the chance to be the father that your mother would have wanted me to be. There's so much that I need to teach you about this planet and the light within. They are a part of you, Peter. What do you mean? What's happening? Quill asked in awe of what he was seeing. Sort of like a dumbed-down version of the open-your-mind thing that Peter went through, Quill's sight was thrown across the universe and into infinity and beyond. 
A slash N, Buzz Lightyear, hey, what are you doing to him? Gamora exclaimed as she drew her knives and stepped forward. And she wasn't the only one. Everyone drew their weapons and were just about to pounce on Ego, but before they could. Don't interfere, Peter spoke up. But dash surprisingly, Rocket was the first to object, as he glanced worriedly at Quill, who looked like a zombie at the moment. Just wait a minute, Peter tried to sound reassuring, though they still looked antsy about the whole situation. I'll interfere if it gets out of hand, but for now, let's just watch. Come on, help Quill activate his powers already? Peter thought impatiently. As they heeded Peter's words, Ego took the opportunity he was given and got right back to work. Now, you need to readjust the way you process life. Everything around us, including your friends, are temporary. Only we are forever. Ego explains as he gives the Guardians a sideways glare. The crew glares back as they wait for Peter to say the word, so they can attack. Meanwhile, Mantis stood off to the side without a clue as to what she should be doing. I told you how all those years ago I had an unceasing impulse to find life. But what I did not tell you was that, when I finally did find it, it was all so, disappointing. And that is when I came to a profound realization. My innate desire to seek out other life was not so that I could walk among that life. Son, I have found meaning. Meaning for the both of us. Both of us. Quill repeated back in his dazed state with the infinity of space still flashing over his eyes. Instantly, the monitor in front of them changed again, showing planet after planet alongside the image of Ego planting, a large glowing seed. I call it the expansion. It is my purpose, and now it is yours as well. Over thousands of years, I implanted extensions of myself on countless worlds. I need to fulfill life's one true purpose. To grow and spread, covering all that exists until everything is. Me. Ego ended his villainous monologue with a bit of excitement. This nut job is seriously insane, huh? Rocket comments as he took aim at Quill's father. I am Groot. Groot agreed as his tiny vines began whipping around threateningly. Are you sure we shouldn't do something? Gamora asks worriedly. No, we wait. Peter shook his head. As he wasn't a celestial yet, Peter didn't know how to activate or train Quill's powers, so he thought it best to let his dad give him a helping hand before his timely death. I only had a single problem. One celestial doesn't have enough power for such an enterprise. But two celestials. Now, that just might do. Ego looked toward his son with hope-filled eyes as he reached out. Here. Hold your hands like this. Now, close your eyes and concentrate. As Quill complied with his father's words, he felt an odd sensation in his body. Take your mind to the center of this planet? Though he was still in a bit of a fog, Quill continued to comply as the image of a giant brain inside what appeared to be a cave flickered into his mind. Yes. Ego exclaimed in joy as he watched a ball of blue energy appear between Quill's outstretched hands. Whoa. Quill muttered in shock as he felt the energy in his hands, which partially broke him from his foggy state of mind. Even the Guardians were shocked, as Quill never showed any sort of energy-related powers before today. Out of all my labors, the most annoying was attempting to graft my DNA with that of another species. I hoped the result of such a coupling would be enough to power the expansion. I even had Yondu deliver them to me. In all of his excitement, Ego seemed to forget that he needed to lie and started to blabber, as most bad guys tend to do. It broke the Ravager code, but I compensated him generously and to ease his conscience, I said I'd never hurt them. I mean, that was true. They never felt a thing. But one after the other, they failed me. Not one of them carried the celestial genes. Until you, my son. Out of all my progeny, only you carried the connection to the light. Wait, are Quill's powers connected to his father? Peter wondered as he put the pieces together based on Ego's words this far. It's times like this that I wish I watched the Marvel movies multiple times. Ego's words replayed in Peter's mind. If I don't return regularly to my planet and the light within it, then this form will wither and perish. There's so much that I need to teach you about this planet and the light within. They are a part of you, Peter, take your mind to the center of this planet, only you carry the connection to the light. This makes things complicated. Peter thought, as he now needs to keep Ego alive somehow if he wants Quill to keep his powers. As Peter was thinking to himself, Ego seemed to grow even more excited, spreading his arms wide with a wide smile on his face. For the first time in my existence, I am not alone. Ego shouted like a madman as he noticed a frown on his son's face. What's the matter, Peter, Quill? My friends? Quill muttered as he turned to look toward the Guardians, his mind still partially clouded. You see, that's the mortal in you? Ego grabs his son by the head and forces him to look at him, face to face. We are beyond such things. Quill remained silent. Now, Ego turned to Peter and the Guardians, ready to make quick work of them. But my mother? Quill asked as his face began to harden. You said you loved her? I did. My river Lily who knew all the words to every song that came over the radio. She was a sight to behold? Ego said with a far-off reminiscent look in his eyes. I returned to Earth to see her three times, and I knew that if I returned a fourth, then I'd never leave. Soon enough, that far-off look resembling a mourning man looking back on his long-lost love disappeared, and a resigned almost uncaring expression took its place. The expansion. The reason for my very existence would be over. So, I did what I had to do. 
Ego said as a melancholy frown flashed onto his face for a brief moment. But, it truly broke my heart to put that tumor in her head. What? Quill sobered up in an instant as his eyes returned to normal. The murderous look he sent his father would send lesser men fleeing in fear. Now, now, all right. Ego holds up his hands, as he knew that was something he shouldn't have revealed. I know that sounds bad dash pew 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 pew. Without a second of hesitation, Quill pulled his pistols and opened fire on his father in a silent fit of rage. With each shot, parts of Ego's body disintegrated, revealing a ghostly blue figure underneath. Haha. <laughs> Are we finally shooting? Rocket yelled happily as he pumped his large cannon-like blaster and joined Quill. Though when the shooting died down. Who? Ego muttered in shock though he soon snapped out of it. Who in the hell do you think you are? You killed my mother? Quill yelled in a furious rage as the guardians formed up behind him, ready for battle. Of course, Peter didn't stop them this time. He already got what he wanted. You know, I tried so hard to find the form that best suited you. Ego says as he heals himself in a matter of seconds. And this is the thanks I get? You really need to grow up? Dude, you just admitted to killing his mom. Peter rolls his eyes at Ego's behavior. Don't act like you're the victim. I wanted to do this together. Ego laments as he sends his son a deadly glare. But, I suppose you'll have to learn by spending the next thousand years as a battery. Without hesitation or sympathy for his own son, Ego whips a hand forward and shoots out a tentacle of blue energy, aimed right at Quill's chest. Exclamation point. Quill and the Guardian saw the attack coming, but none of them were fast enough to do anything about it. Except. Slap. Appearing in front of his vice captain, Peter wound his hand back and swatted the blue tentacle aside like a true Chinese young master from a novel. A slash N, you do not give this young master face? Slap. You did not see Mount Tai? Slap, courting death? Slap. I'm your grandfather. Slap, dare to covet my harem of fairies? Slap, okay. I may have gotten carried away, as the ethereal energy tentacle crashed into the monitor, which exploded into sparks and flickered off, Peter and Ego eyed one another dangerously. Only one person is allowed to beat my vice captain, and that's his daddy, Peter says with a smirk under his mask. And since Yandu ain't here right now, I'll have to whoop your butt in his place, only one person is allowed to beat my vice captain, and that's his daddy, Peter says with a smirk under his mask. And Yandu ain't here right now, so I'll have to whoop your butt in his place. Upon hearing Peter's challenging words, Ego's face hardened as he looked his opponent up and down. Kid, just because you could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mad titan doesn't mean you can fight me, Ego scoffed incredulously. I'm on a whole other level compared to that purple annoyance. I am a G-dash yeah, we get it. You're a god. How can I kill a god? Peter interrupted her sarcastically as he brought his hand to his chin in thought. Oh, wait. You already told us, didn't you? A slash N, Dagathwave played in my head when I wrote that. As Peter finished speaking, he waved his hand and opened a portal on the floor between them, revealing a huge brain trapped inside a cramped cave. The brain pulsed physically and luminously as it filled the cave with a dull blue light. Exclamation point. Ego's eyes widened as he stared down at his own brain. What the hell is that? Rocket shouts in both disgust and curiosity. I am Groot. Groot questioned. Is that? Quill uttered in shock. It's his brain. Gamora revealed. It's beautiful. Drax admitted in awe. Question mark. Every guardian turned to Drax in confusion. Meanwhile, Mantis looked down at her master's brain, completely shocked by the scene, though she had no idea what to do with herself. You shouldn't have given us that whole welcome introduction. Peter says with a shake of his head as Ego stood stunned across from him. I mean, come on. Who would give a whole presentation about how to kill them? I guess that your name isn't just for show. You really do have a big ego, don't you? Wait. Let's not be too hasty. Ego's earlier haughty attitude completely disappeared. I don't think it was us that were the ones being hasty, Peter says as he snapped his fingers. Sadly, I can't kill you or else my vice captain will lose his new celestial powers, so instead let's do this. Suddenly, a giant metal cube appeared above Ego's head. Hot. The Celestial grunted in confusion before the cube fell on his head. Splat. Squish. The impact of the giant cube flattened Ego's human figure in an instant, swiftly turning him into a puddle of blood and meat paste. Is he dead? Rocket asks dumbly. Nope, all that did was make him angry. Peter turned to his crew as the brain below began to wriggle and pulse in fury. I'll figure out how to deal with this, Peter points to the brain as Ego's avatar begins to reform behind him. Though this time instead of the handsome fatherly figure that he originally showed, Ego now looked quite horrifying. He wasn't able to reform his body just yet, so he appeared as a giant ghostly blue figure, like some sort of angry poltergeist. All you guys have to do is distract Quill's dad. Peter says as if it were the easiest job in the world. Meanwhile, Ego floated menacingly behind him. What? The guardians shouted. Good luck and don't die. Peter waved cheerfully as he hopped backward and fell into the portal. Errrg. Ego's deep scream shook the palace as he quickly scrambled to grab Peter. Swoosh sadly for him, the golden portal swiftly snapped itself shut as his hand crashed into the palace floor, cracking it in half with ease. No. Ego bellowed as he tried I run off to catch up to Peter but, boom, 
Just as he was about to fly out of the palace, a small object flew into his path and exploded, momentarily dispersing the blue energy of his body. Hee hee, I knew bringing those bombs would come in handy. Rocket smirked as he held another two similar explosives in hand. As he spoke, Ego began to reform yet again, though this time he took the time to create his fleshy body as well. Son, I know you are upset with me, but we can't allow your friend to meddle with my brain. I'm your father, Peter, Quill. Don't just abandon me over some past mistakes and a simple disagreement. Ego's voice sounded warped as he slowly regrew his entire body, floating only a few meters away. You killed my mother? Quill stared firmly. Soon enough, the two of us will be all there is, so why must you think like a human? You're a god. Act like it. Ego countered as the palace began to quake, showing his unending fury. And as the guardians tried to stabilize themselves through the shaking, Ego dashed over in an instant and grabbed his son by the neck, lifting him high into the air. Peter, Quill. Gamora screamed as the palace floor collapsed, sending her and the other guardians tumbling down into a dark pit. I told you. I don't want to do this alone. You cannot deny the purpose that the universe has bestowed upon us. Ego preaches as he squeezed down on Quill's neck. It doesn't need to be like this. Why are you trying to destroy our chance? Ah. Ka. Quill clawed at his father's outstretched arm as he choked for air. Stop pretending that you aren't what you are. One in billions. Trillions. Even more. What greater meaning can life possibly have to offer? Ego asked as he peered downward and found his son's Walkman strapped to his waist as usual. Your mother gave you this, didn't she? Ego asked as he snatched it off of his belt and pressed play. Musical notes Brandy, by looking glass plays musical notes my life, my love, and my lady is the sea. Ego muttered fondly before cruelly crushing the Walkman between his fingers. Exclamation point. Quills watched in horror as the only connection to his dead mother was destroyed before his very eyes. Ah! The sounds of screaming echoed in the air as Drax, Gamora, Mantis, and Rocket fell down a winding cavern. Luckily, instead of free-falling to their inevitable deaths, they instead slid down a rough spiky cavernous slide, which cut them up on the way down. After sliding for about a minute, the four of them crashed down into a cave that was thankfully illuminated by a small hole in the ceiling. Ugh. The group groaned in pain as they picked themselves up. Is everyone alright? Mantis asked worriedly as the Guardians turned to glare in her direction. Should we kill her? Rocket spoke everyone else's thoughts. No, we need her to guide us back to Quill. Drax denied as he and everyone else watched Mantis cower away from their sharp glares. W what is this place? Gamora stuttered as her horrified eyes surveyed the cave. Following her gaze, everyone's eyes widened in shock at what they found. The whole cave seemed to be filled with an uncountable number of skeletons. Some of the older ones seemed to be infused into the walls and entangled into the large roots of the planet, showing just how long they've been there. The bodies? Mantis spoke in sadness as they all turned to her. Our master's children. Instantly, Yondu's words rang out in all of their minds. I found a pit, filled with hundreds of skeletons. All of them kid-sized. I think I'm going to puke. Ascending down into the cave, Peter landed on the glowing brain with a wet squelch. You. He groaned as he lifted his shoe, dragging along a thick layer of mucus that was now stuck to the bottom of the sole. Luckily my suit cleans itself, or else I would have to scrub this off myself. Ignoring the brain buggers under his boots, Peter eyed the target below him as he pondered to himself. How should I do this? Peter thought as he needed a way to either get Ego under control, trap him, or kill him whilst keeping the brain intact and alive. After all, unlike the movie, Peter wants Quill to keep his powers after all of this. And since he's only half celestial, Quill can't produce his own celestial energy or light, as Ego would call it, so he has to piggyback off of his father's energy. Let's try that first, Peter muttered after a moment of thought. Thrusting both hands forward, Peter gripped the air as golden spell circles appeared in both hands. Usually, he could do his spells without any sort of exaggerated movements, but this spell would take a bit more effort than the rest. Each spell circle seemed to grow and twist as Peter turned his wrists in opposing directions. Hopefully this works, Peter muttered as he slammed both glowing hands down on the brain below. You. It's in between my fingers, Peter winced as he felt Ego's brain mucus stick itself to his once clean hands. Meanwhile, the cave below lit up in a golden light as countless spell lines drew themselves along the huge brain and onto the hard rocky walls in its surroundings. I am Groot? Peter could hear a small voice from his shoulder. Peter nearly jumped as he turned to see Groot sitting on his shoulder. Have you been here the whole time? Exclamation point. Quill watched in horror as the only connection to his deceased mother was destroyed before his very eyes. As the broken bits and pieces of his Walkman fell from Ego's hand and disappeared down the large hole that swallowed up the Guardians only moments ago, Quill's eyelids began to droop downward as he found himself getting lightheaded. Up to this moment, Ego hasn't released or eased his grip on his son's neck, so the lack of oxygen was seriously starting to become a real problem. And just as Quill was about to pass out, a voice shouted from the entrance of the palace. Hey, there, jackass. Instantly, the sound of heavy gunfire filled the area as a hail of energy bolts of all sizes and colors shot across the room. 
Ego turned just in time for the barrage of gunfire to collide with his body, tearing it apart and revealing the blue ghostly figure underneath once again. And soon enough, the rain of blaster bolts collided with his outstretched arm, tearing it off and releasing Quill, who immediately plummeted down toward the dark hole below whilst simultaneously gasping for air. Whistle a whistling sound filled the air as a blue figure flew across the spacious hall, hanging by the glowing arrow in his hand. I got ya. Yandu said reassuringly as he caught Quill with his free hand and slowly descended back toward his men, who never stopped shooting at Ego. Haha. <laughs> After realizing what happened and catching his breath, Quill couldn't stop himself from laughing. What? Yandu asked in confusion as he held his arrow above his head. You look like Mary Poppins? Quill commented jokingly. Is he cool? Yandu asked hopefully. Quill couldn't help but smirk, as he found Yandu's cluelessness both funny and endearing at the same time. Hell yeah, he's cool. He nodded with a warm smile. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. Yandu yelled proudly. A slash N, I had to add that. It's one of my favorite scenes in MCU. You guys figure out why Ego wants you here? Yandu asks as they land near the other Ravagers, who still haven't ceased firing at Quill's father. Meanwhile, Ego was constantly growing his body back whilst taking what seemed like an unending amount of damage. If they planned to buy some time, then it was working, but sadly, they wouldn't be doing much else. Something about my genetic connection to this light thing. He basically wants to destroy the universe, Quill says with an unknowing shrug. He mind-controlled me for a minute and showed me how to control it. So, could you? Yandu asked curiously. A little? Quill says as he held out his hand and squinted his eyes as if he were constipated. Suddenly, a small ball of light appeared in his hand. A ball? Yandu didn't look very impressed. Does it explode or something? Quill dejectedly shook his head back and forth. I thought as hard as I could. It was all that I could come up with. This is only my second time. He reasoned. You thought? You think when I make this arrow fly, I use my head? Yandu whistled and showed off his glowing arrow, which circled around his body. Arg! Enough! Ego screamed in rage as vines grew out from under the group of ravagers. Exclamation point! The ravagers panicked as sharp thorn-covered vines wrapped around their legs and dug into their skin. Aya! I don't use my head to fly the arrow, boy! I use my heart! Yandu explained further as he let out a loud whistle. Instantly, the arrow shot from his hand and rushed toward his men before tearing through the vines, freeing them in a matter of seconds. I don't want to do this, but it's time to take the kid gloves off. Ego spoke as he reformed his flesh body and slowly floated forward. Let's start with him. Ego turned to Yandu before pointing a single finger forward. Instantly, a blue energy formed at the tip of his pointer finger before launching forward in a long beam of light. No. Quill screamed as the beam impacted Yandu's chest, drilling a hole straight through his body and out the other end. Quill froze in shock as the blue beam died down and Yandu fell backward onto the cracked palace floor, gushing blood. Remember. Yandu croaked out as he coughed up a mouthful of blood. I use my heart. Complete and utter silence filled the palace entry hall as Quill stared in shock at his adoptive father's bleeding body. You shouldn't have killed my mom and squished my Walkman. Quill turned to his biological father with a venomous glare. But before Ego could reply, his son shot into the air as a blue ethereal energy covered his entire body. Rushing forward, Quill collided with his celestial father and grabbed hold of him, bashing his back into multiple pillars. As they flew together, Quill's hand morphed into a thick metal fist, which he then used to hammer his father in the face over and over again. Arg! After taking one too many hits to the face, Ego finally retaliated, launching Quill away and into the ceiling with a powerful kick. Boom! Quill's body smashed into the roof before luckily coming to a stop, though he didn't stay still for long. After a hate-filled stare-down between father and son, the two shot toward one another, both summoning materials to their body as they did so. Ego simply called brown rocks to himself, which covered his entire body in an earthy set of armor. Meanwhile, Quill, on the other hand, summoned yellow pieces which all came together like Legos to build a giant 3D Pac-Man. And when the two finally collided, Quill's Pac-Man snapped its mouth shut on his father, breaking the rock armor with ease. After Ego's armor exploded, sending him tumbling to the palace floor, the yellow Pac-Man crumbled away, revealing an exhausted Peter Quill. Heavy breathing, Quill descended to the ground tiredly as he stood over his father's beaten body. Suddenly, Ego's eyes shot open as he started to panic out of nowhere. What's happening? He shouted like a madman as he scrambled to his feet. I don't. We need to stop it. Stop. Stop. Listen to me. Don't let him do it. Quill watched in shock as his father's body began to crumble like sand. No. Ego bellowed one last time as his form collapsed into a pile of mushy sand. Not even the blue ghostly figure of his father was left behind. Although he had some questions, Quill quickly remembered something as he turned and rushed across the rubble-filled hall. Yandu. Quill yelled in worry as he rushed toward his adoptive father. No. No. As he dropped to his knees at Yandu's side, he couldn't tear his eyes away from the gaping hole in his chest, which was leaking blood like crazy. Opposite to Quill's, who was on the verge of tears, Yandu smiled upward. What are you crying for, boy? Quit being a sissy. He spoke weakly. Shut up, you idiot. 
Quill lashed out as he quickly pulled off his coat and covered Yandu's wound. That ain't gonna do much? Yandu laughed lightly as he turned his head to see the pile that once was Ego. You know, he may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. I'm sorry I didn't do none of it right? I'm damn lucky you're my boy. No. Quill screamed as tears fell from his eyes. He watched as the light slowly draining from Yandu's eyes could do nothing about it. No. No. Quill screamed and cried as he applied pressure to the wound. What the hell are you screaming about? A voice spoke from behind. Turning around, Quill watched as Peter casually stepped out of a golden portal with Groot on his shoulder as usual. Captain. Yandu uttered, though it was getting hard for him to speak at this point. Yandu. He. Quill tried to speak but the words wouldn't leave his mouth. Huh? Oh. Don't worry. I got this. Peter said without worry as he waved his hand. Suddenly, a golden spell circle appeared above Yandu's bloody body. There, all better. Peter shrugged as his newest crew member started to heal at a visible pace. Quill watched in awe as signs of life returned to his daddy's face. Thank you. Quill sniffled as he wiped his tears away. No problem, Peter said as he rested a hand on his vice captain's shoulder. What kind of captain would I be if I let my men die so easily? After all, you have a long life of grunt work ahead of you, is that him? Peter asks as he points over to the pile of pale mushy sand. Yeah, I beat his butt, and then he started screaming random nonsense. Quill turns away from Yandu for a moment and looks his captain in the eyes. I'm guessing that was your doing? Yup. Peter nods. What did you do? Quill asks. Hmm, before we get to that, can you still use celestial energy? Peter asked curiously. Ah, uh, Quill grunted as he held his hand out. Instantly, a faint blue light flowed between his fingers before forming into a mini transformer, which seemed to move on its own. Optimus Prime, to be exact. Autobots roll out. The small Optimus exclaimed before crumbling into bits, falling through Quill's fingers like bits of sand. Good, Megatron is cooler, but we all can't have good taste. Peter shook his head in disapproval. What? How could you possibly think Dash Quill started to argue, but his captain interrupts. Come with me, Peter waved his hand, conjuring a golden portal. Wait. Quill shouted as he glanced back at Yondu, who passed out moments after the spell began healing him. What about him? His men can keep watch, Peter says as he glances at the nearby Ravagers. You can leave Yondu to us, Captain. One of the bigger Ravagers with the face of a deformed ball sack excitedly stepped up. No doubt hoping to curry favor with their new captain. What's that guy's name again? Laserhead? No, that's not it. Peter wondered. Good, just keep watch until we get back, and don't touch anything. Peter ordered as he and Quill walked through the portal, leaving them behind for the time being. Why are we here? Quill asks as the portal snaps shut behind them. In front of them was Ego's glowing blue brain, though that wasn't what drew Quill's attention at the moment. What the hell is that? He asked in awe as he eyed the golden engravings, which lined the entire cave and even crawled up onto Ego's brain as well. I don't remember this being here earlier. That's because it wasn't. Peter shook his head. Since flat out killing your father would make you lose your power, I had to get a little creative. You did this? What does it do? He asks curiously. It's a combination of a few spells that I've learned over the years. Basically, I took a normal mind wipe spell, which could barely erase about a day's worth of memories from someone's mind, and overcharged it to a crazy degree with the help of a few other spells. Peter explains plainly. Quill stared dumbly between Peter and the golden spell that filled the entire cave. You're really a magician, aren't you? Are you just starting to realize that? Peter laughed. So, what? My dad's pretty much a vegetable now, right? Quill asks as he eyes the giant wriggling brain. Yup. Peter nodded. Then why is the spell still here? If the job is done, shouldn't it be gone? Quill asks further. Well, since your dad is a celestial, I decided to be cautious and keep it active, Peter explains further in depth. Right now his mind is completely blank, but as time passes a new consciousness could be born and I'd rather not have to deal with that. So, the spell is just gonna keep wiping his mind over and over? Quill guessed the rest. Bingo. Peter nods as he gives his vice captain a thumbs up. This way, he's all but dead, and you get to keep your powers. It's a win-win scenario. I was thinking of transferring your consciousness into your dad's brain, but doing so would trap you on this planet just like him. He was trapped here? Quill asks in confusion. Did you not pay attention to anything Ego said? Peter sighed in exasperation. He may have been able to leave this planet, but he always had to come back to recharge himself, or else his human form would wither and die. You, on the other hand, most likely won't have that weakness, though you probably won't be as powerful when you're off-planet. Cool. Quill stared down at his hands, which began to glow in a blue light. I wonder if I could use these powers to bring my mom back. Peter couldn't help but frown as he heard his vice captain whisper to himself. I'm sorry, but that's not something you would be able to do. Peter shook his head sadly. How do you know? Quill asks a bit defensively. If my dad could make a body for himself, can't I just find her grave and fix her body? Starting her heart shouldn't be too hard either. Yes, you can do that, but you'd be defacing the grave of your mother for nothing, Peter explained vaguely. What do you mean by that? 
Quill asked pointedly. Let me show you, Peter says as he steps up to Quill and thrusts his palm forward. What the dash Quill's eyes widened in shock as he tried to dodge, but he was far too slow. Before he could even move an inch, Peter's palm slammed into Quill's chest, roughly knocking him backward. Hey, what the hell was that for? Quill shouted as he glared in his captain's direction. Look down, dumbass, Peter says as he points to the ground. Question mark, Quill reluctantly peered downward. What the hell? On the floor was Quill's sleeping body, which fell in an odd position, leaving his face smashed against the floor and his but held high in the air. That is your physical body? Peter explained as he summoned a mirror in front of Quill. And that is your astral body, where your soul and consciousness are kept! Exclamation point. Quill's eyes began to panic as he stared at his transparent form. Why you killed me? I'm a ghost. How could you kill me? I haven't even asked Gamora on a proper date yet. She barely wants to be with me as a living guy. How the hell am I supposed to win her over as a damn ghost? Seriously, Peter didn't know whether he should laugh or feel annoyed. You aren't a ghost. I'm just trying to show you something. Relax? Really? Quill's idiotic whining disappeared as he floated over to Peter with hope-filled eyes. I'm not dead. No, now shut up and listen. Peter said in annoyance. The reason that you can't revive your mother is simple. When any living being dies, their astral body leaves their physical body. You can reforge your mother's physical body, but that's it. She won't have her astral body. And the astral body is where her soul and consciousness are. Quill seemed to understand after a moment of thought. Yes, she would be nothing but an empty husk. Peter made sure he understood. Where's her astral body? Quill asks with a determined look in his eyes. Peter couldn't help but reluctantly respect his vice captain's love for his mother. He would do anything to bring her back, yet Peter hasn't even thought of his parents. Meh, I never knew them and I'm a transmigrator. It's not the same, Peter shrugged uncaringly. That is a question that goes far over my pay grade. I don't even think my teacher would know something like that, and she's the most powerful sorcerer in this universe. At least, that I know of, Peter had no clue. Quill frowned sadly before floating back into his body and picking himself up off the floor. And as he rose to his feet, Peter caught a glimpse of determination returned to his eyes. Well, as a demigod, I'll make it my mission to figure that out. He says as he turns his attention to the brain in the room. My mother didn't deserve to die like that. If my father wasn't such a genocidal maniac, then she would still be alive today. Yeah, but you wouldn't be born either, Peter says with a shrug. Nor would we have met and formed the Guardians. Not to mention Gamora. Who knows what would have happened to her without you. Sometimes you have to look at the bright side of life, but Dash Quill tries to interject, but Peter continued. I'm not saying that you can't try to revive your mom. If that's what you want to do, then I'll support you as your captain, but I'm telling you right now that the odds are heavily stacked against you. Peter didn't sugarcoat his words. Quill remained silent for a moment before staring Peter square in the eyes. That's fine. Nothing worth doing is ever easy, is it? No. No, it's not. Peter nodded as he smiled under his mask. Maybe I can revive her with the Infinity Stones, though I would have to be careful not to mess up the timeline. Of course, Peter didn't have all of the stones yet, so this wouldn't be happening anytime soon. As for the timeline, he didn't want to revive Quill's mom and in doing so cause some sort of catastrophe or ruin Quill's life in some odd way. It just wouldn't be worth it. Peter could try using the Dragon Bone Elixir, as that seemed to bring people back from the dead in the Daredevil TV show, but he didn't want to risk any unknown side effects occurring. After all, Quill's mom has been dead for over 25 years. Also, Peter doesn't have enough Dragon Bones to share. At least not yet. And just as he was about to open a portal back to the palace, Peter suddenly remembered something. Wait, where's the rest of the crew? He asked, as he didn't remember seeing them earlier. Oh, shit. Where the hell are we? Rocket muttered as he and everyone else followed Mantis through the winding cave system. It's just this way. I think. Mantis directed them with a lost look on her face. After getting the whole gang back together, which took a few minutes as half the team somehow got themselves lost in a labyrinth of caves, the Guardian set up base in the palace. Of course, Quill used his newfound powers to fix what was destroyed during the battle, though it took him a bit to get everything right. When everything was settled, Peter invited Mantis to a meeting with the crew. Quill, Gamora, Drax, Groot, Rocket, and Yondu, who was now fully healed, were all in attendance. As for the Ravagers, they don't count as members of the crew. They're more like grunts, as they technically fall under Yondu's command. What's she doing here? Rocket asked as he and everyone else besides Drax glared in her direction. Didn't Drax have a thing for her in the movie? Peter wondered if his crew would be filled with couples in the future. Gamora and Quill. Mantis and Drax. Now I just have to find a furry companion for Rocket and another plant for Groot. Peter thought in amusement. I. Mantis stuttered as she cowered away from the many harsh stares. I invited her. Peter smiled warmly in Mantis' direction, though nobody could see it. She has a few words to say. Mantis froze as all eyes pierced into her. Well, get on with it, girl. We ain't got all day. Yandu spoke impatiently. 
He wouldn't give any assistance to the follower of the man that tricked him into breaking the Ravager's code and almost killed him. I want to apologize for not telling you of Ego's plans. Mantis built up the courage to speak. I won't make any excuses. There were a few times when I could have spoken up and I didn't. I'm terribly sorry for that. As someone who is used to serving others, Mantis gave a deep bow to show her sincerity. That ain't good enough, Yandu said uncaringly as he let out a whistle. Instantly, his glowing arrow unholstered itself and flew forward, hovering menacingly over Mantis' exposed neck. I agree, let's just kill her and be done with it. Rocket spoke up in agreement. Let's not be too hasty. Peter cut in as Yandu's arrow disappeared and reappeared in between his hand. Twirling the glowing arrow between his fingers, Peter could see the tears welling up in Mantis' eyes. How would you like to join the Guardians of the Galaxy? Peter asks as the room descended into chaos. Everyone besides Drax and Groot, who was snacking on chips in the corner without a care for what was going on, vehemently disagreed with Peter's invitation. I refuse to split our profits with another person. Especially one that tried to kill us. Rocket yelled as he stood on his chair for some added height. Most of the crew voiced their agreement as well. The Guardians may be heroes, but money is always their top priority. Then I'll take her as my subordinate. Drax spoke loudly, silencing the crew's complaints. Mantis' large eyes widened even further as she heard his declaration. I knew this would happen. Peter smirked under his mask. What? What the hell could you possibly need her for? Quill asked incredulously. It better not be for anything perverted. Gamora glared menacingly in Drax's direction. It's none of your business? Drax glared back. Before chaos could descend once again, Peter spoke up. Good, this solves everything. Peter nodded in approval. Similarly to Yondu and the Ravager, Mantis will fall under Drax, making her a member of the crew without receiving the split that we all enjoy. I will gladly serve Master Drax. Mantis blushed as she spoke. Drax calmly nodded in agreement, though Peter could see a small unnoticeable tint on his cheeks as well. Love is in the air? Peter thought as some more objections were shouted, though Peter simply waved them off. Welcome to the Guardians of the Galaxy, Mantis. Thank you for having me, Captain. Mantis bowed once again before taking her place at her new master's side. I never knew Drax had this kind of fetish. Peter felt as though he found a kindred spirit. Once everything calmed down, the crew was about to leave, but Peter said something that caused Quill to turn a challenging glaring in his direction. What did you say? Quill asked as his glare intensified. I said, I'm thinking of taking this planet as a vacation spot. Why? Do you have a problem with that? Peter stared back. The greed of both the captain and vice captain clashed at that moment. It is a beautiful planet after all. Let me get this straight. Quill stood up from his seat and looked down at Peter. You want to take the planet that my father owned? The same one that I need for my celestial powers? You do understand how messed up that is, right? Peter looked away and cleared his throat. How about we come to a middle ground? Although Peter felt a bit embarrassed to keep pushing for this, he had a dream that needed to be fulfilled. And that dream was vacationing in the summer with MJ and Lily, enjoying the sights by day and spending some mommy-daddy alone time at night. The whole crew looked in Peter's direction in amusement. After all, they understood his greed fairly well. Especially Rocket. I don't know why you're fighting over this. Rocket said as he stepped forward and joined the two of them with a smirk on his face. Because, obviously, this planet already belongs to me. I am Groot. Groot spoke up in support of his furry friend. Exclamation point. Instantly, the room was filled with yelling as everyone wanted a piece of the beautiful pie that was Ego's planet. Soon enough, the yelling came to an end, and a negotiation was had. Okay, let me lay this out so that everyone is on the same page. Peter drew everyone's attention to himself. The planet will be the property of the Guardians of the Galaxy to use at their own discretion. As long as nobody breaks the few rules that we set in place, he explains as everyone nods in agreement. Furthermore, Quill will be the sole owner of the planet's core, as that is the source of his powers. Though, everything else is split equally between all of us. If you want to build a house or a palace, then go for it. Just follow the rules, Peter said, receiving satisfied nods from everyone in the room. As for the rules, they had to be put in place to stop a certain raccoon. I don't get why we can't sell this rock. Rocket spoke up with an annoyed look on his face. Can't you at least let me open a mine? I saw some brood silver in the caves earlier. That stuff is worth a fortune, you know? And who knows what other priceless stuff we could find? At first, Rocket wanted to sell the planet for a quick buck, or at least his portion of it. Of course, his idea was quickly shut down and now he wants to harvest the planet's resources, which wasn't such a bad idea. Sure, if you can figure out a way to mine the planet without destroying it, ruining its scenery, or delving into the core, then you can mine all you want. Peter nods as Rocket smirks greedily. Though, since the planet is the property of the whole crew, you would be splitting your profits with the rest of us, Rocket's greedy smirk instantly disappeared as all seven guardians seemed to steal his smile away for themselves. Wait, we can talk about this. Rocket tried to speak though everything was already decided. Each guardian gave him some encouraging words as they got up and walked off. That was a good suggestion, Rocket? Peter nodded. Work hard. Quill gave him a thumbs up. 
Your contribution to the team is appreciated, my friend, Drax said as Mantis followed him out. Thanks, Rocket. I've been meaning to order a few knives so this helps me out. Gamora joined in on the fun. Thanks for the free money, rat, Yandu laughed. There ain't no way I'm sharing my profits with you, lazy freeloaders. Rocket screamed as the room cleared, leaving only him and Groot behind. I am Groot. Groot said as he climbed up and patted his friend on the shoulder in sympathy. Once everything was settled on Ego, which was now the official name for the planet headquarters for the Guardians of the Galaxy, Peter left the Guardians and returned to Earth for the time being. Although Ego was a crazy egomaniacal maniac, who wanted to pretty much destroy the universe, he was still Quill's father and the architect behind the entire planet so they kept the name out of respect. Before leaving, Peter made sure to do two things. First, he and Quill took a day to go to the pit where his siblings were dumped. Of course, they planned to turn the haunted-looking pit into a proper burial site. Quill was a bit emotional throughout the whole process, but at least he was hellbent on giving his family a proper grave. Which was something his father should have done, especially since he was the one to kill them. Flashback, that should do it, Peter said as the two of them stood in the center of a lush field with a huge pillar-like gravestone stood before them. Do you want to say a few words? Quill remained silent for a moment before speaking up. I have to admit, I was a little shocked to find out about you guys. I mean, I always wanted siblings, and I'm sure alien siblings would have been even better. I can't help but feel like I missed out. After speaking for a bit, Quill fell silent once again and stared at the gravestone in a trance. He wanted to say more but sadly couldn't find the words to sum up everything that he was feeling. Peter, on the other hand, stayed for about an hour before giving his vice captain some alone time. Quill would have probably stayed there the whole night if not for Gamora, who forced him to return to the palace so that he could get some much needed rest. Though the two of them seemed to disappear into the same bedroom I guess Quill needed some comfort. Peter thought in amusement. Flashback and as for the second thing he had to do, flashback on the day that Peter was leaving, he met with Quill and handed him a small black box. What is this? He asked as he held the box to his ear and shook it, like a child trying to decipher his Christmas presents. Open it and find out? Peter smiles under his mask. Question mark. Quill curiously lifted the lid and found a sleek handheld device inside. What is this? Mobile phone it's an iPod. Peter says as he reaches over and turns it on. See this. Tapping the touch screen a few times, Peter scrolled through a long list of songs and played one of his favorites. Musical Notes What is Love, by Hathaway plays musical notes. What is love? Oh baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. What is love? Oh baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Whoa, whoa, oh whoa, whoa, oh. Quill's eyes widened as he heard music that's never graced his ears before, though he knew one thing for sure. This was from Earth. I heard that your dad destroyed your Walkman, so I picked this up for you, Peter said as he enjoyed the awestruck look on his vice captain's face. It has all of your favorite 80s songs, but I thought that you might want to update your playlist, so I added some of my favorites as well. As Peter spoke, he reached over and swiped the screen, skipping to another song. Musical Notes Short Change Hero, by The Heavy Plays Musical Notes Oh, this is such a good song. Peter muttered. This ain't no place for no hero this ain't no place for no better man this ain't no place for no hero to call home. I made sure to give you music from all sorts of genres across the many years that you've missed. From Frank Sinatra to Tupac, you have it all? Holy shit. Quill muttered as his eyes began to water. I don't know what to say. A normal thank you is more than enough? Peter shrugged as Quill rushed forward and wrapped his arms around his captain. Thank you. Quill said wholeheartedly. You're welcome. Peter nods as they separate. You know, I'm really jealous right now. Huh? Why? Quill asked in confusion. You get to experience all of the best music I know for the first time. If I could erase my memories, I would spend weeks just listening to the songs on that iPod. Peter said nostalgically. After all, it's so hard to find good music these days. Most of the songs on the radio are just factory-made pop garbage. Quill couldn't help but laugh as Peter sounded like a grumpy old man. A slash N, back in my day old man, flashback end. After handing over his gift, Peter said his goodbyes and portaled off. Stepping out through the portal, Peter arrived in his penthouse, which looked much different than before. All of the equipment that he used to make Lily was gone and replaced with all sorts of ornate furniture and decorations. The place looked like some sort of Arabian palace. What the? Peter muttered as he caught sight of a blue figure across the room. He's behind you. Turn around. Jeannie yelled at the TV as he watched some random horror film. I see that you've made yourself at home. Peter walked over and spoke. Ah. Jeannie jumped out of the couch in fright and smacked into the ceiling. Seriously? Peter asked incredulously. A master? Jeannie asked as he fell back down onto the couch. Yo. After talking with Jeannie for a bit, Peter got straight to business. There's a reason that he came here before heading home, and that's to evolve for a second time. Whose blood do you think I should use? Peter asked as he stared down at the many vials in his collection. Even Ego's blood was an option now. Nightcrawler. Jeannie spoke up for his brother in blue. Peter swiftly ignored him and reached over to a vial labeled in green. 
Hulk, after all, the only thing that Thanos can beat him in is strength, so solving that issue was of the utmost importance. Though even the Hulk couldn't overpower Thanos in the movies, Peter thought with a shrug. Still, increasing his strength was a must nonetheless. Isn't that a bit too risky? Genie asks worriedly. Isn't the Hulk supposed to be the incarnation of anger or something? Nah, the wishes should protect me. What I'm worried about is the pain and the damage to the surroundings. Peter says as he loads up a syringe. The reason that he didn't inject multiple vials the last time he evolved was simple. The pain was excruciating. So, Peter planned to space out each evolution so that he doesn't go insane. Maybe if I can find a good numbing agent or ability, then I can do this more often. Peter thought as he waved his hand and opened a portal to the mirror dimension. Stepping inside, he turned back to Genie for a moment. You want to watch? Peter asked. Sure, one second. Genie nods as he morphed into the form of a balding scientist with a lab coat and clipboard. Let's proceed with the procedure. Shaking his head, Peter moved further into the mirror dimensions, followed by his eccentric assistant. And as the portal snapped shut, Peter reluctantly stabbed the syringe into his arm. I really should have added some sort of stipulation to my wishes that nullified pain. He muttered as he pressed the plunger, injecting one of his most powerful blood samples in an instant. Same as last time, the pain didn't start immediately. Instead, Peter felt the tingling, which still plagued his every waking moment, ramp up as his entire body vibrated with power. And here it comes? Peter muttered in apprehension as his teeth ground together. Ugh. The familiar body-shaking pain racked his body, sending him thrashing to the cold hard ground of the mirror dimension. Ayaha. He screamed in agony. Though it didn't end there. Peter's entire body seemed to wriggle and pulse as every fiber of his being begun to expand. Arms, legs, torso, everything expanded into a giant Hulk-like appearance. Shit. Peter screamed in a morphed tone as he felt everything. Thankfully, the spider suit that the Ancient One made for him didn't rip. In fact, it expanded perfectly, making it look like the Hulk stole Spider-Man's clothes. Hey, pal. Genie spoke worriedly as he floated over to his master. Are you alright? Oh you. Peter bellowed in rage as he swiped his hand forward. And with all of the power of the Hulk, he slapped Genie away like a fly, sending him soaring across the dimension. As Genie was slapped across the mirror dimension, Peter lost consciousness and found himself in a dark space. Where am I? He spoke curiously as he wandered across the pitch black void. Of course, he could remember everything clearly. Injecting the blood. The excruciating pain. Feeling his entire body expands into a giant Hulk-like monster. He even remembered backhanding Genie, but nothing after that. After walking for what felt like hours, Peter found nothing whatsoever. He seemed to be in a flat black space with nothing in the surroundings but a smooth unbreakable floor. Not even his enhanced senses could find anything but open space. This has to be my subconscious mind? Peter guessed as he brought his hand to his chin and thought. But where are my memories? It shouldn't be this empty and dark. Although Peter wasn't exactly sure, as he never entered his subconscious mind like this, it was his best guess at the moment. Suddenly, deep angry breaths filled his surroundings. It sounded like an enraged dragon was huffing and puffing. Question mark. Peter spun around and found nothing. But just as he thought that the sound was gone, a hot steaming breath tickled the back of his neck. Whipping his head around, Peter turned just in time for a red fist to impact his left cheek. Ugh. He grunted in pain as he flew across the black space. Of course, this wasn't his first fight. Peter twisted his body in midair and landed perfectly on his feet, surveying the area as he waited for his attacker to show himself once again. And when the dragon-like breathing filled his surroundings once again, Peter was shocked to realize that he couldn't sense its position. Though he should have known that since his spider senses didn't save him from that attack earlier. Show yourself, coward. Peter called out into the void. After those words left Peter's mouth, a deep growl could be heard as an intense heat emanated toward his back. Dashing to the side, Peter narrowly dodged another giant red fist. And now he could finally see his attacker. A giant red hulk with glowing yellow eyes stood across from him. Insert picture of red hulk here, you aren't green. Peter commented in interest. Shut up. The red hulk screamed like an angry child before rushing forward. Hey, let's just calm down, okay? Peter tried to settle this peacefully as he dipped under yet another punch. Though his opponent didn't give up. Instead, he flailed around like an aggressive little boy, trying to land a hit in any way possible. Stay still. Red Hulk screamed in annoyance as Peter sidestepped his fist. You won't be able to beat me like this, Peter commented as he kicked off of the ground and sent a knee into his attacker's face. Ugh. Red Hulk grunted as he tumbled backward. Sizzle. <laughs> Looking down, Peter found his clothed knee burning from the impact. Your face is really hot. Do you have a fever? Raph. The Red Hulk roared as his yellow eyes brightened. Peter watched curiously as power seemed to fill his adversary's eyes before two beams of fiery yellow light shot out in his direction. Interesting. Peter muttered as he waved his hand and formed a spell circle between himself and the attack. As soon as the fiery laser beams struck the spell, his magic jumped right into action, absorbing the attack with ease. Yeah, that's gamma radiation. 
Peter muttered as he deployed a separate spell in order to identify the energy. Ah? Huh? Red Hulk grunted in confusion as he found his attack doing absolutely nothing to his opponent. That's a pretty cool ability. Why don't I try it next? Peter said as he reached into the spell and pulled out the collected gamma radiation. Hee hee, I have a good idea. Cupping both hands over the yellow gamma radiation, Peter spread his feet farther apart and brought the energy to his side. Came, Haim, H.A. Peter spoke the noble words of Master Rashi as he swung both hands forward and shot out a thick yellow pillar of gamma radiation. Instantly, Peter's pillar and Red Hulk's two eye beams collided and fought for dominance. The collision of the two powerful attacks brightened the dark space with a blinding yellow light. Of course, Peter could have done this whole attack without the movements and the words, but where was the fun in that? Aya. Red Hulk screamed in anger as his eyes grew brighter, which in turn increased the power of his attack. Question mark. Peter watched in interest as his Kamehameha was overpowered. Though thankfully the absorption spell was still up, saving him the trouble of dodging. Do you produce more gamma radiation when you're angry? Now that he said that, Peter could feel that the heat had increased by a large margin since they first started fighting. He could even see the waves of visible heat radiating off of the Red Hulk's body from all angles. <laughs> Peter hummed as the Red Hulk gave up on his attack, as it seemed pointless. Want to fight again? Raph. His opponent roared for the hundredth time before leaping forward. Let's see if you can heal like the Hulk as well. Peter wondered as he pulled on the remaining gamma radiation. Pointing his finger up to the red figure above, a yellow light gathered at the tip of his fingernail before firing in a bright beam. Red Hulk seemed calm as the beam impacted his chest and disappeared into his body. The attack didn't leave a single mark either. Energy absorption too, Peter commented as he felt the surroundings grow hotter once again. Not only that, but his opponent's eyes brightened as well. You have some cool powers, my friend, Peter says as he takes a few steps back. And just in time, Red Hulk comes smashing down where Peter once stood. Not friends. He yelled childishly. Whatever you say, pal. Peter shrugged as he planned to slowly win his inner Hulk over. Now let's check your healing ability. Snapping his fingers, Peter called forth a portal, which opened and deposited a long black spear into his hand. And without further ado, Peter kicked off the ground and launched forward. Red Hulk's eyes widened at his enemy's speed as Peter dipped under his guard and sliced at his right knee. Ah! Corvus Glaive Spear managed to cut Red Hulk's tough skin like a hot knife through butter, severing his leg from the knee down. Peter stepped back as his legless opponent fell where he stood, screaming in agony. After all, this was probably the first time he received such a severe wound. Though it didn't last very long. Huh? That's way faster than Wolverine's healing factor. Peter commented as Red Hulk's entire leg grew back in a matter of seconds. Peter and Wolverine could regrow parts of their limbs, like this, but the amount of time that would take was astronomically longer than this. From the bones, tendons, muscles, etc., everything morphed and grew until a brand new leg was formed, leaving Peter astounded. Can Hulk even heal this fast? Peter wondered as he never got to test the Hulk, since Banner is too afraid to do anything. Question mark. Even Red Hulk was left shocked by his own healing factor. Though that shock soon turned to anger, which was swiftly projected straight at Peter. What? You started this fight. Don't come crying to me. If you didn't want to get hurt, then don't attack others without good reason. Peter lectures the giant red child like a pro. After all, he had practice with Lily. Of course, Peter's words didn't have the effect that he was hoping for. Exclamation point. Red Hulk stomped to his feet and immediately closed in on his enemy. Die. Okay, I think that's enough for now. Peter muttered as he sidestepped a hot red fist before leaping up and tapping two glowing fingers on the giant manchild's forehead. Sleep. Instantly, Red Hulk's eyelids dropped downward and closed shut as he toppled over and snored into a peaceful sleep. I'll either need a meditation or sealing technique to deal with you. Peter muttered to himself as he stared down at the colossal figure. Hopefully, the meditation route works. I'd rather not seal what's basically a child away. That would be sad. Suddenly, Peter's vision blurred and shifted. And once he could finally see clearly again Peter found himself laying in a pile of rubble somewhere inside the mirror dimension. You finally decided to wake up? A familiar voice called out. Lifting himself to his feet, Peter turned to see a heavily bruised and bandaged genie held up weakly by two crutches. What happened while I was out? Peter asked as a genie clone appeared, dressed as a cop. Question mark. Is this the guy? Policeman genie asked his wounded self. Yes, officer. Genie answered his own question in a pitiful tone. Sir. Policeman genie pulls out a pair of handcuffs as he steps forward. You're under arrest for assault and battery. Please lay flat on the ground with your hands behind your head. Once genie was done impersonating a peace officer, Peter dropped him off at the penthouse and portaled over to Kamartaj. Although he has a very well-protected mind, thanks to the technique that the Ancient One imparted onto him, as well as a few extra spells, that only protected him from outside intrusions and manipulation. And since Red Hulk is a part of him, Peter needs a way to connect with his new alter ego while also protecting himself. In the movie, Banner was able to achieve this through simple meditation. He came to an understanding with his Hulk, and soon enough, they merged into one being. This merger seemed to give Banner the best of both worlds. 
He kept his genius mind, whilst also keeping the strength of the Hulk. Though Peter didn't want to do this. At least not in the same way as Banner. I'd rather not turn into a red-skinned giant with glowing yellow eyes. Peter thought with a shake of his head. The public would call me a demon. After all, he had a life outside of being Spider-Man, and the transformation that came with a merger would certainly ruin that. Of course, that didn't mean a merger was off the table. Peter has to simply find the best way for him to achieve his goals. Is the Ancient One around? Peter asked an elderly master as he portaled into Kamartage. No, the Sorceress Supreme left to deal with an issue in a small hell dimension. Can I help you with anything? The man answers respectfully. After all, Peter's position in Kamartage is very high thanks to being their leader's only disciple. Thanks, but I'll be fine. Peter gave a quick bow and walked off toward the library. Although his position is technically higher than just about everyone else, it's always best to show respect. Especially when you could be dealing with an ancient master. After all, there are ways to extend your lifespan when it comes to the mystic arts, so there are masters in the temple who are far older than they appear. Seeing as he couldn't ask the Ancient One for advice, Peter ransacked the library of Kamartage for a good meditation technique. Heaven's Breath, Primordial Body and Mind, Earth Evolution, Wandering Lotus Meditation. Peter poured through book after book, trying to find what would suit his situation best. And while this was happening, the old librarian kept a watchful eye. The last time Peter came to the library, he lied and used the Ancient One's name to take books from the Forbidden section. Now the poor librarian is forced to suspiciously surveil his every move. Thankfully, meditation techniques aren't something that are considered dangerous, so Peter didn't have to steal anything this time. Oh, he muttered as he read through an old, worn leather book. This could work. Sun and Moon Scripture, this meditation technique was made by a master named Lin Feng, who seemed to have dissociative identity disorder. Apparently, he went through some sort of crazy trauma as a child, though the book didn't mention any details. And due to this huge trauma, his mind fractured. In order to cope with this, multiple personalities were formed, which plagued his everyday life. In one moment, he could be studying in his library, and the next, he wakes up completely naked in an alleyway. Basically, his other personalities would take control of his body and do whatever they wished. Tired of the constant craziness, Lin Feng went on a trip in search of a cure and found Kamartage, similar to Dr. Strange's origin story. And after becoming a master, he was able to create his own meditation technique. The Sun and Moon Scripture. It sounds very wuxia, but it should work, Peter thought to himself. Using the Sun and Moon Scripture, Peter would, hopefully, be able to melt his mind with the Red Hulks and become one, while keeping control and leaving the two bodies separated. At least until he could find a way to assimilate the Red Hulk's body into his own without becoming a giant monster for the rest of his life. Of course, the Red Hulk wouldn't be dying in this scenario. They would simply merge. After all, Red Hulk is merely the personification of Peter's anger. He was already a part of him from the very beginning. In the end, he would simply return to where he originated from. I should practice this every night before bed, Peter thought to himself as he checked the book out under the librarian's watchful eyes. It should take about a month to finish the merger? Of course, Peter would make sure to be diligent in his meditation. Because even now he can feel the simmering anger of his alter ego waiting to be released. If he were to become too angry, Red Hulk would surely use that opportunity to take control and wreak havoc. Though it wouldn't last long, as Peter could easily put him to sleep again. The only reason he took his time before was that his physical body was inside the mirror dimension. There, Red Hulk could go as crazy as he wanted without harming anyone. Well, except Genie though he was faking those injuries from the start. Thank you. Peter called out over his shoulder as he portaled out of the library with his new book in hand. Stepping into his bedroom, Peter found Lily sitting at his desk with his ghost laptop wide open. She seemed to be trying to turn it on, but no matter what she did, the screen wouldn't light up. Ahem. Peter cleared his throat as he loomed over his daughter's shoulder. Ah. Lily squeaked as she leaped up off the chair and stuck to the ceiling using her spider powers. Dad. Lily peered down at her father, who instantly swapped his clothes to a normal outfit, revealing his face. I clearly remember telling you that my laptop was off limits, Peter says as he reaches out and closes it. And I also remember saying that you should regulate the use of your powers. If others see, then maintaining a normal life will be hard. Sorry, daddy. Lily pouts as she falls from the ceiling and lands perfectly on her feet. The daddies always come out when you're in trouble, don't they? Peter chuckled as he leaned down and gave her a warm hug. So, why did you need to access my laptop? As they separate, Peter places the sun and moon scripture on a nearby bookshelf for the time being. You weren't here and I needed to call you, Lily answered with a smile. Well, I'm here now. What's up? Peter asks as he takes a seat on the corner of his bed. I made my decision. Lily spoke excitedly. I want to help you with your work. Peter raised a brow as his daughter declared her decision. Are you sure? Your grandmas didn't seem too happy about that. Peter said as he knew they would complain. Yes, they talked to me about it, but in the end, it's my decision to make, not theirs. Lily crossed her arms and huffed obstinately. Well, if it's what you want then that's fine. Peter nodded as he whipped out his phone, dialed a number, and put it on speaker. 
Lily looked confused as she waited to see what her father was doing. Yes, Black Sky, a male voice answered respectfully. Scythe, have you found my dragon bones yet? Peter asks. Lily seemed to perk up in excitement as she heard the word dragon. Based on her knowledge, dragons and other mythical creatures never existed. Yes, but getting to them is the problem. Either we waste time and do things slowly, or we can destroy Hell's Kitchen and take them quickly. Scythe explains. Okay, I understand, Peter says as he looks over at Lily. I'm placing my daughter in charge of the excavation. The hand will follow her orders as if they came from me. Is that understood? Oh of course, Black Sky. We would gladly follow the princess. Scythe stuttered in shock as he never knew that his leader had a daughter, but he complied nonetheless. Good, she'll call you soon enough, Peter said as he hung up and looked toward Lily. What was that about? She asks in confusion. I didn't know that I was a princess. That was the hand? Peter says as he explained everything. You'll be starting off with them since I don't have the time to micromanage everything. Of course, Lily wouldn't be leaving the house, as she's far too young to be out on her own. But that doesn't mean that she can't order them around from the safety of her bedroom. After all, she's an AI. The sky is the limit. Okay, should I start now? Lily asks excitedly. Ninjas and dragons? What kid wouldn't be excited? Peter shook his head. First, you need a code name. It's not that Peter didn't trust Scythe, as the man has faithfully served him for a while without any trouble, but keeping Lily's identity a secret is very important to him. Otherwise, her grannies would kill me. Peter didn't want to deal with angry grandmas. Exclamation point. Lily started hopping up and down in excitement. Do I get a cool suit like you and mom? Maybe later but for now we need a name. Peter said as Lily started thinking to herself. Princess is fine. Lily admitted with red cheeks. I always wanted to be a princess and they already called me that. Sure, princess it is. After explaining the ground rules to Lily and telling her how he wanted things to go with the hand, Peter gave her Scythe's number and she excitedly ran off to her bedroom. Ninjas and dragons awaited her. When Peter walked out into the hall, May, Grace, and MJ were laying in wait for him. While MJ didn't seem bothered, the same could not be said for her the two grannies. May and Grace frowned in his direction, very clearly making their feelings on the situation known. Did you have fun eavesdropping? Peter smirked as he leaned on the door frame. Their glares only seemed to intensify, though May was a lot less angry than Grace. I don't agree with this, but Lily made her choice so we won't complain. May sighed as Grace remained silent. I just hope she's ready. You know, I never said you guys couldn't watch over her. Peter says as their eyes widen in realization. After all, Lily isn't allowed out of the house for this, so you guys can help her all you want. At least in the beginning. This isn't as bad as you think it is. Silence filled the hall as MJ smirked alongside Peter. Right. Grace muttered as she turned around and made her way to Lily's room. We'll just check to see how she's doing. May smiled as she followed behind her fellow grandma, leaving Peter and MJ alone in the hall. Hello, beautiful. Peter wrapped his arms around her waist. Hello, handsome. MJ mimicked him as she peered up into his eyes. Since everyone else is so busy, why don't we spend some alone time together? And I can tell you all about the new vacation spot that I found for us. Peter whispers. I'm all ears dash MJ tried to answer but Peter sweeped her off her feet. Sorry, but I'm a bit impatient today. He says as he carries her into the room and closes the door with his foot. In Lily's bedroom. I just sent you the blueprints of the area where the dragon bones are supposedly located, did you get them? Lily lay snugly on her bed as she kicked her legs in the air. Yes, princess. Scythe's voice could be heard from the phone, which sat on the bed in front of her. It was extremely easy for Lily to hack into the city's public records and download the blueprints. And as Lily spoke, the blueprints appeared on the screen, though she didn't even touch the thing. Glancing at them for a second, Lily swiftly made some changes. Illustrations alongside all sorts of plans and instructions appeared. Yet she still hasn't touched her phone a single time. Good, I just edited the blueprints, do you see it? Lily asked again. Yes, but something like this would take a lot of manpower and equipment. We won't be able to hide it for long. Scythe raises his concerns. That's okay, Lily said as her phone changed again. This time, it flashed between all sorts of government websites and databases before finally returning to normal. You should have some emails from the New York Department of Construction, Engineering, and Urban Planning. There should also be one from the city clerk's officer as well, Lily says as Scythe goes silent for a moment. Em, how do you know my email? He asked in fear. As far as he knew, even the black sky himself didn't know his email. Don't ask silly questions. Do you have them? Lily asks again. Yes. Scythe answers as he reads through the emails. How did you dash, that's not important. Lily cuts him off. You have the digital permit to begin construction and the physical one will arrive by courier in a few days. The address is the same one that I marked on the blueprints. It's an abandoned building. I just took $13.7 million from one of the hand's bank accounts and purchased the property, as well as the neighboring properties. Did you receive everything? It should be in your email. Why you? How? Scythe was speechless at this point. At first, he was immensely impressed by the Black Sky's daughter. 
She was able to grasp the situation and build out a plan through the blueprints, which she seemed to acquire herself. But then things got crazy. Forget about knowing his email, just the fact that she could hack into the government so easily and even take money from the hand's bank account as if she were simply picking flowers was mind-boggling. Both impressive and scary. You really like to ask stupid questions, don't you? Lily huffs into the phone. And my apologies, princess. Scythe quickly apologized. He soon realized that the apple didn't fall far from the tree. If there was one man in the world that inspired fear in him, then it was the black sky. Yet another contender has appeared. Hee <laughs> hee. Lily giggled as she enjoyed being treated like royalty. But as soon as Scythe heard that laugh, he broke out into a cold sweat. Scary. They're both monsters. He thought. Okay, that's it for today. Lily says as she picks up her phone and rolls onto her back. I want construction to start by tomorrow. Only members of the hand can be used for this. Yes, princess. Scythe replies dutifully. Oh, and I also want everyone working on this to strap their phones to their chest. That includes you, Lily adds. Why? Scythe asks in confusion. So I can watch, silly. Lily says as she hangs up the phone. Knock knock, Lily, can we come in? Hand base, New York. Scythe stared at his phone in silent fear. Can she see me right now? It's safe to say that although Lily didn't mean to do so, she made one hell of an impression on the leader of the hand. When dealing with cold-blooded assassins, it's always best to make them fear you to a certain extent. Peter did it and now his daughter followed in his footsteps. Though she didn't even know it. After spending the day with MJ, leaving her passed out on his bed, Peter whipped out the sun and moon scripture and got to work. The notes left behind by Lin Fong said that he used the technique once a night for a single hour before bed. And so Peter cracked the book open and followed its instructions. Unlike your average lazy meditation, where Peter would be sitting in a certain position whilst controlling his breathing in one way or another, this one was all about body movement. Meditation, controlled breathing, and erratic yet gentle movements were the key parts of the sun and moon scripture. After reading everything, Peter was ready to begin. Though once he finally got started, it didn't take long to realize that his room wasn't big enough for this. Instead, he would have to use the basement. The backyard was an option as well, but Peter didn't want to risk his neighbors seeing and labeling him as a crazy person. Descending into the basement, Peter didn't waste any more time. And when he finally started practicing, Peter thanked whatever god was out there that he didn't use the backyard. Insert the worst dance moves that you can find here, although Peter knew that the movements would be odd, to say the least, he didn't think that it would be this bad. I just have to power through and do it, Peter thought to himself. It's only a month. After that, I never have to do this again. The next morning, Peter woke up ready to get some work done. He made a promise a while ago and was ready to make good on it. The Guardians of the Galaxy distracted him for long enough. Donning his spider suit and portaling into his office in the Avengers Tower, Peter was instantly greeted by Jarvis as usual. Welcome back, sir. It's good to be back, Jarvis, Peter says as he takes a seat at his desk. I need you to do two things for me. I'm happy to be of assistance, Jarvis replies dutifully. Good, Peter nods as he leans back. First, I need you to call a council meeting. If anyone asks why, tell them it has to do with Emil Blonsky. I'm contacting each councilman now. Please continue, Jarvis said readily. I want you to call Dr. Banner to my office. We'll have to wait for everyone to get here, so I'll have a talk with him in the meantime, Peter orders. One moment, Jarvis says as he goes quiet for a minute. Dr. Banner is on his way. Will that be all, sir? Yes, thank you for your hard work as always, Peter says. It's a pleasure, sir, Jarvis responded in a happy tone. Did Tony upgrade him recently? Peter thought as he never heard Jarvis change his tone like that before. Is he trying to compete with Lily? Knock knock, come in. Peter calls out as Banner came walking in with dark rings around his eyes. What the hell happened? You look like Rocket? Who's Rocket? Banner asks as he tiredly dropped into a seat across from Peter. That doesn't matter. Why haven't you been sleeping? Peter asks as the signs of sleep deprivation were clear as day. You look exhausted. I've been in the lab for a few days. Banner answers with a yawn. And are you any closer to getting rid of your big green friend? Peter asks as a frown forms on the doctor's face. No. Banner admitted. Have you tried meditation? Peter asks as Banner rolls his eyes. I'll take that as a no. Even now he refused to take the hints that Peter gives him. No offense, but I highly doubt something like this can be fixed by meditation. What's next? Should I buy shungite or wrap tinfoil around my head? Peter sighed in exasperation as he heard this. Fine, how about this? I'll give you two options. Peter held up two fingers. One, you can try to meditate as I've been telling you, or two, I can extract the Hulk from you myself. Why you can do that? Banner stuttered in shock. Not now, but I can whip something up. Peter shrugged. Either Kamartaj would have something or he would make his own spell. Isn't it dangerous to let it out? Banner asked in fear. The Avengers can easily subdue the Hulk. Peter answered with yet another shrug. And even if they couldn't, I can handle him alone. I. Banner turned quiet as this was an important choice to make. I'll do it. The meditation or the extraction. 
Peter asks for clarification. Extraction. After promising Banner that he would contact him soon about the extraction, Peter left for the council room, where his fellow councilmen were waiting for his arrival. Yo! Peter called out as he strolled in. You guys got here fast. Whenever I called a meeting in the past, it usually took at least two hours to get everyone together. Not even an hour has passed, yet you're all here, says the one who's late, Tony said jokingly. I know, is today opposite day? Peter asked as he checked the date on his phone. Tony is on time and I'm late. It has to be some sort of miracle? Okay, enough messing around, Professor X sighed in annoyance. I have work to do, so can we get on with this meeting, please? Oh, relax, Charles, Magneto cut into the conversation. You're far too uptight, my friend. A little small talk before business won't kill you. Charles merely glared in his helmeted friend's direction. Well, now that the small talk is over, let's get this meeting over with. Fury seemed to be on the professor's side. I have a few international incidents in the making to deal with so. Everyone turned to Peter, who shrugged as he took a seat at the head of the conference table. Then I won't waste any more time, he said as the nearby TV lit up, showing an image of Blonsky as well as his abomination form. I called this meeting to discuss the release and subsequent recruitment of Emil Blonsky. Both Charles and Eric didn't expect this at all. Meanwhile, Peter already hinted at this with Fury and Tony, so they weren't nearly as surprised by the proposal. Have you gone mad? The professor asked genuinely. This is a man that can level an entire city block in a matter of seconds. Allowing him any sort of freedom is a huge risk. I must agree with Charles on this one. Although his power would be a huge boon to us, the risks far outweigh anything else. Eric spoke in agreement with his friend, which was odd as they usually disagreed. It's safe to say that the metahumans in the council weren't on board. Tony and Fury didn't look convinced either, though they remained silent, knowing that Peter would have more to say. I knew that there would be some doubts and pushback, so I prepared this. Peter nods understandingly as a video appears on the television. A very professional-looking woman with glasses appeared. She sat at a desk with a file labeled Blonsky in hand. Are we recording? She asks whoever is behind the camera. Yes, Peter's voice replied. Now, can you please give me your honest and unfiltered opinion? Is your patient, Emil Blonsky, fit to be released? As a psychologist, I can attest to the fact that Emil Blonsky underwent a successful therapy and rehabilitation process. Blonsky's treatment was designed to address his underlying psychological issues, such as his impulse control, aggression, and tendency to act and react violently, which were extremely exasperated by his transformation. Through a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy, anger management techniques, and medication, Blonsky was able to gain insight into the root causes of his anger and learn how to manage it more effectively. He was also taught coping mechanisms to help him avoid violent outbursts and control his aggression. As a result of this therapy and rehabilitation, Blonsky has demonstrated significant progress in managing his anger and controlling his aggressive impulses. He has also shown a strong desire to make amends for his past actions and contribute positively to society. Therefore, with appropriate monitoring and support, I believe that Blonsky is ready to be released from custody and recruited into the Avengers. His unique abilities and combat experience would be valuable assets to the team, and his willingness to work towards positive change is a testament to his commitment to redemption. She finished and set the file down as the video came to an end. Are there any questions? Peter asks the room. If we were to agree and set Blonsky free, how would we keep track of him? The man is a highly trained military specialist. The normal ankle monitor and surveillance detail isn't going to cut it. Fury was the first to speak. I agree, which is why I would place a tracking spell on him. And since he doesn't practice the mystic arts, he can never get rid of it. Peter answers easily. Simply tracking him won't be enough. Someone would have to watch his every move. Magneto seemed to be in agreement now. Yes, which is why we should build a team that can take turns accompanying Blonsky wherever he goes. At least until he's earned some trust. This team can also be in charge of his basic training as well, Peter said. After all, everyone has to go through basic training. Even highly skilled soldiers are no exception. The room seemed to turn silent as everyone processed the situation. Though it didn't last very long. I still disagree. Professor X spoke his mind. Although you may be right about his rehabilitation, Blonsky has killed an uncountable number of people. If he was a normal man, he would have been put to trial and sentenced to multiple life sentences. We shouldn't give him special treatment just because his strength would be useful to us. Silence filled the room once again. The professor's words seemed to strike a chord with everyone, leaving them contemplative about the whole situation. While I do agree with Charles to a certain extent, Peter spoke up after a moment of silence. His view is a bit too idealistic. No offense, professor. None taken. Charles frowned as he motioned for Peter to continue. We live in a world that could be attacked by alien empires at any moment, or even destroyed by members of our own growing enhanced population. Peter shrugs as he looks around the room. Although we've been doing fine so far, I don't think that we should grow complacent. There will come a time when we need more power than we currently have. So we should just recruit murders then? Charles wasn't convinced. 
Though the other seemed to resonate with Peter's words. Rehabilitated murderers who are willing to work to redeem themselves? Yes, Peter answered resolutely. After arguing for a bit longer, it was finally time to decide. Let's put it to a vote. Peter sighed as he leaned back in his chair. All those in favor of recruiting Emil Blonsky please raise your hand. Detainment floor, high security section. What's taking him so long? Blonsky asked himself for the millionth time as he paced back and forth in his cell. Spider-Man promised to get him released over a month ago, yet he hasn't seen or heard from him since. Can you shut up already? His neighbor spoke up from across the hallway. You aren't getting out. Get over it. Bucky, who is still imprisoned for his own safety, was forced to listen to the man whine and complain day and night. That's easy for you to say? Blonsky glared in his neighbor's direction. At least you have visitors. Hell, they even let you leave your cell every now and then. Meanwhile, I've been stuck here for more than three years. Bucky sighed and simply looked the other way. Hey, are you ignoring me? Blonsky called out. Bucky remained silent. Sigh. Why did I think having company would be fun? Blonsky muttered as he flopped down on his bed. Suddenly, the high security doors down the hall swung open and footsteps could be heard coming their way. Blonsky instantly shot out of bed and rushed up to the glass cell wall. Don't get your hopes up. It's probably Steve Dash Bucky spoke though he was cut off. Yo. Peter waved as he strolled up the hall. Long time no see. Behind him stood three people. Wolverine, Hawkeye, and Nightcrawler. I is this it? Blonsky asks with emotion clear in his voice. Am I being released? Yup. Peter nods as Blonsky smiles with tears forming in his eyes. But there are some stipulations. Sure, anything. Blonsky agreed without care. He was just too excited to experience freedom once again. Walking over to the control panel, Peter opens Blonsky's cell. First is this. Peter waves his hand as a golden spell circle forms. Bucky and Blonsky watch in shock and awe at the magic happening before their very eyes. After the spell forms, it shrinks into the size of a pin before shooting into Blonsky's chest. Exclamation point. Blonsky held his chest, expecting to feel pain, yet everything seemed fine. What was that? A tracker? Peter answers simply. I see. Anything else? Blonsky asks. Yes. Peter nods as he motioned to the Avengers behind him. These will be your monitors. Wherever you go, they go. In shifts, of course, okay, Blonsky started to realize that his new freedom wouldn't be as free as he thought. Good, that's all, Peter says as he steps aside, allowing Blonsky out of the cell. You'll be staying in an apartment in the tower. Clint can show you the way. With bated breath, Blonsky stepped out of his cell for the first time in a over three years. Oh yeah, Blonsky, Peter calls out as he was leaving. Yeah, he peered over his shoulder, hoping that this wasn't some cruel joke. Welcome to the Avengers, while Peter was knee-deep in the controversial council meeting, MJ was off to school as usual. Do you have your lunch? She asked Lily as they drive toward her school. Yeah, do you have yours? Lily asks in return. Yup. MJ muttered as she peeked over at Lily. Moments like this are why it's so weird being a teen mom. After all, packing a school lunch for yourself and your child is an odd feeling, to say the least. Is it? I think it's cool. Lily spoke her mind. Having an old mom would be much worse. You think so? MJ asks as her face blooms into a warm smile. Truthfully, MJ loved being Lily's mother, but always felt like she wasn't good enough since she's so young. Though, that didn't seem to be a problem for Lily. Yeah. Lily nods resolutely. She didn't know that her random, inconsequential words may have helped her mother overcome a complex that was building up for a while now. After having their heartwarming moment in the car, MJ dropped Lily off and rushed to her own school. But as soon as she entered the building, her name was called over the loudspeaker. Michelle Jones. Please report to the main office. I repeat, Michelle Jones. Please report to the main office, question mark. MJ raised a questioning brow as everyone in the hall turned to look at her, wondering if she was in some sort of trouble. Inside the principal's office, MJ sat across from an older woman in a professional blue suit. You aren't in trouble, MJ, the principal clarifies. Then what's this about? MJ asks. You're dating Peter Parker, right? She asks. And instantly, MJ knew what this was about. This is about him skipping school, isn't it? MJ asks as the principal smiles awkwardly. Yes, Peter is very gifted. Our staff understands this and allows him a lot of freedoms, but he has to attend at least 30 more days of school if he wants to become a senior next year. The principal clearly states. You would hold him back even if he aces all of the tests? MJ asks incredulously. Yes, but it's not my choice. We all know that Peter will pass any test given to him, but the state has ruled that a student must meet a certain requirement for attendance. The principal explains as she pushes over a sheet of paper. And sadly, Peter has barely shown up to school at all this year. On the paper was a calendar, marking each day that Peter attended school. I didn't think it was this bad. MJ muttered as she eyed the almost empty calendar. But it can be fixed as long as Peter starts showing up for, at least, a month of school. After that, he's free to skip all he wants. The principal shrugged uncaringly. 
MJ felt odd about this whole situation. After all, the leading figure of their school just gave Peter explicit permission to ditch school as much as he wanted. Lucky bastard. MJ thought to herself as she left the office. After Peter left the council room upon winning the vote for Blonsky's freedom, Charles didn't look very happy and quickly made that known to the other councilmen as well. You shouldn't have allowed this, he said before anyone could leave. The vote was 4 to 1 with the professor being the only one to vote against it. Oh, relax, Tony spoke up in their defense. It's a bit risky but there are enough failsafe in place. And if the psychologist is wrong about his rehabilitation, then Blonsky will be back in a cell before you know it. You say that, but who will be hurt or killed in the process? Charles counters as he stands from his chair and marches out of the room. Well, this has been fun, but I have a trafficker in Romania to hunt, Magneto says as he leaves as well. When everyone was gone, Tony made his way to his workshop, where he was greeted by a very emotional AI W welcome, sir. Woo! Jarvis cried loudly through the speakers. Huh? What happened? Tony jumped into action and rushed to his computer. Why you implemented the emotional update this morning, woo? And I saw a video. Jarvis cries couldn't stop. Okay, what kind of video? Tony asked as his hands flew across the keyboard, searching for what was wrong in Jarvis' code. The puppy died. Jarvis shouted as his emotions continued to stir. Jarvis, I need you to calm down okay? Why don't you search for happy videos? Can you do that? Tony asked as Jarvis wailed. How the hell did Peter make Lily without a single problem? Why yes, sir. After the drama-filled Avengers Council meeting, Fury returned to his office where Steve and Peggy awaited his arrival. You're back. Fury seemed surprised to see them. That was quick. Did you find anything in France? Yes, two Hydra bases. Steve nods. Both have been destroyed and every agent found was either captured or killed. Peggy reports their success. The guys in interrogation are working on the survivors as we speak. So we'll probably have a new target soon enough. Fury sighs as he took a seat at his desk. What's with you? Steve asks. I just sat through a council meeting. Fury reveals. I'm sorry to hear that. Peggy says in understanding. After all, any sort of meeting between people in power will always drag on for far longer than necessary. Eh, it's fine. I just wish that Charles would have agreed sooner. Fury said as he leaned back in his chair. Agreed to what? Steve asks. Well, Fury gives a brief explanation. Maybe we should give Bucky a chance to be free as well? Steve says thoughtfully. He could help us with our Hydra hunting? From my understanding, Bucky is only locked up because he's a danger to himself. If you can get his psychologist to sign off on his release, then no one can stop it. Fury shrugged. After all, Bucky would make a good Avenger or S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Either would work, though Fury would rather pull him into S.H.I.E.L.D. than anything else. Alright, we'll go talk to her. After storming out of the council room, Charles swiftly returned to his mansion, where he was greeted by children of all ages and mutations. His spacious and gated front yard was practically a playground at this point. Children played tag, hide and seek, and all sorts of made-up games under the sunny blue sky. Julia, what did I say about playing in the fountain? The professor admonished. Standing in the large fountain at the center of his lawn was a little ten-year-old girl who was completely made of water, splashing around as if she were playing in a pool. Eh sorry, professor. She apologized dejectedly. Just don't let it happen again. The new pool will be finished in a few days. You can swim as much as you want then, okay? Charles says as he walks off. After maneuvering his way through the mansion, Charles finally arrived at his office, where a young red-headed teenage girl with green eyes was waiting for him. She frowned in pain as she knit her brows together. Not only did she look to be in pain, but the dark rings around her eyes indicated a lack of sleep as well. Insert picture of Jean Grey here, Professor, I still can't control it. Jean says as she held her aching head. I hear everything and it won't stop. I haven't been able to sleep at all either. Let me see. Charles says as he walks over and lays a hand on her head, invading her mind. With permission, of course. This was a very regular thing for them. Before Jean was even enrolled in the school, Charles recognized her limitless potential as an Omega-level mutant. However, because most of Jean's power was tied to her unconscious mind, Charles decided to create a series of psychic barriers to isolate them from her conscious mind. These barriers need to be constantly rebuilt, as the power that he locked away in her unconscious mind would somehow degrade them, leading to situations like this. Whenever the barriers needed maintenance, Jean's telekinetic and telepathic powers would skyrocket, leaving her with zero control whatsoever. The cause for her pain at the moment were the inner voices of everyone nearby, flooding her brain with mind-aching noise. As the professor delved into his most promising student's mind, he examined his barriers as always. Though this time around he found something odd. Behind the almost transparent barriers stood a huge flaming bird, staring down at him menacingly. The fire that danced around its form seemed to be slowly but surely burning his carefully placed barriers. The malice and heat that emanated from the trapped bird sent shivers down the professor's spine. What is that? He thought in fear. Acting quickly before the barriers were fully destroyed, Charles rushed to erect new barriers and put extra care to make them much thicker than before. 
and as the new barriers appeared, the flaming bird disappeared as if it was never there in the first place. Are you done, professor? My headache is gone. Jean's words broke Charles from his shocked stupor. Ejecting himself from her mind, he put on a false smile as he watched her yawn tiredly. Yes, I'm finished. Why don't you take the day off and get some sleep? He offers. Really? I don't have to go to class. Jean tilts her head in question. No, I'll let your teachers know. Charles says as Jean nods and runs off to get some sleep. Thanks, professor. She yelled as she left the room. And as soon as she was gone, the smile fell from her teacher's face, leaving nothing but worry and fear in its place. Maybe I should speak to Eric about this? What? Peter nearly spits out his food as he sat at the dining room table. Since he's been busy up until now, May insisted that they have a big family dinner together to celebrate his return. Sat across from Peter was Fury and at each side of the table sat May, Grace, MJ, and Lily. Ever since Fury was allowed in on Peter's secret identity, as well as the fact that he has a granddaughter, he visits a whole lot more than he used to. Especially since S.H.I.E.L.D. has been swallowed up and digested into the Avengers. With him in full control, Fury has been able to delegate more duties to the trusted agents in his inner circle, leaving him a lot more time to spend with his family. Which now included Peter, though the bald spymaster would never admit it. I said, you have to go to school. MJ sighed as she stabbed at her food with a fork. The principal said that you'll be held back next year if you don't start showing up to school. Your attendance sheet is practically empty. As MJ finished explaining the whole situation, May turned to Peter with a fiery glare. I thought you said they didn't care about you skipping and that you would be fine as long as you passed all of the tests. May asked as her stare drilled into Peter's soul. Seeing the drama unfold, Fury sat back and enjoyed the show. Dinner and entertainment. This is the life. He thought as he savored every bite of his food. Just like her grandpa, Lily's eyes shined in amusement as she shoveled yummy food into her face. Is daddy in trouble? She thought with her cheeks full. Well, I didn't take the government into account. Peter scratched his cheek and turned the other way, avoiding the angry eyes of his aunt. I'll figure something out dash no. May refused vehemently. You won't weasel your way out of this. Besides, you've been away for long enough. You'll go to school for the rest of the year like everyone else. The principal said he only needs to attend 30 more days. MJ tried to help Peter, though May wasn't having it. His aunt turned to stare Peter square in the eyes. Someday, you'll look back and regret working so much. You're still a teenager. Go to school, have some fun, take your girlfriend on a date. Upon hearing that last part, MJ's cheeks turned a slight tint of red. I agree, when is the last time you and MJ actually went out together? Grace spoke up for her daughter. Well dash excluding Spider-Man and Silk-related things. Grace added. Um, it's been a while? Peter hesitantly admits. Meanwhile, Fury wasn't enjoying the drama as much as before. How the hell did this turn from him being in trouble to him taking my daughter out on a date? He thought as he gnashed his teeth on a piece of steak. Peter, you're a teenager. Enjoy it. We understand that the world needs Spider-Man, but you need to learn how to balance yourself. May give some sagely advice. Okay, I get it. Peter gives up arguing. I'll go to school and try to do more teenager stuff. Peter thinks to himself for a moment before turning to MJ. Starting tomorrow we'll go to school together and on Friday I'll take you on a date. Peter announces with a smirk. He enjoyed the embarrassed look on MJ's face. She's so cute, Peter thought. Oh, I want to go on a date too, Lily declared as she raised her hand. Everyone smiled at her adorable naivety. Well, except for two people. Never, I won't allow it. Fury declared righteously. Your grandpa is right? Peter nodded in agreement. Ask us again when you're 30 and we'll think about it? The women in the room stared at the two men in exasperation. Though most of all, they were surprised to see Peter and Fury agreeing with one another. Usually, they're doing their best to annoy each other. Once dinner came to an end, Peter portaled over to the library of Camartage, where he searched for any books related to his promise to Banner. And whilst he was searching, he thought over the conversation that he had at the dinner table. Technically, the Guardians don't need me right now, so I can just leave Quill in charge for the time being, Peter thought as he moved between bookshelves. As for being a teenager, I'll just try to spend more time with Ned and MJ. After all, he didn't disagree with May's words. Ever since the Avengers were established, Peter has devoted a large amount of his time to hero work, which isn't a bad thing per se I'll just try to enjoy my time in between work a bit more. Peter shrugged as he carried four books up to the librarian, who continued to watch him like a hawk. Arcane Mind Splitting, Siamese Body Separation, Hoover's, Study of Personality, Davio Power Segregation, the title of each book pretty much spoke for itself. Peter couldn't find anything that could separate Banner and the Hulk, so he had to find books that would help him build a spell of his own. Of course, he could have found something in the Forbidden section, but this damn old man won't take his eyes off of me, Peter thought as he checked out the books and returned home. Maybe I should try using the Reality Stone to trick him next time. After a night of studying and meditation, Peter was woken up the next morning by a mischievous gremlin. Hee <laughs> hee. Lily crept into the room with a wide smile on her face. 
Locking onto her target, she leapt into the air and flipped like an expert gymnast. Good morning. Lily exclaimed happily as she tucked her knees into her chest and fell straight down. Question mark. Peter awoke to his spider senses blaring. What the? Ugh. Lily smashed down onto his stomach with an innocent smile on her face. But Peter knew behind that smile was an evil smirk. Peter peered up at his daughter. Who put you up to this? Sadly, Lily wasn't a snitch so she kept her mouth shut and looked the other way. Tell me and I'll take you to an amusement park this weekend? Peter gives her an enticing offer. And it seemed to work as Lily's eyes sparkled in an instant. Can we ride a roller coaster? She asked hopefully. Sure, we can ride them all. Peter smirked like the devil offering a deal. It was Grandma Grace? Lily surveys the area cautiously and whispers. Nice doing business with you. He smirked as he formulated his revenge plan. Just as Lily was about to leave, Peter spoke up. Lily, how would like to earn yourself a new bike? Peter's devilish smirk returned. I'm listening. Lily turned back with an interested look in her eyes. Okay, here's what you have to do. Aha. Uh -huh. Only minutes after Peter was rudely woken up a female scream could be heard from across the house. Instantly, everyone rushed to the scene of the crime, the kitchen. My mouth is on fire, Grace exclaimed as she leaned over the sink with her tongue hanging out under the water. Sat beside the sink was a breakfast burrito, which had a lot of suspicious red sauce inside. Good work, Agent 47, Peter patted Lily on the head. Of course, since everyone in the house is an enhanced individual, they all heard his words. Why you? Grace pointed menacingly in Peter's direction. Well, we have school so we'll be on our way. Peter smiled innocently as he turned and left the kitchen. Lily grab your backpack and make sure you have your lunch. Get back here. Grace screamed though she wouldn't dare step away from the cool refreshing sink water. Peter. After dropping Lily off at her school, Peter and MJ arrived at theirs and immediately drew the eyes of every student and teacher they passed. After all, Peter was a known genius that just stopped showing up. His return would certainly cause a bit of a ruckus. Parker? What are you doing here? I thought you were in college already. Flash asked in shock as he and MJ walked into their first class. Nah, I've just been busy with other things. Peter shrugs as he and MJ take their seats. Flash silently took his seat as well. Ever since Peter knocked some sense into him and got some school fame for releasing Candy Crush, Flash hasn't been the same bully that he used to be. Though he always feels an odd nervousness when Peter's around, making the days without him at school very relaxing. But now those relaxing days were over. Of course, Peter didn't know this and truthfully had no plans to bother Flash whatsoever. Especially since the guy was his biggest fan. As long as he wasn't bullying anyone, Peter would let bygones be bygones. Peter. Ned exclaimed excitedly as he froze at the doorway. You're coming to school again? Ha! Huh? What surprised Peter were the heated glances that Ned was receiving from the girls in class. This guy gets jacked and now every girl in school is thirsty. Yeah, wanna hang out after school? Peter asked. Dude, we should go to the arcade. Ned excitedly rushed over and sat beside his best friend, oblivious to the looks he was receiving. He doesn't even know. Peter thought in amusement. MJ watched the two of them with a content smile on her face. While Peter was getting back into the swing of going to school once again, Dr. Banner was locked inside his lab, working on fixing himself as usual. I shouldn't stop my research just because he might have a fix, he thought as he read through his most recent research data. Ever since he was recruited as a scientist for the Avengers, Banner has spent the large majority of his time trying to cure himself of the Hulk. But sadly, no matter what he did or which branch of science he turned to, Banner always ran headfirst into an unbreakable and insurmountable wall. In fact, before Peter came to him with his offer, Banner was very close to giving up and asking the council if they would buy a small secluded island somewhere for him to retire. After all, he was already risking a lot by living in a densely populated city like New York. The longer that I live here, the more likely the chances that I'll turn and people will die. Banner thought even now. Hey, you alive in there? A familiar voice spoke over the speakers in the lab. Question mark. Banner turned and found the image of a very excited Tony Stark on his monitor. Yeah, what do you want? Oh, don't be like that, big guy. Tony whined at his harsh greeting. I have something cool to show you. And? Why are you calling me? Isn't this something that you would usually call your buddy Spider-Man for? Banner asked in annoyance. Usually, he wouldn't be this crabby toward Tony, but ever since his meeting with Peter, Banner has felt on edge for some unknown reason. Of course, Tony has thick skin so he wouldn't let a bit of grouchiness ruin his fun. Well, he's a bit busy right now. Tony shrugged as Peter started attending school again. So you came to me? Banner surmised. Second pick isn't so bad, right? Well, not exactly. Tony smiles awkwardly. First, I called Webhead. Then Pepper, Rhodes, Fury, Steve, Peggy, Beast. While Tony was recounting all of the other people he thought to call before him, Banner could feel his anger rising alongside his blood pressure. I'm at peace. My intentions are good and my heart is pure. Anger is like hot coal. Banner repeated Buddhist quotes in hopes to calm himself. So you're like the tenth person, I think? Tony said as he helped up all of his fingers. 
Okay, go call the 11th because I'm busy, Banner says as he taps a button, which immediately ended the call. But just as he got his anger under control, Tony appeared on his screen again. Come on, don't be like that. He whined in the most annoying tone possible. Just come over to my workshop and check this out. Or I can keep bothering you. Tony knew how to get what he wanted. Fine, just go away. I'll be there in half an hour. Banner sighs as he ends the call again without looking at the monitor. After all, he could already picture Tony's infuriating smirk without needing to actually see it. Half an hour later, a slash n, insert Spongebob meme here. Alright, I'm here. What do you want? Banner asks as he begrudgingly enters Tony's workshop. Come and take a look at this. Tony couldn't keep the smirk off of his face as he waved Banner over. In the middle of the room, stood a tall object with a tarp draped over it, hiding it for from sight. What is it? Banner asked in interest. Did you make a new suit? No, but you're close. Tony says as he grabs hold of the tarp. Let me introduce my newest invention, the Mark I labor droid. Tugging on the tarp, Tony yanks it off and reveals a fat humanoid droid underneath. Um, why is it obese? Banner couldn't hold back his question. Although the droid was very similar in shape to a human with a sleek white design, the body itself was extremely bloated. Insert picture of Baymax from Big Hero 6 here, well, I'll show you. Tony smirked as the Mark I labor droid's stomach opened, revealing a much larger space than the laws of physics would allow. Instead of the few cubic feet that it should have, the fat droid's stomach looked like it was expanded to a whopping 10 square meters. It's bigger on the inside. Banner muttered in absolute shock. A slash N, Doctor Who? Oh, really? I didn't notice. Tony pretends to be oblivious. How? Banner asked in amazement. Magic. Tony smirked as he finally realized why Peter always said that. Did Spider-Man teach you? Banner asked as he circled the droid. He had to make sure that the giant stomach wasn't a trick and to his shock and amazement, it wasn't. A little? Tony shrugged as the droid's stomach closed up. Maybe Spider-Man can actually do it. Banner just started to realize that his cure may be on its way. Because if someone like Tony, who only learned a little from Peter could defy the laws of physics, then what did that mean for his teacher? So why did you make a labor droid with storage? Are you going to sell them? Banner asks curiously after he got over his shock. First of all, it can do more than just hold things. Tony says as the labor droid shoots off of the ground and hovers thanks to its thrusters. Though that wasn't all. Next, its ten stubby fingers shout out, elongating into metal tentacle type ropes, which started entangling random objects and lifting them with ease. And no, these are all going off planet. Tony says with a greedy smirk. Why? Isn't that dangerous? Banner asked as he and everyone else on Earth now knew that aliens existed. Well, I don't think Webhead will get mad if I tell you. Tony quickly explains how he and Peter now own a planet full of alien scrap. Can I study some of it as well? Banner asks as Tony's smirk widens. He took the bait. Tony thought as he put on a thoughtful look. Well, I may be able to bring you in on this, but you'd be assisting me with my research. We can work together. Two heads are always better than one and Tony had a lot of junk to sort through. An extra set of hands would always be welcome. Sure, I don't mind. Banner shrugged uncaringly. Although working with Tony would increase the risks of the Hulk appearing, as he tends to enjoy annoying people, that may not be a problem for long. After all, his cure might just already be on its way. Why the hell is this book written in French? Peter muttered in annoyance as French is his least proficient language. In the past few days, he's read through all of the books except this one. Davio power segregation, whatever, I'll just brush up on my French and then give it a read. Peter shrugged as he placed the book back on his bookshelf. But just as he was about to open his computer and get to work, his bedroom door swung open. Dad, you should be getting ready, Lily says in a lecturing tone. For what? Peter asks in confusion. Instantly, Lily's palm found its way to her forehead. It's Friday, she says, waiting for him to realize but that realization never came. You're taking mom on a date, remember? Exclamation point. Peter's eyes widened as he shot out of his chair. Why didn't you say so earlier? I didn't think that I had to. Lily mutters in disbelief. I'm going to get ready, Peter rushes to the bathroom. Don't tell your mother that I forgot. Luckily, he already planned everything days in advance. When he was gone, MJ came walking across the hall behind Lily. Did he forget? MJ asks knowingly. I cannot confirm nor deny. Lily's words spoke for themselves. MJ sighed as she quickly picked out an outfit and left to get ready as well. Charles, what could possibly be so urgent that I needed to fly halfway across the world for? Magneto floats down onto Professor X's office balcony. Do you trust me? Charles asks seriously. Question mark. Eric froze for a moment as he felt that this was a lot more serious than he initially imagined. To a certain extent, then remove your helmet, Charles says as his old friend raises a questioning brow. I need to show you something. What is this about? Eric asks as his face hardened. You'll understand once you see it, Charles says with a shake of his head. Silence filled the balcony as Magneto stared his friend in the eyes. Fine. Begrudgingly agreeing, Eric reaches up and willingly removes his only line of defense against Charles's telepathy. 
prepare yourself. Charles warns as he projects the memory of his most recent experience in Jean Grey's mind. Eric's eyes widened as he saw the image of the menacing fiery bird. What is that? I don't know. Even though MJ wasn't exactly a girly girl, who would take hours getting ready, that didn't mean she was fast either. Leaving her boyfriend sat patiently in the living room, wearing his new all-black slim-fitting suit, waiting for her to come downstairs. Where are you taking her? Lily hopped in place as she questioned her father. I researched dating stuff last night, so I can help you make a plan if you want? Somehow, Lily seemed more excited about her parents' date than anyone else. Of course, she didn't fully understand what a date entailed until she did her research, so this was a bit new for her. No thanks. Peter smiled down at his cute daughter. I already planned everything. Peter planned this out right after he promised to take her on a date. Suddenly, the sound of heels clicking and clacking could be heard as Peter turned to see MJ walking down the stairs. Instantly, his breath was caught in his throat. She was wearing a beautiful slim black dress that hugged her curves in all the right places with her hair styled in soft waves. H hey, it looks horrible, doesn't it? MJ stutters as she adjusts the straps on her shoulders. Wow! Lily muttered as she looked at her mother in awe. Meanwhile, Peter stood in the middle of the living room like a deer in headlights. They kind of forced me to wear this. MJ grimaced uncomfortably. If it doesn't look good, then I can change. The heels aren't as bad as I thought though. I think having superpowers helped. The last time her mother forced her to wear high heels, MJ did not enjoy it one bit. Although they looked good, the heels left blisters on her feet as well as some pain in her ankles. But now all of that was gone. Having superpowers is really convenient. She thought as she walked like a pro without any pain or balance issues. You look amazing. I can't believe they got you to put that on. Peter couldn't hold back his words anymore. A little bribery and blackmail can go a long way. Grace spoke as she and May came strolling down the stairs with smirks on their faces. See? We told you. May added as MJ looked away in embarrassment. Seeing her act like this, Peter had to speak up. If you're uncomfortable, then go back and change. Although I love it, I know that you aren't into this kind of stuff, Peter said understandingly. And no, it's fine. MJ muttered as her cheeks reddened. Where are we going? She quickly changed the subject. It's a surprise, he replied with a grin. Pulling out a blindfold from his pocket, the grannies in the room squealed in excitement. Meanwhile, MJ didn't seem so thrilled. Seriously? She asked incredulously. Yes, now turn around. Peter nods as he twirls his finger at her. Sighing to herself, MJ begrudgingly complies. All right, let's go, Peter says as he opens a portal and guides MJ through. Bye, have fun. Everyone called out their farewells as the young couple disappeared into the golden portal. Okay, where are we? MJ asked as the portal snapped shut behind them. She could feel her heels digging into the ground and the sun shining on her skin. Give me a minute, Peter said as MJ could hear rustling in the surroundings. Can I take this thing off now? A few minutes passed and MJ started to get impatient. Though Peter didn't reply as he walked over and removed her blindfold. As soon as her eyes adjusted to the bright sunlight, MJ gasped in amazement. They were standing in the middle of a beautiful meadow, filled with all sorts of foreign plants and the sweet scent of alien flowers. Of course, that wasn't all. In front of them, a beautiful table had been set up with an incredible feast of exotic dishes and drinks from all over the galaxy. What is this place? She asked in awe. Ego. Peter smirked. Aren't the guardians here? MJ asked worriedly. Should we be wearing out suits? Nah, I set up a barrier to keep them out. Peter shrugged as he pulled out a chair for her. Ladies first. MJ smiled and rolled her eyes as she took a seat. What is all this? MJ asked as she eyed the alien food warily. Well, I've been off planet a lot lately, so I wanted to show you some of the food I've been eating recently. Peter explained as he took a seat beside her. Cool, what's this? MJ asked as she pointed at a bubbling golden honey-like soup. Let's try it first, Peter said as he filled her bowl. As they ate and drank, Peter and MJ talked about anything that came to mind. And since this was their first date in a while, there was this awkward energy in the air, which made them feel like it was their very first date all over again. As the night wore on and the stars began to shine above them, Peter looked at MJ and smiled. Have you ever thought about getting married? Peter asks out of nowhere. MJ's eyes instantly went wide in surprise. Hey are you asking? Huh? Peter realized how that sounded. No. I mean, in the future. Oh. MJ sighed in relief though she couldn't help but feel a bit disappointed as well. No, not really. I've thought about it a lot. Peter admits as he reaches over and pulls her into his lap. A small house in a nice neighborhood with neighbors that we hate. Maybe a dog or a cat or both. And possibly a few more children running around. Hearing Peter's plans for the future, which most definitely included her, MJ's face heated up as she hid in the crook of his neck. That sounds nice? She admitted in a mousy whisper. Really? Then how about we make a deal? Peter asked as MJ peeked up at him curiously. Let's switch things up, shall we? What do you mean? MJ asked in confusion. I was thinking about how I would propose to you. Peter admits unabashedly. But I've changed my mind. He doesn't want to propose to me anymore? MJ thought worriedly. 
So, instead, I'll wait for you to propose to me. Peter smirked as he leaned down and whispered into her ear. Doesn't that sound so much more appealing? MJ was stunned into silence as Peter took hold of her chin and joined their lips together. And moments later when they separated, Peter looked down into MJ, who could only nod her head in agreement before pushing forward to reunite their lips once again. When Peter awoke the next day, he smiled at the pleasant sensation of a warm body pressed up against him. Turning his head, he found his beautiful girlfriend sleeping peacefully with her head on his chest and her arms and legs entangled around him. But before he could bask in the situation for much longer, the door swung open with a bang, revealing three figures on the other side. Two of them smirked knowingly in Peter's direction, whilst the smallest of them simply looked curious. Hot, MJ stirred as she turns to see what was going on. Good, you're awake. Grace smirked mischievously as she eyed her daughter. Breakfast is ready. Wash up and come down before it gets cold. We'll be waiting for the details. Ahem, I mean we'll be waiting downstairs. May cleared her throat and walked off alongside her fellow grandma. I really hate them sometimes. MJ mutters sleepily as Peter nods along in agreement. Are we still going to the amusement park? Lily asks from the door with an expectant look. Yeah, just give us a minute, Peter says as he closed the door with a wave of his hand. After all, they were both very naked right now, which is something that Lily definitely shouldn't see. After an annoying breakfast, where the older women in the house were interrogating Peter and MJ about their date, it was finally time for Lily's day out. And of course, everyone wanted to tag along, filling the car to the brim for their little trip. Even Ned ended up tagging along. Finally, they arrived at the amusement park, and Lily's eyes lit up with wonder as she saw the rides and attractions all around her. Peter's heart warmed as he watched his daughter's face light up with joy. They spent the entire day riding roller coasters, eating bad carnival food, and playing all sorts of games. Peter even won a stuffed Spider-Man stuffy for Lily, which made her day even more special. These damn companies keep using my image for their toys. Peter complained inwardly as Lily ran around happily. On the drive home, Lily couldn't stop talking about how much fun she had, which made the whole trip worthwhile. As an AI, Lily has been maturing quickly, making moments like this very important for her. When they finally arrived home, Peter tucked Lily into bed and returned to the living room, where the rest of his family was sitting around, chatting. As he stood there watching them, he couldn't help but feel a sense of peace and contentment. It's nice to take things easy every once in a while. Standing alone in his basement, Peter huffed and puffed for air, with sweat covering his entire body. I did it. Peter thought as his body began to change. He felt a strange sensation building up inside him, growing stronger and more intense by the second. Suddenly, Peter felt a surge of energy rushing through his body, and he fell to the ground, writhing in pain. He could feel his muscles bulging and stretching, as if they were trying to break out of his skin. He clenched his teeth, trying to control the transformation, but it was far too powerful to resist. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, it was over. Peter looked up, feeling different, changed. With a simple though, he created a mirror and raised his brow at what he saw. He was the Red Hulk. He looked at his body, which was now covered in thick, red muscle. His muscles were truly massive, bulging with raw power. He flexed his fingers, feeling the strength and dexterity of his new form. Peter couldn't help but smile. He had always admired the Hulk, and now he had become one, without the anger issues and dual personalities, of course. He felt invincible, unstoppable even. He couldn't wait to put his new powers to the test, to see what he was truly capable of. But for now, he needed to figure out how to control this transformation, to make sure he didn't accidentally hurt anyone in the process. Peter took a deep breath, trying to focus his thoughts and emotions. He closed his eyes and concentrated, willing himself to change back to his normal form. And after a few moments, he felt the energy dissipate, and he opened his eyes to see himself back to the same old Peter. Hot as always, Peter thought narcissistically. He grinned again, feeling both relieved and excited. This was going to be fun after switching back and forth a few times, while making sure not to stand and cause a cave-in, in his basement, Peter seemed to get the transformation completely under control. And thankfully, unlike the Hulk, Peter's mind was calm while in his new red form. I don't feel angry at all. Peter felt relieved. Almost a month passed since Peter went on a date with MJ, and he used that time to spend with family and friends. Though that wasn't all. He also focused heavily on his meditation, which was now showing its results. Before bed, Peter performed the odd dance meditation as usual, but unlike all of the other nights, this time the results finally came in. The Red Hulk's consciousness was absorbed into Peter's mind, which at first was extremely overwhelming, hence the haggard condition he was in before transforming. Though after all of the anger and hatred of his alter ego faded away, Peter returned right back to his normal calm state. If only a little out of breath, exhausted, and sweaty. Now I can transform at will, Peter thought happily. Not only that, but he also has complete control, leaving all of his former worries about Red Hulk going crazy in his body behind. Hee <laughs> hee, now I can relax, Peter thought as he fell back and relaxed his tired body on the cold basement floor. Ugh, I'd rather sleep next to MJ. Waving his hand, Peter opened a portal underneath himself, which swiftly deposited his body into bed. 
that's more like it? He smirked and drifted off to sleep as MJ instinctively cuddled up next to him. On the next day after testing his new powers in the mirror dimension, Peter came to a complete understanding of his new abilities. Transformation, Peter will not transform into his Red Hulk form without consciously willing it, nor will any of its powers be available in Peter's normal human form. Superhuman leaping, Red Hulk's overdeveloped legs allow him to jump over vast distances. While testing, Peter was able to leap past the Earth's atmosphere. If I up my power even more, I might be able to jump to the moon. Peter thought excitedly. A slash N, bruh, just open a portal. Regenerative healing factor, Red Hulk possesses a crazy healing factor, which can heal severed limbs in an instant. Retarded aging, Red Hulk does not age because of his healing factor that regenerates his cells. Superhuman strength. Superhuman stamina. Superhuman durability. Superhuman speed. Gamma radiation emission. While in Red Hulk form, Peter can emit varying levels of gamma radiation if he chooses to do so. If he were to raise the radiation to a high enough degree, it can burn whatever he touches. And at even higher levels, it can make Peter appear as if he's cloaked in a shroud of flames. Energy absorption. Red Hulk is capable of absorbing gamma radiation. And although Peter hasn't tested it yet, he believes that any sort of energy could be absorbed with enough effort. Nice, this should be a good trump card. Peter thought as he familiarized himself with his newfound powers. At the end of the day, Peter won't be using the Red Hulk's powers very much, as it focuses on brute strength and destruction more than anything else. Which is why he plans to hide this newfound power and treat it like his ace in the hole. Especially the absorption ability. Energy absorption is just too overpowered. Peter thought happily. If he can manage to absorb other types of energies, then he'll have a very big advantage over celestials and other godlike beings. I'll suck all of them dry? Peter muttered to himself with a hungry gleam in his eyes. A slash N, I susai, after finishing his own Hulk problem, Peter donned his suit and moved on to the original Hulk next. Sat cross-legged in the mirror dimension, surrounded by a collection of ancient tomes, scrolls, and arcane artifacts, Peter kept his attention focused on the leather-bound book in his lap. My spell book is almost full, Peter thought as he eyed the pages filled with intricate diagrams and symbols. Meanwhile, Banner stood nervously to the side, watching as Peter traced his fingers along the pages of the book, muttering incantations under his breath. At first, he was shocked by the mirror dimension, but that shock was soon replaced with fear as Peter started preparing the spell that would release the Hulk upon the world. Are you sure about this? Banner asked, his voice laced with worry. Separating the Hulk from my body? It's risky. Trust me, I've got this. Besides, I can handle the Hulk in a fight. This will be a piece of cake. Peter waved his free hand dismissively. Before Banner could say anything else, Peter began drawing intricate spell circles in the air with his pointer finger. He then started drawing spell lines that connected the circles, creating a web of mystical energy that pulsed with power. Banner watched in awe as Peter moved with fluid grace, his movements seemingly choreographed by the mystical forces at play. He could feel the energy in the room shifting, a palpable hum that filled his ears and made his hair stand on end. Ready? Peter asked, his eyes locked on the book as he began reciting the final incantation. Banner braced himself and hesitantly stepped forward, where Peter had instructed beforehand. Standing a few meters in front of Peter, Banner remained still in trepidation, his heart pounding in his chest as the magnificent golden spell circles surrounded him. Instantly, he felt a surge of energy rippling through his body. The surroundings began to shake, books and artifacts rattled as spiderweb cracks began to form around the mirror dimension. The spell reached its climax, nearly shattering the mirror dimension in the process. With a final burst of energy, Peter let out a triumphant yell as the spell was complete. The air shimmered around Banner, and he felt a sudden rush of energy as the Hulk was ripped from his body. Ah! Banner and Hulk simultaneously screamed in pain. Though the Hulk easily drowned out his former companion's pitiful yell. The Hulk let out a deafening roar as it materialized in the center of the spell circles, its massive frame towering over Peter and Banner. Hey there, big guy. Peter waved welcomingly without an ounce of fear. It's good to see you again. Angered by the pain that came with the separation, Hulk charged forward, its fist slamming into the spell lines as it tried to break free. Is this the way you should be saying thank you? Peter asked in a lecturing tone as his spells shattered under the strength of the Hulk. Luckily, I was already done with them. Um, Spider-Man. Banner collapsed in exhaustion as he fearfully eyed the Hulk's towering figure. Although he felt relieved to have the Hulk gone, that relief was instantly drowned out by the presence of his greatest fear in the physical world. Like a nightmare come to life. I told you that I can handle him. Peter sighs as he waves his hand. Why don't you take a breather while I calm him down? Suddenly, a portal appeared under Banner's body, dropping him into his lab back at the tower. Peter grinned under his mask as he looked up at the Hulk. It's just you and me now, big guy. He says as the Hulk glares down at him. What do you say? Want to beat the hell out of each other? I've been needing a good sparring partner for a while now. Hulk froze for a moment before a wide grin stretched across his face, remembering his last encounter with the man before him. Hulk smash. Peter stood in the mirror dimension, his spider sense tingling as he waited for the Hulk to make the first move. 
Since he wanted to have a good spar, Peter wouldn't be using the reality stone, his Red Hulk powers, or any of his mystic arts, as that would end the fight rather quickly. Though that wasn't the only reason. He also needed to initiate a friendship between himself and the big green guy, and completely dominating him would most likely anger him more than anything else. I'll just beat his butt normally. Peter smirked under his mask, ready for a challenging fight. After all, it's been a while since anyone could give him a challenge. Thanos was a contender, but Peter tricked him with some poison before either side could go all out. Hulk smash. The Hulk yelled loudly and kicked off the ground, breaking Peter from his train of thought. Boom. The ground cracked, and a crater was formed as the Hulk leaped forward in Peter's direction. He watched the massive green figure charging at him, roaring loudly as he grew closer and closer. Acting quickly, Peter dashed out of the way, leading the Hulk crashed into a nearby building, which swiftly crumbled to the ground. Is that all you can do? Charge headfirst like an angry bull. Peter asked as the building collapsed on top of his opponent. Rhea. An ear-piercing scream filled the air as what was left of the building exploded, sending rubble flying everywhere. Of course, the Hulk came stomping out of the explosion without a single mark on his body. Are you done attacking the poor innocent buildings? I thought this was supposed to be a fight between us. Peter couldn't help but taunt his opponent. It's what he does best after all. Shut up. Hulk bellowed as he rushed forward and swung his fists like an angry child, hoping to land at least one hit. Whoa. That was close? Try again. Oh, maybe next time. Put your back into it. Are you even trying? Peter slipped in and out of every attack whilst doing his best to piss off his oversized opponent. Which probably wasn't the best idea when fighting a Hulk. After all, they tend to get more powerful when angered. Fight me, puny bug. Hulk screamed in aggravation as Peter ducked under his green meaty fist. Okay, first of all, I'm an arachnid. And second. Peter fired a web at the building behind his opponent. Don't blink. Yanking on the web in his hand, Peter shot upward and swing his leg forward, driving his knee into the Hulk's face. Arg. Hulk grunted in pain as he was launched backward and crashed into a nearby skyscraper. Boom and just like the last one, Hulk's huge figure caused the towering building to collapse in on itself, burying the big green beast for a second time. I'm glad that I remembered to use the mirror dimension for this, or else the property damage would have been crazy. Peter thought in relief. After a moment of silence, what was left of the demolished building began to quake as the Hulk crawled his way out of the rubble. And he did not look happy whatsoever. What's the matter, big guy? Can't handle the competition? We can stop if you want? Peter asked condescendingly, knowing the exact response that he would get. Aya! Hulk's muscles pulsed as he rushed forward. That's what I'm talking about. Let's see who hits harder, shall we? Peter laughed as he followed Hulk's lead and dashed forward as well. Hulk smirked as it seemed like his opponent wouldn't be running anymore. He wound his hand back, balled it into a tight fist, and jabbed at Peter's much smaller body. Meanwhile, Peter mimicked him perfectly, sending out a matching punch of his own. And with an earth-shattering bang, the two opposing fists met, sending a powerful shockwave across the mirror dimension. Snap. Peter heard the sound of his bones breaking as his arm crumpled in the face of the Hulk's maddening strength. Ugh. Peter grunted as he was sent flying into a nearby lamppost, which toppled over in an instant. Okay. Note to self, don't do that again. Picking himself up off the ground, Peter felt his right arm hanging limply at his side. Though that didn't last long. Within seconds of receiving his injury, Peter could feel his arm healing at a very rapid pace. Hulk watched as Peter bent his arm and wiggled his finger, confused by how he was able to do so after taking his attack head on. All right, it's time to get a little serious, Peter muttered as he gestured for his opponent to come to him. And of course, the Hulk would gladly comply. Peter knew he couldn't take the Hulk head on when it came to strength, so he decided to use his agility to his advantage. Leaping and flipping around the Hulk, he was able to land quick punches whenever he saw an opening. Meanwhile, the Hulk swung wildly, like a sloppy novice, but Peter was just too fast for him. As time went by, the Hulk just kept angrier, which in turn made him more powerful. He roared and slammed his fists into the ground, causing the entire area to shake as if a high-magnitude earthquake was taking place. Peter watched as many of the buildings around them collapsed, knowing that he should probably put an end to this before the Hulk got too out of control. After all, he didn't want to attract too much attention from Kamartaj. Although it's only the mirror dimension, I'm sure the Ancient One can still find a reason to scold me. Peter sighed inwardly. Peter shot a web at a nearby building and pulled himself up, hoping to get a better vantage point. Meanwhile, the Hulk charged at him, but Peter was ready. He leaped over his opponent's head, landing securely on his back. He quickly fired a web at the Hulk's eyes, blinding him temporarily. The Hulk roared in frustration, thrashing around like a bull in an attempt to buck Peter off. Though, Peter held on tight, punching the Hulk in the back of the head whenever he got the chance. With every brain-shaking punch, the Hulk was getting weaker and more sluggish. Suddenly, the Hulk stopped moving and toppled over to the ground. Standing on his opponent's back, Peter looked down and saw that he had knocked the Hulk out cold. He quickly jumped off the Hulk's back, breathing heavily. He had won the fight without using any of his overpowered abilities. 
Peter looked around the mirror dimension, making sure that nobody had come to investigate the destruction. And thankfully, he found no one. That was a good fight, big guy. Peter patted the Hulk's unconscious body. Let's get out of here. Grabbing the Hulk by the arm, Peter waved his hand and opened a portal before dragging the green giant out of the mirror dimension. Stepping out onto an abandoned island back on Earth, Peter laid the Hulk's body on the warm sand as the portal snapped shut behind them. Should I wake him up? Peter wondered out loud. Shrugging to himself, Peter waved his hand and controlled the seawater to splash Hulk in the face. Ugh. Hulk groggily opened his eyes and was met with a beautiful ocean view. Morning, big guy. Peter says as he flops down next to the giant. Question mark. Hulk looked between Peter and himself in confusion. If you're wondering why Banner hasn't taken control again, it's because I separated the two of you, Peter explains as the Hulk wasn't exactly paying attention earlier. Hulk free? He asked in shock. Yup, it took me a while since our last meeting, but I got it done. Peter pats the giant on the shoulder. How does it feel? Hulk feels, happy. Hulk smiled as he looked out over the open sea. Good, that's what I was hoping for. Peter smiles as well. Silence descended on the island, as Peter stayed quiet, allowing the Hulk to enjoy his shining moment of freedom. Hulk confused. Hulk was the first to break the silence. What do now? It's funny that you'd ask that. Peter was waiting for this moment. I actually have a job offer for you, my friend. Job? Friend? Hulk asked in surprise. Yup, I beat you in a fight, so that means we're friends now. Peter nods matter-of-factly. Hulk frowned in annoyance but nodded nonetheless. He didn't like losing, but if someone could beat him, then they deserve to be his friend. As for the job, Peter smirked under his mask. How would you like to beat the crap out of some bad guys? Although he couldn't see it, Hulk managed to match Peter's smirk perfectly. Hulk likes smashing bad guys. After explaining what the Avengers is to the Hulk in the simplest terms that he could, Peter wondered whether he should bring him back to New York or not. As someone with the mentality of an angry child, it may not be the safest idea to bring him over to a populated area. At least, not so soon. Hey, big guy. Peter called the Hulk, who was in the water, playing with a bunch of sharks. Well, although Hulk would call it playing, the sharks on the other hand would call it bullying. They tried their best to swim away from the big green muscly monster, but no matter how far they got, the Hulk would catch up and drag them back to the shore, where he would manhandle them like toys. Yeah, he's going to need some sort of behavioral and sensitivity training, Peter thought as he pictured normal humans in the place of those sharks. They would either die or get crippled and traumatized for life. Question mark. Hulk released the sharks, who immediately made a run for it while he was distracted. Huh? Hulk seemed annoyed that his toys were gone as he turned to Peter, wondering what he wanted. Come here. We need to talk about something important. Peter waved for Hulk to return to the island. Growling in annoyance, Hulk quickly swam back, creating large waves with his powerful arms and legs. What puny friend want? Hulk asks with a tilt of his head. Can you stay on this island for a few weeks while I get everything set up for you back in New York? Peter asked as he didn't want to forcibly confine him again. Question mark. Hulk looked over the island and the sea before shrugging his shoulders uncaringly. Hulk can do that. Good, I have to get a place for you to stay in the tower built and prepare everyone for your arrival. Peter quickly moved on to his second objective. If I have someone come and visit you, will you be nice to them? Hulk raised his brow in question. Hulk only smash bad guys. He replied firmly. I won't send any bad guys. Peter shrugged. All right, before I go. Snapping his fingers, Peter pulled on the power of reality stone and got to work. Hulk's eyes widened in awe as he watched a big portion of the small island transform. The trees disappeared as a giant mansion-sized house appeared in their place. Although it was the size of a mansion, in fact, it was just a simple house. The only thing that made it so big was that it was made to fit the Hulk perfectly. Even the furniture and appliances inside are the perfect size for him as well. That should last a while? Peter muttered as he looked over at Hulk. You can live there for the time being. Try not to break anything, okay? Ah, uh, okay. Hulk nodded dumbly as he walked over to check out his new house. I'll bring you food and water in a bit. Peter called out as he waved his hand, opening a portal. Don't cause any trouble while I'm gone. Stepping out of his portal and into his office, Peter was immediately welcomed by Jarvis as usual. Welcome back, sir. He spoke dutifully. Hey, Jarvis. I need you to order enough food and drinks to feed the Hulk for about a month. Make sure to get some good snacks as well. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Peter spoke as he took a seat at his desk. Of course, sir. Jarvis agreed with ease. The order has been placed and the groceries will arrive within an hour. Good, now call Banner to my office and notify the Avengers Council that a meeting will be taking place in half an hour. Peter continued giving orders. And if they complain about the time frame, then tell them that the Hulk is free. That should put some pep in their step. The messages have been sent. Jarvis worked quickly. Dr. Banner is currently rushing here as we speak. Good. After waiting for about a minute, an out-of-breath Dr. Banner came barging in with a worried look on his face. Is everything alright? Where is he? Banner asked as he practically ran up to Peter's desk. 
He's currently on an abandoned island and he'll be staying there for a few weeks, Peter explained as he motioned to the chair behind Banner. Take a seat and relax, relax? How could I possibly relax? Banner shouts as he starts pacing back and forth in front of Peter's desk. We just released a giant angry monster on the world. I don't know where you're getting we from. Peter rolled his eyes under his mask. I did all of the work while you just stood there. That's not the point. Banner wasn't in the mood for Peter's nonsense. Sigh. Peter let out an exasperated breath as he extended his pointer finger. Instantly, a calming blue light shot out of his finger and hit Banner in the forehead, melting into his mind without any injury or pain. W what was that? Banner stuttered in fear as he felt his mind rapidly calming. A simple spell that relaxes the mind? Peter explains as he looks Banner in the eyes. You have nothing to worry about. Hulk has agreed to join the Avengers. Everything went as I expected. You recruited the Hulk? A voice spoke from the door. Tilting his head to peek behind Banner, Peter found every council member standing outside his office. Wow, if I knew using the Hulk's name would make you guys move this fast, then I would have done it a long time ago. Peter comments as they all came walking in. First Blonsky and now this? Charles asks with a disapproving look on his face. Are you trying to destroy everything we've built? After taking all of Charles's complaints and explaining the situation fully, the majority of the council ended up agreeing with Peter's decision. Thankfully, Charles didn't fight too hard today, as his mind seemed to be somewhere else entirely. Even Magneto seemed to be focused on something else as well. What's with them? Peter made a mental note to check on them later. The only problem is Hulk's social skills and childlike persona. Although we understand these things, the public doesn't. One small accident and the Hulk goes from the hero they vaguely remember from three years ago, to a freak monster that wants to eat their children. Tony voiced the main issue. Which is why I'd like to have someone live with him for the next few weeks, Peter said as everyone raised a brow in question. He needs to learn how to fraternize with people and carry himself in public. I think it's best that we teach him these things early. Who would we send? We can't just hire a behavioral therapist. They'd be too afraid to work. Fury spoke up. I have the perfect candidate in mind, Peter says knowingly. Stepping out of a portal and onto the warm sand of Hulk's Island, Peter turned and motioned for his companion to follow along. Natasha Romanoff hesitantly stepped through, feeling a quick wind from behind as the portal snapped shut. Don't be so nervous. You're going to be fine. Peter rolled his eyes at her behavior. After all, she was the one and only Hulk whisperer in the movies, so this should be easy work. It's practically a vacation. Peter thought as she would be spending a month relaxing on a tropical island. Hulk. I'm back. As soon as Peter called him, the door to the giant house swung open and a green head peeked out. Puny friend? Hulk asked as he found Peter standing alongside an unknown woman. Yep, I have your food. Peter says as he squeezed past Hulk and into the house. I'll put it away while you get to know Natasha. She's an Avenger too. Natasha looks at Peter, silently pleading with him not to leave her behind like this, but he simply ignored her and made his way to the oversized fridge in the kitchen. Hey! Natasha put on a calm facade as she greeted her giant green ward. Question mark. Hulk looks at her questioningly. Red lady not afraid of Hulk? Usually, everyone that he meets is terrified of him, so Hulk was surprised to see this weak-looking woman's calm demeanor. Of course, she was most definitely scared, but many years of honing her body and mind had allowed Natasha to bluff her way out of anything. No, Spider-Man said that you were nice, so he wanted to introduce us? Natasha spoke in a kind, motherly manner. Question mark. Hulk was even more confused now. Hulk. Nice. Yeah, do you mind if I come inside? Natasha asked, and Hulk quickly moved to make way for her, holding the door open like a true gentleman. They've barely met, and he's already holding the door for her. Peter watched an interest from the kitchen. She truly is the Hulk whisperer. Stop sign a slash n, also, Natasha doesn't know Peter's secret identity. That was a mistake in the last chapter. It's fixed now. X-Mansion Jean Grey tossed and turned in her sleep, sweat beating on her forehead. Her mind was in absolute turmoil as her body began to shine in a faint fiery glow. Suddenly, Jean's eyes shot open as she bolted upright in her bed, drenched in sweat. She breathed heavily and felt the fiery energy coursing through her veins, stirring up the familiar fear and dread that had incessantly plagued her in recent years. And with this influx of energy came the voices. I think I'll have bacon and eggs for breakfast today. Why do I have to go to school so early? I just want to stay home and play Call of Duty. Oh yeah, you dirty hoe. Suck it. Jean's telepathy was enhanced to an astronomical degree, sending her senses into overload as she heard the thoughts of everyone within a 50-mile radius. And it was still spreading even further with each passing second. Her eyes shot wide open as she began to hyperventilate all over again. Go away. Go away. Go away. Squinting her eyes shut and curling into a ball, Jean tried to control it as she hoped and wished for the voices to stop. As she lay there, she couldn't help but recall the repeated nightmare that's been haunting her recently. Nightmares weren't usually a problem for her, but they seemed to just spring up out of nowhere. In her most recent dream, Jean saw herself walking through the halls of the Xavier Mansion, a cold and calculating look on her face. 
As she passed by the various rooms, she could hear the muffled sounds of children laughing and playing, unaware of the danger that was looming just outside their doors. She made her way to the principal's office, where Professor X was sitting at his desk, deep in thought. The moment he saw Jean, he stood up and moved towards her with a welcoming smile, happy to see his student visiting him. But before he could even utter a greeting, Jean's eyes turned red, and she unleashed a massive burst of energy that sent him flying across the room, crashing into the wall with a sickening thud. Jean stood there cloaked in fire, enjoying the look of betrayal that she was receiving, a wicked grin spread across her face. The professor tried to search Jean's mind to see what was wrong, but as soon as his mind made contact with hers, Charles's face morphed into an image of complete agony. Arg! He cradled his head and wailed in pain as blood leaked from his eyes, mouth, nose, and ears. Laughing at the man's cries, Jean waves her hand, tossing a ball of flames in her mentor's direction. Instantly, Charles lit up like a California forest, quickly burning him away until there was nothing but his skeleton remaining. Not sparing another glance at her former teacher, Jean walked out into the hallway, and with a flick of her wrist, she sent a wave of fire blasting through the building. The screams of the children echoed through the burning mansion, and Jean reveled in their terror. She watched as their bodies were consumed by the flames, begging for someone to save them. It was only when she heard a familiar voice calling out to her that Jean seemed to snap out of it. It was Scott, the boy that always chases after her, standing motionlessly in the burning hall across from her. She knew his feelings. As she looked into his eyes, Jean knew that she couldn't stay sane for much longer. With a deep breath, she closed her eyes and let go, allowing the fiery energy to consume her entirely. The last thing that she saw before her fiery suicide was a giant burning phoenix, which seemed to burn away alongside her. And as she disappeared, the image of the mansion burning to the ground was left haunting her mind. Nightmare flashback and, what's happening to me? Jean asked as she cried in her bed, still glowing with fiery power. She instinctively knew that the dream was a warning, a sign of what was to come. Jean had to find a way to contain her power before it was too late, or else she would become the monster she'd seen in her nightmare. Aya! Jean screamed and thrashed in her bed. Professor! It didn't take long for her cries to be heard and for help to arrive. Thankfully, Charles was able to access her mind and place his barriers, though the gossip quickly spread across the school, leaving everyone wondering what was wrong with Jean? On that same day, a special guest arrived at the X mansion. I is that. No way. It's Spider-Man. A portal opened in the middle of the driveway and out came the one and only Spider-Man, who was immediately swarmed by excited starstruck children. Can I have your autograph? Can I touch your mask? What are you doing here? The questions didn't seem to end and none of them gave him a chance to answer either. But thankfully, someone swiftly rushed to Peter's rescue. It's time for class? Wolverine ran over and started ordering the kids around. Get moving, you gremlins. Don't be late or else. Although they were very reluctant to leave, the kids gave Peter one last glance before rushing off to their classes. What are you doing here? Logan asks. I came to see what's going on with Charles. He seemed out of it in our last council meeting. Peter explained his concern. Ha! Huh? Logan grunted as if he knew something. All right, start talking. Peter crossed his arms and waited for him to speak. Well, while Peter and Wolverine were talking, news of Spider-Man's arrival quickly spread across the mansion. Spider-Man. Blob, a fat teenager, asked as he and his friends Pyro, Toad, and Avalanche walked menacingly through the halls. As former members of the Brotherhood of Mutants, the four of them tried to show their dominance over the other children, though sadly, that only ended with them becoming outcasts that bully some of the weaker children on a regular basis. Of course, this bullying didn't go unnoticed. In fact, they're punished almost constantly for it, but somehow, they never seem to learn their lesson. It's true, I swear. A little girl half their age nodded in fear as the four older kids towered over her don't lie. Pyro yells as he scares her with a bit of fire. I am not. The girl whispers in fear as her eyes moistened. You gonna cry? Toad asks condescendingly as his friends laughed. And just as the little girl started to cry, an angry voice echoed through the hall. What the hell do you think you're doing? Jean Grey, who only left her room to get some food, stood frozen in rage as she watched the same old group of idiots taunting a little girl. Do these bastards never learn? She thought in fury. Without a second thought, Jean glared in their direction and sent them to their knees. Arg. Wait. We're sorry. Pyro spoke as he and the others grasped their heads in agony. Scoffing in their direction, Jean used her telekinesis to push the bullies away from the little girl, and with a fierce determination, she stepped in front of her to protect her. Wow. The little girl wiped her tears away and watched in awe as the bullies were put in their place. But as Jean's rage intensified, something inside of her began to stir. Although the professor just remade the barriers this morning, the primal force of the universe that had bonded with Jean and granted her immense power wasn't so easily trapped anymore. Suddenly, a dry heat filled the hall as Jean's skin began to glow once more. Stop, please? We're really sorry. Okay? It won't happen again. Toad begged as he felt his moist frog-like skin begin to dry out. And as the wannabe villains tried to run away, they were met with an unstoppable force that quickly sent them crashing into the metal lockers. 
Jean's eyes blazed with a fiery glow as she unleashed the full power of the phoenix, sending waves of telekinetic energy crashing down upon them, rattling and denting the lockers with their figures. Aeg! The four bullies screamed in agony. Um, big sister? The little girl called out as her awe slowly turned to fear. I think they learned their lesson. Back outside, Wolverine just finished explaining what happened this morning to Peter, whose frown deepened with every added detail. Where is Dash Peter spoke, though he froze as soon as he felt an enormous spike in energy from the mansion. And with the spike of energy came agonizing screams, which caused Logan to turn his head toward the building in concern as well. What the? Logan muttered as Peter dashed past him, making his way to the front door. Hey! Wait for me. The X-Mansion was in chaos. As soon as Peter rushed inside, the children were already being evacuated from the building by their teachers. Charles must have ordered the evacuation Peter thought, which was good as dealing with Jean would be tricky. Swiftly maneuvering through the crowd of children, Peter thought back on what Logan just told him. I can't believe I'm dealing with a Dark Phoenix situation, Peter thought in dread. Thanks to the knowledge from his past life and his time spent buried in books at Camartage, Peter had a pretty good idea of Jean's situation. Jean is the host of the Phoenix Force, one of the oldest known cosmic entities, representing life that has not yet been born, as well as the forces of creation and destruction. The Phoenix Force is said to predate darkness and is stated to be the fire from which all things were born. It's an immortal, indestructible, and mutable manifestation of the prime universal force of life. Born of the void between states of being, it is the nexus of all psionic energy that does, has, and ever will exist in all realities. The Phoenix is the guardian of creation itself, making it one of the most feared beings in the entire universe. Signifying birth, death, and rebirth, the Phoenix not only creates but destroys as well, burning away what doesn't work. Some records in Kamartaj suggest that what doesn't work is anything that has become stagnant instead of naturally evolving. Meaning, planets, stars, civilizations, black holes, and just about anything that stagnates for a prolonged period of time will catch the Phoenix's eye and invite its destruction. This destruction is usually carried out by the Phoenix's host, as the Phoenix Force is more of a dimensional being than anything else. Although the library had nothing about Phoenix hosts going out of control, Peter's past life had some knowledge about this. Dark Phoenix. Peter thought. Due to the destructive nature of the Phoenix, a young and impressionable host can be easily influenced by the power it embodied, becoming a malevolent force of destruction known as the Dark Phoenix. Especially when idiotic bald men exasperate the situation by angering the universe's incarnation of creation and destruction. Peter made a mental note to yell at Charles as he arrived on the scene. Jean Grey, who is probably the most powerful mutants in the world due to her connection to the Phoenix, was most definitely falling into the trap of becoming a Dark Phoenix. She stood in the center of the hall, glowing with fiery power, as a young girl cowered behind her. The sound of metal creaking and pained whimpers caught his attention as Peter turned to see the kids that used to work for Magneto pressed into the lockers. Did these idiots piss her off? Peter wondered as Logan caught up behind him. Jean. He called out but she didn't seem to be listening. The telekinetic energy that flowed through her veins was turning her into a raging inferno, and the whole school seemed to be caught in the middle of it. Before Peter could step in and do anything, Professor X and Storm came rushing down the other side of the hall. Jean, you have to calm down, Charles said, using his telepathic powers to try and soothe her. You're hurting people, but Jean didn't seem to hear him. She was lost in a maelstrom of power, her eyes blazing with a fiery energy that seemed to be consuming her from the inside out. Storm stepped forward, her eyes locked onto Jean's. Jean, we're here to help you. But you have to let us in? Again, Jean didn't respond. She was too far gone, lost in the grip of the Phoenix Force. Wolverine pushed past Peter as he unsheathed his claws. He didn't want to hurt Jean, but he knew that if they didn't do something soon, she could kill those four problem children. And although they usually deserve a good beating, they didn't deserve anything this extreme. Jean, listen to me, Logan growled. You're stronger than this. You can fight it? Sadly, nothing that any of them said seemed to be getting through to her. She was lost in a sea of power, her body glowing with an otherworldly light. Suddenly, Jean turned her head, giving everyone hope that she may have heard them, though that hope was swiftly squashed soon after. Jean let out a powerful scream as a burst of energy exploded from her body in all directions. Everyone's eyes widened as they turned to the little girl who stood closest to Jean, paralyzed by fear. But before the wave of powerful energy could hit the poor girl, a golden portal opened under her feet. Are you okay? Peter asked as she fell safely into his arms. She froze in shock. Meanwhile, all she could think of was, Spider-Man saved me. Meanwhile, the four troublemakers who started all of this fell out of a separate portal and collapsed limply on the floor behind him. With the children out of the way, the force of Jean's outburst expanded and knocked Storm, Professor X, and Wolverine off their feet, sending them tumbling across the floor. But when it came to Peter, he merely swatted his hand in the air, cancelling the attack with ease. She isn't that powerful yet. Peter thought as he felt her energy levels constantly rise. When the three metahumans picked themselves up off the floor, they saw Jean hovering in the air, her body outlined in flames. Jean. 
Professor X shouted, trying once again to reach out with his mind. This is all my fault. Please, come back to us. But it was too late. The tantalizing power of the Phoenix Force had taken hold of her completely, and there was no turning back. And despite their best efforts, Jean's power would be far too much for them to handle. Suddenly, a red and blue blur shot past them, and Peter landed in front of Jean, his spider sense alerting him to the danger. Take the kids out of here. I'll handle this, Peter orders as he kept his eyes on Jean. Of course, he could have just portaled the kids out, but then he would have no reason to get rid of Charles. After all, it's very likely that he caused all of this. You can't dash Charles tried to argue but Peter wasn't having it. I won't hurt her. Just go. You'll only get in the way, Peter speaks frankly. After a moment of hesitance, Charles ran to the kids and quickly rushed them out of the mansion alongside Storm and Logan. Once they were finally alone, Peter looked up at Jean. Hey, it's me, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, he said with a wave, but soon froze in realization. Wait, technically it should be friendly universal Spider-Man now. After all, he's famous in space too. Sadly, Jean didn't seem to appreciate his nonchalant behavior. Her eyes glowed with a fiery intensity, as she lashed out at Peter with a powerful blast of telekinetic energy. Kicking off of the ground, Peter managed to dodge out of the way as he appeared in front of Jean. Actually, let's go somewhere less crowded, Peter muttered as he grabbed Jean by the face and shoved her backward. And as she was pushed back, a golden portal appeared, which swiftly snapped shut after swallowing both of them. Seconds after the portal closed, Charles came running back up the hall with Logan and Storm at his back. Mirror dimension hopefully, the phoenix doesn't shatter the mirror dimension. Peter thought as Jean weaseled her way out of his grip and took some distance. So, want to try taking now? In response to his peaceful words, Jean remained stoic as large balls of fire covered her hands. Ugh. She grunted and launched a barrage of fireballs in Peter's direction. Sighing to himself as he easily sidestepped the attacks, Peter knew that he had to find a way to calm her down somehow, as he didn't want to kill the poor girl. Dip, diving, and dodging his at through the obstacle course of never-ending fireballs, Peter maneuvered his way up to Jean once again. A burst of energy erupted from his hand, which landed on Jean's shoulder, tightly enveloping her in a cocoon of golden magic. That should hold you for long enough? Peter muttered as he stood before her. She struggled against the bonds, but Peter's spell was just too powerful. After all, it was created in cooperation with the reality stone. You'll be okay, Jean, Spider-Man said, reaching out and resting his hand on her head. I'll help you through this. Jean glared in his direction with the utmost malice. Now, wait here while I pay respects to the Phoenix, Peter said as he forced his consciousness into her. Jean's eyes widened and rolled into the back of her head as Peter closed his eyes and invaded her mind. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.